Good morning. It is 9.30 on Tuesday, September 19th, and I'm calling to order this regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Let's begin with a roll call vote. Ro S just a roll call, not a vote. Supervisor Arenas? Absent. Supervisor Chavez? Here. Supervisor Simidian? Absent. Vice President Lee? Good morning, present. President Ellenberg? <laughs> I am here. And 
For the record, uh, so is Supervisor Smitty, and you have a quorum. So we've heard. Thank you so much. Uh, Supervisor Chavez, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Absolutely. Thank Please you. stand if you're able. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, States of America. and to the republic, the republic for which, which it stands, stands, one nation, one nation under God, 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 indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice President Lee is going to introduce this morning's indicator. Good morning, everybody. Well, September is the National Suicide Prevention. So after graduating from the University of Washington, Seattle in 1970, with a graduate degree in electrical engineering, he spent almost 50 years in Silicon Valley with a career in the computer industries working closely with the pioneers. He retired from Oracle in 2018 and has served the community for mental health causes over the last decades. With an adult son with co occurring issues of developmental disability and mental illness, he has championed the cause of collaborative care for co-occurring diagnoses. He serves on various boards, including the presence of NAMI, Santa Clara County Board of Directors. Please welcome Mr. Uday Kapoor. Does this can hear me from here? Yes, we can. Thank you. Honorable Board of Supervisors, thank you for giving me the honor and the privilege of this invocation. I hope you can hear me. Um, I do not wear vestments of the clergy, but would humbly like to pray along with you during this Suicide Prevention Month for the tormented souls driven to the extreme step of taking their own lives. I remember my first encounter with this when I was traveling in a train in Japan while on a business trip many years ago. When the train came to a stop at a station, everyone left the train. I asked someone what was going on. He explained that someone had died by suicide by lying on the tracks. All day long, I kept thinking of the loss of a valuable life and the trauma his loved ones would suffer. This incident left a lasting impression on me. Sadly, every year we face too many similar tra tragedies locally. Human life is our most precious gift and to observe it being renounced deliberately is always more shocking and tragic. Our faith traditions teach us that our essential nature is pure joy and right from birth, we seek to be happy. When this is thwarted due to stressful life situations, whether it be unfulfilled needs, poverty, conflict with family members, hopelessness related to legal or financial problems or a history of mental health problems, particularly depression, drug use, alienation, and loneliness, one may experience a sort of tunnel vision where in the middle of a crisis, one believes that suicide is the only way to end the suffering. However, there is hope, as in many cases, people with suicidal tendencies can be helped by support groups, community resources, clinical settings, and places of worship. Feeling connected with and supported by others can help reduce suicide risk. Suicide affects all ages but teenagers and youth adults, young adults, between 15 to 30 years of age are at most risk. During COVID, 37% of the college students nationwide were at risk of suicide because of their isolation. Efforts of outreach into schools with programs like Ending the Silence need to be redoubled so that we have conversations with stressed youth to provide guidance by trained professionals. Santa Clara County is fortunate to have a robust, innovative suicide prevention program, SPOC, Suicide Prevention Oversight Committee, and I thank the county for all their services. And as Dr. Smith stated recently in his farewell address, we also have the best board of supervisors in the state. 
We at NAMI are also fortunate to have the leadership of my predecessor, Viko Zakian, who has led this effort dramatically. Thanks again for this opportunity, and I pray that we all get the wisdom and blessings to collectively take proactive, thoughtful actions to provide a safety net for the vulnerable in our community. May our leaders make the right decisions by providing more resources and support to our residents during this time of need. And at this time, I would like to conclude with a short prayer in Sanskrit. Om Asato Ma Sat Gamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityo Ma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 I'll translate that as lead me from ignorance to truth, lead me from darkness to light, lead me from death to immortality. May there be peace, may there be peace, may there be peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, no adjournments today, so I'm going to move us to commendations and proclamations. And in keeping with our invocation, um, item 5A, presented by Supervisor Lee, is a proclamation for Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Message. The Suicide Prevention Month is a crucial initiative because it is not only raises awareness about the serious and pervasive issue, but also fosters our understanding and compassion. It allows the community to come together to work on strategies, education, and resources that can save lives. During this month, we commit to raising the awareness of the signs and symptoms of suicide, encouraging open dialogue about mental health, dispelling the myths and stigmas associated with those seeking help, promoting the available resources and support services for those in crisis, and engaging in community-wide activities that foster a sense of connection, understanding, and hope. We urge all residents, businesses, schools, and organizations in Santa Clara County to participate in this vital observance, recognizing that it is a shared responsibility to ensure that every individual knows that they are valued, understood, and never alone. I also want to take a moment today to highlight the recent death of LA County Sheriff Deputy Ryan Klinkenbrumer, who was shot senselessly by an individual diagnosed with schizophrenia right outside the Palmdale Sheriff's Station. He was diagnosed suicidal and was able to still get a gun legally. This is what's hurting our community every day. By dedicating a month to this cause, we send a message that every life matters and we will collectively work to protect and uplift those who need it the most. And so again, I would at this time ask Mr. Uday Kapoor to come up, the president of NAMI, uh, of Santa Clara County Board of Directors. And Mr. Kapoor, if you would also acknowledge any of the staff members that are here with you to join us at the podium. Thank you very much, Supervisor Lee, for this opportunity. Uh, we at NAMI are privileged to have, uh, you know, Vico Zakin, who was my predecessor president, and he has led the fight for suicide prevention for a long time. And we also were privileged to uh, make all of the cities in the county have a suicide prevention policy. I helped him in that, and we're so proud to have that. That's only the beginning. I think we need a lot of programs to make sure that we prevent pre uh, suicide by reaching out to the folks that are 
in a very, very sensitive position. They have been hurt. You know, the isolation and all of the things that are happening in the society with social media pressures and the, the area with the cost of living and all of that and students and adults, this is an area that we really must, uh, you know, it's so uh, easy to actually do it. We just have to have the programs and the collective strength to do it. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to also have my Executive Director, uh, Rowena and Marcus, say a few words. Thank you so much, Supervisor Lee, and thank you to the Board of Supervisors as well. It's truly an honor to stand before you as the Executive Director of NAMI Santa Clara County, and I'm deeply humbled to receive this proclamation on behalf of NAMI. NAMI Santa Clara County has been dedicated to improving lives of individuals and families affected by mental illness for over 46 years. And our mission is simple, yet very profound, to provide support, education, and advocacy to those living with a mental health condition. As we observe Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, let us remember that reaching out for help is a sign of strength and not weakness. It's a testament to resilience, and it's a step towards a brighter future. Receiving this proclamation reaffirms our work and making a difference. However, there is still a lot of work to do, Mental health challenges continue to affect our countless lives in our county, and we are committed to become a beacon of hope and support. I want to express my gratitude to our dedicated team, our staff, volunteers, board members, and supporters who make NAMI Santa Clara County's work possible. Together, we are creating a more compassionate, understanding community where mental health is a priority. Thank you very much. Sure. Actually, um, for the staff who's working on this issue, please come on up as well. Don't be shy. Our, su our suicide hotline and all of our, come on up. Yes, team. come on up. Team. The county yes. staff that work on this, if you could come up too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you already know what you're going to be telling yes. <laughs> Supervisor Arenas is going to present a proclamation uh, declaring September 15th through October 15th as Hispanic Heritage Month. Good morning, everyone. I should have brought all of my, all of my stuff down. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. So this morning, as I was getting ready um, for this um, proclamation, I, I, I grabbed this gabardina, and I remembered that I bought it at El Museo Nacional de la Revolución in La Ciudad de México, where our consul Bologna is from. Um, and it inspired me to actually tell you a little bit of a different um, message than what I have here <laughs> written down. And I think it's important because sometimes the universe speaks to us. And, and if we stay still, we, we listen and we pick up those messages. And so one of the things that I was thinking about is how brave the Mexican men and women were against colonization, against all odds to win freedom. And I was really inspired by that. I thought about 
the men with that I just saw on the side of the road who were patching up some, some kind of um, division on the side of 87. And I thought, you know, our, our people work hard with their hands, but they also work hard with their hearts. They work hard with their minds. And I thought about bringing back this message that, that I had read and, and expressed in my um, swearing in earlier this year. And this is from a wonderful um, Mexican writer named Carlos Fuentes. And um, he, in, in a passage, he talks about what is our virtue. And so it, it goes like this. And so if you will be patient with me, I'm going to read it in Spanish and then in, um, in English. And it says, ¿Cuál es la virtud de tu virtud, mi amor? El amor de mi amor. La justicia de mi justicia. La compasión de mi compasión. Quiero compartir el sufrimiento tuyo como tú compartiste el de tu pueblo. Ese es el amor de mi amor. This is what is the virtue of your virtue, my love, the love of my love, the justice of my justice, the compassion of my compassion. I want to share your suffering as you share that of your people. That's the love of my love. And as I thought about that, I thought about how these characters there was a woman who, who was in a Nazi concentration camp and her, her love had looked for her. And um, they had met in Mexico. He went to look for her and wanted, and he was ranked high enough in order to help her escape. And she wanted to stay because she wanted to stay and fight the good fight with her people. And I thought about what is my fight? What am I staying? How am I standing with my people? And I thought about also being that radical revolutionary that doesn't accept the status quo. And this is some of the words of Simone Sanders. So as I blend in my Mexican culture and also my American culture, I'm influenced by both. And this is what is just so unique about the Mexican Heritage Month is that we are just blended and braided in through so many different stories and, and sufferings and revolutions and wars. And she, Simone Sanders talked about being a radical revolutionary. She was the press secretary for, and the youngest press secretary for um, uh, Bernie Sanders, African-American um, young woman, <laughs> younger than me. Um, and she talked about taking risks and going against the status quo and standing up for others, and as well as being able to speak your truth by taking on your adversary, adversaries as well as your allies. And that is the role as a county supervisor that I'm taking to, to real heart. And so as we celebrate the Mexican Heritage Month, and the Mexican independence that was just celebrated last week. I take all of this together to just share with you my continued struggle and fight for the people here in our county who are Latinos, who are Mexican, Hondureños, Salvadoreños, Nicaragüenses, from Latin America, from all kinds of different countries. And sometimes our uniqueness is all blended in into one and we're called Hispanic. And I wish I could change that and make it a Latino, Latino, Latinx. But we'll call it National Hispanic Heritage Month and know that I'm speaking just about every Latino that is in California who's working really hard in our offices, on our streets, and in our operation rooms um, across California and across America. So. I want to thank you all for, for being here, and especially our consul, who does a wonderful job of supporting and standing with our Latino, Latinx people. And consul, if you would come to the front, please. 
She's accompanied by Rodrigo, who has been just a wonderful supporter and um, an absolutely astute young man. And so I just want to I want to share this procl this proclamation with you because this is the significance of working together. Um, you represent Mexico. I represent the system, the go local government here, and yet we're working together. And so I want to thank you for the past work that we've done on the binational um, health week, on just being able to support the people who come here um, to the uh, US in, in search of freedom and, and a better life. And so with this, I want to declare National Hispanic Heritage Month and, and ask you to speak um, if you so desire. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors for honoring the Hispanic Heritage Month consistently, especially Supervisor Ronina and Chavez for their longstanding commitment to promoting the well-being of our community. On behalf of the Consulate General of Mexico in San Jose and the Latino community in the region, I'm really honored to receive this proclamation. As you mentioned, Supervisor Arenas, in effect, uh, brave people from here and there fight together with the same values of liberty, justice, and um, independence. And uh, those values are present in our communities, and that's part of this uh, extraordinary heritage that has been always recognized um, in here. Uh, 60, according to the US Census Bureau, 64 million of people living in the country define, is defined themselves as Hispanic or Latino. 37 million of those are from Mexican origin. And in Santa Clara County, 25% of the total population, almost half a million is proudly Latino. And most of them are Mexicans. Beyond recognizing the cultural enrichment to the American identity, National Hispanic Heritage Month is a reminder of the Latino community contributions to the economy, science, arts, government, leadership, history, and values. These contributions are undeniable and can be found easily every single day across the United States. Today, I was asked to highlight a Latina or Latino who inspires me to relay a story of successful or great achievement. Every day at the consulate, we serve over 200 persons looking for a diverse array of services. Our office has become a community resource hub where Hispanic people from different nations feel safe and heard. They are the real heroes in this story. The agricultural workers in Gilroy or San Martin bringing food to our tables the builder defining the skyline of Silicon Valley, the entrepreneur creating jobs for the future generations, the parent and teachers planting the seeds for a better community, the immigrants facing multiply challenge every day to sustain their families, their dreams, and this country. Please join me embracing all their contributions with a big round of applause for the Latino community. Thank you, Consul, and I would ask my colleagues if you could come down so we could memorialize this in a picture.
appreciate you. Our next uh, proclamation will be presented by Supervisor, S Smit Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, Madam President. And I'm going to look to the clerk to see if we can bring Joe Capello from RU Dents in Connecticut up on the screen. And I'll ask for a moment of patience, colleagues. There we go. Joe Capello, how are you, sir? Wonderful, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me today. Well, colleagues and members of the public, uh, you will recall, of course, that just last week we adjourned our meeting in memory of Nancy Capello, who passed away almost five years ago now. Mm -hmm. And it provided an opportunity for our board to reflect on Nancy's extraordinary work over uh, literally decades. Um, we also took the opportunity at our last meeting to uh, express our formal support for the Find It Early Act, uh, which is uh, an effort at the national level, the congressional level, to take the next step in terms of addressing the cancer risk of women with dense breast tissue. Uh, and uh, today, uh, we are uh, calling out the um, formal acknowledgement of World Dense Breast Tissue Day. And the reason for that, Joe and colleagues and members is, uh, of the public, is to uh, ensure that we take advantage of this opportunity to uh, identify September 27th as World Dense Breast Tissue Day so that members of the public will have the information, the knowledge, the power that Nancy Capello thought they were entitled to all those years ago. And as we have discussed previously, and uh, so I won't uh, speak at uh, quite substantial length today, um, this is information that patients need to have. They are now entitled to have it by law. Uh, that uh, entitlement is in large measure a function of the fact that Nancy Capello took her own life experience and said others should have more power, more knowledge, more ability to affect the decision making in their own health care. Uh, and we are a better state, a better county, uh, and in fact a better nation uh, by virtue of her work. So. Um, uh, Joe, if you were here, I would have you up to the podium and I would uh, hand you the physical uh, commendation, uh, but uh, uh, by virtue of our virtual connection today, I will virtually present it to you and we will send you the physical uh, commendation and I hope it will find a place uh, at RU Dents. Uh, I'm guessing that your screen uh, doesn't reveal it, but I am wearing on my lapel the RU Dents button, uh, which I okay. wore all those years ago when I was privileged to work with Nancy and the organization on California law. With that, well, uh, Madam President, uh, I say thank you to our board uh, and to my colleagues for their support on this measure. And through the chair, with your permission, I'd like to give Mr. Capello an opportunity to say a brief word or two. Of course. Well, thank you, Senator. Uh, it, as I said before, it's a real pleasure. and. Um, you, you, I finally got to meet the other Joe in Nancy's life. And uh, <laughs> believe me, it was, uh, she always had kind words to say about you. And you were always a stand up guy. You were, you were the one that uh, she could count on for honesty and truthfulness when we were doing our legislative work in California. Um, what we have now um, is a disclosure law, which is a national law. Um, which will take effect um, a year from now, as a, as a matter of fact, which is a huge, huge step for the health of women uh, all over this nation. And uh, what, it did, what it's going to do is standardize, uh, standardize what isn't standardized uh, in the medical field for women with dense breasts. 
Uh, I thank you in the name of Nancy for the proclamation. She deserves it all. She worked hard and uh, she worked smart. She was not only prettier than me, <laughs> but smarter than me. And uh, I thank you on be her behalf. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you to you, uh, Joe Capello. Thank you to R.U. Dents, and thank you, Madam President. We appreciate the work. Thank you very yes. much. Our final proclamation will be presented by Supervisor Chavez uh, in honor uh, to recognize Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Awareness Month. Good morning, all. I'd like to invite up Michelle DeCaye, uh, Mego Lien, and Araya, I'm sorry, Azaya Zareski, if they could be here with me today. And I'm so happy to have these wonderful people. I'm disappointed I don't have uh, Bruce Copley, who's been at my side working on these issues today, um, but I hope he's uh, listening. So today, I'm going to bring uh, recognition and attention to the Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Awareness Month, an, ish an initiative that aims at to educate and prevent a condition that is in entirely avoidable. Come on up. You all do great work. Oh. <laughs> and Christine Clifford, excellent. The whole team is here. Um, first observed on September 9th, 1999, uh, fetal alcohol uh, syndrome Oh, you guys, I'm going to say this wrong all. Spectrum Disorder um, Month was created to remind us that during the nine months of pregnancy, the safest op option is to abstain from alcohol. In 2016, this day was expanded to encompass the entire month of September. The dangers of alcohol use during pregnancy are clear. There is no known safe amount of alcohol to use during this critical time, and all types of alcohol, including wine and beer, are equally harmful. Here in Santa Clara County, we have the opportunity to make a difference. Our justice system can contribute to the prevention of this disorder by offering educational workshops and substance use treatment for inmates, thereby reducing the risk among our incarcerated community. We must also recognize that this is pre these are preventable disabilities. While binge drinking poses a higher risk, any alcohol use during pregnancy can lead to FAST. This is a message that we need to disseminate far and wide. During FAST Awareness Month, it is intended to inspire and challenge families to make sure we're having these courageous conversations and that we're educating um, our communities and our health in, in terms of healthcare disparities as well. This opportunity of this month gives us an opportunity to raise our voices. As a community, we have to strive to educate our residents about these risks and consequences. And remember, this is an entirely avoidable syndrome. I want to thank every single person who's made this Awareness Month possible and really to invite my colleagues behind me who are doing this work day in and day out to say a few words and to thank them. Thank you so much, um, Supervisor Chavez, for the proclamation and for your ongoing support of the FASD work. Um, I'm accepting the proclamation today on behalf of the county's FASD work group, and especially those members who are individuals who have FASD and the parents of individuals with FASD. Um, this really is their lives and their lives work. Um, the county FASD work group is only a couple years old, um, but many of these members have been working and fighting for years to increase public awareness of FASDs and supports for individuals who have FASDs. So I know personally that this proclamation um, brings a smile to their faces and is deeply meaningful to them. So thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> they just said, that's it, we're doing the work, we're not talking about it anymore. So I'm going to ask my colleagues to come down and take a picture, and I'm going to ask all of you to give them a round of applause. They do amazing work.
Thank you. Thank, thank you for the good work. And thank you for the thank you. I should remember that. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm wearing flats, so we're all good. We're all even. <laughs> now you're both showing off. <laughs> True. Next on our agenda is public comment. This is the portion of the meeting set aside for members of the public wishing to address the Board of Supervisors on items not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. We will first hear public comment in chambers. So if you are in chambers and desiring to speak, there are yellow cards in the back. Uh, right now is the moment that you should be getting a card if you haven't done so already. Um, and filling that out, we will close the speaking queue when the first person begins speaking. So again, if you are in chambers, you need to have your yellow card in by the time the first person begins speaking. For public speakers on Zoom, please raise your virtual hand. We will close that queue when the first Zoom speaker begins speaking. Both of these uh, limitations are simply for meeting management purposes. Uh, happy to have as many speakers in, in each group as desire to share with us this morning. Curtis, who do we, do we have speakers in chambers and are on Zoom? We currently have 10 speakers in chambers and nine or 10 on Zoom. All right, at 20, we are, um, we are really just at one minute per speaker. So let's, uh, let's begin with speakers in chambers. All right, I'm going to call five names. Please uh, line up and approach the podium when the person before you is done. Our first speaker, Vinit Goel, Beverly Wong, Michelle Mashburn, Zimar Pina, Karen Alger. May I begin? Please Greetings. go ahead. Greetings, uh, honorable county supervisors and county staff. My name is Vinit Goyal, and I'm a parent of a child with special needs, an immigrant, a PHP board member, and also a data and analytics professional. I'm here today as I am concerned about the current survey being conducted by the SEC Office of Immigrant Relations and the fact that it doesn't include feedback collection for immigrant parents of children with disabilities. Knowing that thousands of children in the Santa Clara County have special needs, it would be a huge missed opportunity if the county didn't gather useful quantitative and qualitative data about families like mine struggling while raising children with disabilities. Hence, I'm requesting that the county pause the current survey to include appropriate questions to gather key information about families with disabilities so that we have a voice and the county has used. Thank you very data. much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Beverly Wong and I'm the advocacy manager at Parents Helping Parents. I'm here to express my concern regarding the current survey administered by the County Office of immigrant relations. While the survey is lengthy and gathers data about numerous subsets of the immigrant community, unfortunately it leaves out one of the most vulnerable groups in our county, the immigrant parents raising children with disabilities. Here in Santa Clara County, it's estimated we have about 15,000 children with disabilities being raised by immigrant parents. The National Institute of Health found that 20% of families in the U.S. are raising a child with a disability. And so we ask that this survey be paused in order to add or modify two questions. One, whether the respondent has is a parent of a child with a disability, and two, adding disability services as uh, in the list of possible unmet family needs. Uh, we just ask that you take into consideration the most vulnerable population and ensure that our children, all our children, ensure the services that they need. Thank you. Good morning. I am Semar Pina, mother of Luis, a 13 years old young man with severe nonverbal autism. I am a Venezuelan migrant who arrived in 2020. I have a concern about the survey. It does not include comment from immigrant parents with children with disabilities. I filled out the survey and there were no questions about services for my child. 
This made me feel like my child doesn't exist as a person. And it's, this is important because counting people with disability in this service is essential to be recognized as member of society, ensure equal opportunities, social inclusion, and access to services and resources. I want to ask that your county office of immigrant relations not forget about parents who have children with disabilities. We are workers who contribute to the county we now call home. We all deserve to have a voice and be heard. If you want to talk more about this topic, you feel free to contact me. That is there is I can use one on the wall though. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. When we shift microphones, it's always special. So yeah, thank you. My name is Michelle Mashburn. I'm here to support the families and parents of children with disabilities given the survey of the Office of Immigrant Relations. Um, the survey having one demographic question that asks if the person taking the survey is a person with a disability fails to include those most impacted and most at risk within our demographics in our county base. The survey continues to show an ongoing lack of awareness in the county. Uh, because the disability community needs are not met, nor are they adequately understood and cannot be measured given this gap of knowledge. To advance equity, the county must do better and push harder to learn more about these gaps and how inadequately they have been addressed over time. Just to wrap it up, Kim Nielsen in a book, uh, A Disability History of the United States, says when disability is equated with dependency, disability is stigmatized. Citizens with disabilities are labeled in Thank you so much. Thank you very much. After Karen Alger, our speakers will be Paul Soto, Kenya Perez, Victoria Areola, Maria Donne, and Mark Trout. Good morning. Three years ago, the SCU fire roared through the Mount Hamilton range. It was the third largest wildland fire at the time. In September 2020, I attended, along with about 50 of my fellow property owners, a community meeting put on by DEH. We were assured, we're from the county, and we're here to help. Well, three years later, I'm here to tell you that help has not happened. The only thing that has happened is the lack of help. The county allows for a fire rebuild of the same size and uh, configuration in the same location. The rebuilding process is cumbersome and non-existent, especially to the homesteads, some of which are from the 1890s. I talked to the senior planner for this. We're from the county, we're here to help. He doesn't even know how many permits have been processed, but thinks only one has been approved. Not much to brag about. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kenya Perez. I am a PHP staff member for the last five years. I have also been an uh, immigrant for the 35 years. Uh, I have great parents who guided and supported me when I was a child to become a better life for myself, which also had a ripple effect to my husband and my 14-year-old son. I am from Geroy, and I stand next to PHP in support. It is my experience and understanding as an immigrant that parents with children with special needs need have a daily struggle. I'm not able to access resources, the feeling of fear and being scared of the idea of separating from your loved one. It can be overwhelming. The feeling of intimidation and discrimination for access eligible services for their child. I am concerned about this current survey of the immigrant relations, and I ask the county of immigrant relations not to forget these families and their children. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I want to first of all thank uh, Supervisor Arenas for making that uh, proclamation and explicitly talking about the Mexican. He 
You see, the Mexican is the only ethnicity in the entire United States that is living colonized in the country of his origin, which is California. This is still Mexico. You can call it what you want. From 1521, when Hernan Cortes came through Veracruz, to 1821, they won their, Mexico won their independence. From 1821 to 2021, when that Fallon statue was removed from this city and removed that stain of colonization, it was exactly 500 years, 500 years since he entered. And now that symbol of colonization was removed, which placed in the mind of the Mexican that he is an immigrant in the country of his origin. We still need to contend with that fact. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors and staff of Santa Clara County. I'm Maria Dane, Executive Director for Parents Helping Parents. We are here today to ask you to pause the data collection of the Office of Immigrant Relations Survey in order to add additional questions to collect feedback from immigrant parents of children with disabilities. This survey asked 76 questions of immigrants. 20% of immigrant, approximately 20% of immigrant parents have children with special needs, as does the entire community. No one ranks their child 77th in what's important to them in community services or in, uh, in aspects of their life. This UC Berkeley study has forgotten what is most sacred to all parents, our children. And the dangerous thing is resource decisions will be based on this survey. This survey isn't worthy of our county. We have worked with all of you over the years to do incredible projects for inclusion. The Office of Immigrant Relations has offered us a focus group. This is not enough. We request this invalid survey be paused questions be added, and the service be resumed, be inclusive of the 15,000 children and parents. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Victoria, and thank you so much for listening to me today. I am a parent and advocate for special needs. Uh, my children have special needs, and since 2016, my life changed forever, but for the best. Um, I am the product of, and I am part of the data that is should be inclusive as I am raising my children. And since 2016, it's been challenging to access services. And this is an important issue where I want to address with the uh, Santa Clara County Office of Immigration Relations. And um, this is an important thing because if we are not included in the data, we are not gonna be able to provide the services that our families need in our community. I am an immigrant from Mexico. My, my parents migrated when I was eight. I've been raised here in the Santa Clara County, and had I known that I needed these supports as I became a parent, um, has been incredibly uh, something that I would like to call out and pause the survey because it's an important issue to address. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I wanted to preach on Greasy the Robber, but I don't have enough time. So uh, what you should do is apologize to Calvary Chapel. They haven't done anything wrong. You should uh, forgive the debt and uh, make a public confession that you were wrong. You know, you really should do that. I mean, Calvary Chapel has been proven right on everything. And I can see your faces, you know, your conscience is condemning you. And that's because you're made in God's image, okay? You really are. But everything we've, they've said, uh, is, uh, and I wish the preacher would come down here. He'd, he'd do a great job, but he's too busy to, you know, to spend just a couple minutes down here. But um, the thing is, is uh, the PCR tests we know are bogus. Chris Mullis admitted they didn't work. Okay, and what does that really mean? Think it through, 95% false positive. I was listening to Jane Ruby. She's one of the finest doctors uh, She's actually a nurse and a doctor, and she wrote the informed consent things that are like 35 pages long. She shut down the study after five dogs died. Thank you. Is that the final speaker in chambers? Yes, that concludes the uh, in chamber speakers. Thank you. Um, a reminder to folks on Zoom that that queue will close when the first speaker begins. But before we go to Zoom, um, I just want to acknowledge the, the group of speakers who uh, talked about the survey. The board can't engage in um, discussion or take action because the item wasn't agendized. But I want to um, 
share that I've been in touch with a, a number of you this morning uh, and with county council first to determine whether the, um, the survey was statutorily required, which would make it difficult to um, pause. That is not the case. So I'd, I'd like to know what within the, the Brown Act and the rules about public comment, we can indicate this morning um, in terms of further investigation of how we can address the concerns in the survey with the survey. Maybe I can just jump in and say that I became aware of these issues this morning and we'll okay. take a look at the survey and um, uh, you know, follow up as appropriate. And how will we be able to share the results of that follow up with the interested community? Um, we can we can provide an off agenda to the board with which will then be publicly posted with any adjustments made to the survey. Just one more question. Since the survey is ongoing right now, obviously that it's a very um, timely uh, question as, as the survey I think is about midway through its intended time frame. Is it possible to request at least a temporary pause while you investigate and share whatever information you're going to share with us? We will look into that. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to speakers on Zoom, please. All right. Our first speaker is David Montiel. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. Hi, uh, my name is David Montiel, and my uh, county supervisor that serves me is Susan Ellenberg. Um, you know, when you talk about uh, Suicide Aware Awareness Month, and, uh, you know, there's uh, people that were talking, in fact, the last gentleman I was talking about a public apology uh, for the mistakes made uh, in the overreach uh, to Calvary Chapel. Uh, and I, I'm really hoping that James Williams, Dr. Sarah Cody, and other people will publicly apologize uh, because that's part of the, the healing. You know, talk about mental health. Some people needed to go to a physical place and not be bothered by anybody to worship the Lord. That's all people wanted to do at Calvary Chapel, or it's called Calvary Christian Fellowship. That's all they really wanted to do. And if people wanted, and they assumed their own risk because people go, could go online if they wanted to, or they could go physically to the church. This county needs to apologize to be able to move on. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sandra Asher. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. Good morning. My name is Sandra Asher. I'm a District 5 resident and a board member at Parents Helping Parents. The NIH, in their most recent paper, stated that 20% of families in the U.S. are raising a child with a disability. Uh, as we've previously stated, PHP strenuously opposes the current immigration survey as it leaves out a critical population in our county. And yes, while the survey is lengthy, it fails to ask specifically about parenting children with disabilities. Given that the study will guide how resources are allocated in the future, both by the county and private funders, it's catastrophic for immigrant families with family members ex experiencing disabilities. We appreciate your offer to take a look at this issue, um, but please note time is of the essence as the survey is currently being conducted. So we ask that you pause the survey and add two questions so that you do not leave out approximately 15,000 children with special needs in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nicole Shadox Ramos. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. Hello, my name is Nicole and I'm a parent of a child with a disability. I'm also a child of an immigrant family and a program manager of Parents Helping Parents. I'm concerned about the current survey being conducted by Santa Clara County Office of Immigration Relation. It does not include feedback for our immigrant parents with children with disabilities and I'm asking you to pause the survey. I work with immigrant parents every day and as they look for services for their children with disability, they amaze me of their resilience and determination. Many of these parents have faced incredible challenges, not only adapting to a new country, but also navigating a, compl a complex system. They struggle because they encounter barriers such as communication, cultural understanding, and limited resources. Their love and commitment to their children um, drives their persistence. 
By not including them, you are leaving out a very vital component to this survey, and their resilient voices need to be heard. Their voices will ensure accessible, equitable, and responses. Responsive is Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. Good morning. My name is Catherine Hedges. I live downtown in District 2. Um, and I don't really understand that. Anyway, um, I'm not really here to talk about the survey. I hope that if the parents get their wish to have the information collected, that it won't be turned over to INS. Um, I am here today to uh, strongly oppose citing a tiny home village at the VTA yard by Highway 237. That just isn't a suitable location for people to live. Um, it's the very definition of putting people in someplace unlivable. It'll be a good excuse to tell them, well, you turned down a tiny home so we can put you in jail instead. And I urge the Board of Supervisors to uh, block this use of the VTA yard and help the city of San Jose find other locations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janet Nunez. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Good morning, everyone. My name is Janet Nunez. And along with my husband, who is an immigrant, we are both parents of a child with a disability. I'm also program director at Parents Helping Parents. I want to express my disappointment regarding the current immigrant survey that unfortunately has failed to capture the voices and needs of all immigrants, specifically the thousands of immigrant families raising children with disabilities, families that we here at PHP hear from every day. In addition to language barriers, economic hardships, and cultural differences, these families face distinct challenges that should be identified, must be identified in survey data as this is the data that will be used to determine future services and resources for our entire immigrant community. I ask you to take this matter seriously and consider the urgent need to rectify this oversight, pause this survey, and recommend that it be modified to ensure that all immigrant voices and needs are heard, including immigrant families who have children with disabilities. If diversity and inclusion truly are our focus, then it is our responsibility and duty to ensure that no one is left behind. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sandia Lopez. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sandia Lopez. I'm the director of the Inclusion Collaborative. On behalf of the Santa Clara County Office of Education, we wish to express our sincere appreciation for the Santa Clara County Office of Immigrants Relations Initiative to conducting a comprehensive assessment of immigrants in our community, marking a significant milestone after two decades. While the survey encompasses a wide array of questions, it is neglected to inquire about whether respondents are parents or caregivers of children with disabilities or their perspectives on the quality and accessibility of services provided to their children. This omission has far-reaching implications as the outcomes of this study will influence resource allocation decisions both within the county and among private funders in the foreseeable future. We emphasize the importance of adopting a disability-inclusive approach in this assessment Recognizing the intersections of immigration status and disability is essential to comprehensively address the unique experiences and needs of individuals and families in our community. By incorporating questions related to disabilities and the quality, accessibility of services for children with disabilities, we can gather invaluable insights. That Thank you. Our next speaker is Susanna Navarro. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. I'm Susanna Navarro. I'm here today as both an immigrant Latina mother of a Latino child with disabilities and a professional who supports thousands of families in similar circumstances in Santa Clara County. And it's with great concern uh, of, and hope for positive change that I hear today that I also brought, want to bring to you to your attention the exclusion of families uh, of children with disabilities from the ongoing assessment conducted by your Office of Immigrant Relations. I'm disheartened to learn that critical aspects of the immigrant experience are being overlooked. Many immigrant families like my own rely heavily on the work of systems of care and government as we move through our caregiving lives and deserve to be heard. From my experience as an immigrant, Raising a child with significant special needs, I know it takes years to make ends meet, and it took me a great amount of time to learn about services and about my child's rights. In my work at PHP, I speak with many immigrant families daily and hear about their constant fears. Please um, look into... Thank you. Our next speaker is Vivian True. 
I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. Good morning, my name is Vivian. I'm a proud immigrant and a devoted parent to my children with special needs and a staff at Parents Helping Parents supporting immigrant families. I'm here to emphasize the importance of inclusion and representation in this survey conducted by the Office of Immigrant Relations. It is my strong belief that every voice matters and currently the perspectives of immigrants who also have children with disabilities are missing from this crucial dialogue. As an immigrant, I understand the challenges, sacrifice and aspiration with coming to starting a new life in a new country. And as a parent with special needs children, I have firsthand um, knowledge of the unique challenges uh, we face navigating the support system, healthcare, and education, and all can be very, very daunting. And I implore you to recognize the diversity of our experiences to ensure that the survey reflects this significant segment of our community that holds crucial insights that could lead to more inclusive policies and services. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Blair Beacon. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, I wanted to uh, say hi to everyone <laughs> and to comment uh, my usual public comment uh, these days. Um, with the concept of, uh, on your, of an item coming up today that revises uh, the military use policy ideas uh, and, and practices created, helped created by the state of California, um, you know, you revised your video camera policy for video surveillance uh, issues for the surveillance tech ordinance. A real good luck to, uh, to, to acknowledge that and that we have items around, um, uh, you know, accountability that, you know, biometric camera use. Uh, we, we're afraid to talk about that subject more openly. Good luck how we can in the future. We're going to have to at some point. It's going to have to be an open public uh, conversation. We can't keep it secret and private forever. Good luck how to make it an open conversation about biometric uh, camera use. Thank you. Our next speaker is Anna Lopez. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Hi, I'm Ana Lopez. I'm an immigrant, a previous doctor recipient, and a PHP staff member. I also share my concern about the current survey being conducted by the SCC Office of Immigrant Relations, as it does not include feedback from immigrant parents with children with disabilities. Growing up as an immigrant, I've experienced the struggles and hardship making my way through college. As a professional, I work with the immigrant parents every day at PHP as they look for services for their children with disabilities. I want to ask that your county office of immigration relations not forget parents who have children with disabilities and who have experienced all the struggles and hardships as all immigrants do. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Viviana Barnwell. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. Good morning, my name is Viviana Barnwell. I'm the parent of a 10-year-old boy with multiple developmental disabilities. I'm an advocate at the state level as a member of the State Council on Developmental Disabilities, and I am an immigrant. I recently took the Santa Clara County Immigrant Survey, and I was hugely disappointed to see that the intersectionality between being an immigrant and having a child with disabilities was completely ignored. We need to know who's part of these intersectional groups to close the gap. Disability Rights California released a report that shows the huge disparity in regional center expenditures. While a white client received per capita 48,000 in a year in services, Hispanic clients received half of it. That's why it's important for everybody to acknowledge and understand the level of services disparity that families who are immigrants are under. That's why I'm requesting for you to post the survey and add a question that pertains to the intersectionality between being an immigrant and having a child with That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Our next item is to um, consider and approve the consent calendar and changes to the Board of Supervisors agenda. Curtis, let's begin with any changes uh, that we have as of this moment. Items on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language on the published agenda. Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. 
We have a correction to item number 8B, possible action I should read as follows. Adopt resolution finding the purchase of the property located at 10 Kirk Avenue, San Jose, APN 599-39-122, serves a public purpose and is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, approving the purchase of the property and approving a delegation of authority to the county executive or designee to negotiate, enter into, amend, and sign all agreements and documents necessary or required for the consummation of the purchase of the property, including but not limited to the approval notice and the certificate of acceptance, and to take all other necessary action to complete the acquisition in an amount not to exceed $14,500,000 plus closing costs of up to $40,000 following approval by county council as a form of legality and approval by the office of the county executive. Delegation of authority shall expire on December 31, 2023. We have a request from administration to hold item numbers 18 and 19 to October 3rd, 2023. Item number 18 is to receive report relating to the implementation of the alternatives to incarceration work group recommendations. Item number 19 is to approve second amendment to agreement with Valley Health Foundation relating to providing design, administration, and contract monitoring of the school-based behavioral health wellness center grant program. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to remove item numbers 24 and 49 from the consent calendar. Item number 24 is to approve the Sixth Amendment to agreement with Tradition Psychology Group Incorporated, doing business as Tradition's behavioral health relating to providing psychiatric physician services for County Santa Clara Correctional Facilities, increasing the maximum contract amount to $50,240,768 and extending the agreement for a 12-month period through September 30, 2024. Item number 49 is to consider recommendations relating to federal fiscal year 2023 emergency management performance grant funding. We have a request from the clerk of the board to delete item number 64O. Uh, item number 64O is to adopt proclamation declaring September 2023 as recovery month in Santa Clara County. Uh, executive leadership salary ordinance NS-20.23.04 was approved on first reading on September 12, 2023, and will not be finally approved until it is approved for a second reading, which is agendized to occur at today's meeting under item number 80. Per Government Code Section 54953, the following is an oral summary of the positions for which the proposed salary adjustments are required to be disclosed. NS-20.23.04 increases the flat rate salaries of the assessor, district attorney, and sheriff by 0.53%, effective on and after October 16, 2023, or 30 days after the date of final ordinance adoption, whichever is later. The new biweekly salary for the assessor position is $10,584.94. I'm sorry, $10,584.94. The new biweekly salary for the district attorney position is $15,360.06. The new biweekly salary for the sheriff position is $12,922. That concludes my list. Thank you very much. I will now look down the road to my colleagues for any additional uh, changes to the consent con calendar or comments there on Supervisor Chavez, I see your light, but I'm going to try to go in order if possible. Supervisor Arenas, do you have any changes or comments? Okay, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I want to put an item back on the agenda, but don't get excited because I'm going to pull something else off. And that is that um, I'd like to add item uh, 49 back onto the agenda, and this is the um, the fiscal year 2023 emergency management performance grant. And I wanna ask that we include an, a direction to staff to work with BOED and CADRE in, in partnership as they design the new, um, the new position that's gonna be funded. To, to clarify, when you say back on the agenda, do you, you mean back on the consent calendar? Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then a, an additional item that I'd like to pull off is item 57, and this is our um, green waste recovery contract that I'd like to pull. And then item 23 is an item I'd like to leave on the agenda. This is our senior nutrition contracts. And um, I, I first wanna thank the staff uh, for all the incredible work. I, I do wanna make sure that um, each of these programs makes menus available. Um, the seniors have given me feedback that we're not, uh, they're not getting the menus and it's difficult for them to plan not just what they're gonna eat, but where, um, because they make choices as well. Um, so I, I wanna make sure that's not a problem with any, with any of our future work there. And then um, 
And that's all for now. I, I have one more thing I'm going to look at. Thank you, colleagues. S Supervisor, for clarification, that was item 73 you were asking to pull, I believe. Green waste, you said? Did you say 57? Yeah. I apologize. But, it's, You're right. but green waste is 73. Pull 73 and return 49. And no changes to 24. Supervisor Simidian and Lee. Thank you, Madam President. We have been advised that certain items on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act, as indicated in the language in our published agenda. Specifically, we have been advised that items 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, <coughs> 51, 52, 53, 54, 56, 57, 58, 59, 61, 70, 71, 73, and 74 on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act. We've also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record <clears throat> a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of our agenda. I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may rec promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any employee of the County Council's office or of the Clerk of the Board's office or any other member of County staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself <clears throat> under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. With that, I will say thank you and also ask the clerk to record me as an abstention on item 70 and item 80. That's item 70 and item 80. I will be an abstention. Thank you again, Madam President. Supervisor Lee. Yes, actually, I would like to hear item number 49 if we can. I do have some clarifying questions. So we just Sorry, might... I didn't hear you. What, oh, which uh, yes, item number 49 regarding the emergency preparedness uh, issue. If you could just. Uh, so you want to keep it one. off of consent? Please, yeah, thank okay. you. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, item 27 is an amendment to the agreement to develop a health equity agenda. I am very supportive of this continued work among our health system partners uh, and with the involvement of our public health department. As the ledge file uh, indicates that the report and recommendations should be completed by December, I'd like to direct that an update on the finalization of the report come back to the full board in early 2024, please. Uh, regarding item 50, uh, among the items uh, for upcoming solicitations, there's a pa patient satisfaction survey for the hospital system and a member satisfaction survey for Valley Health Plan. Uh, if, um, if it has not already been done so in the preparation for these solicitations, I'd like to direct that the Health Systems Office of Health Equity and Inclusion review and inform these solicitations uh, and participate in the selection of vendors to the extent feasible. Item 51 is a delegation of authority uh, with the Santa Clara Housing Authority for Pedro Street. Here, I just want to shine a light and thank the staff for their work on this project and really point out the success of, tra of transitional housing when it is paired with access to permanent supportive housing. Since its opening in May 2021, uh, Pedro Street has served a total of 374 clients. There are currently 67 residents. And of that 374, 228 of them have been transitioned to permanent housing. So to our Office of Supportive Housing, uh, thank you. Thank you for demonstrating the success of uh, transitional housing when, when done in this very deliberate fashion. 
Item 52 is another agreement with the Housing Authority, this time for emergency housing vouch vouchers that have been the cornerstone of the Heading Home campaign to get us to functional zero for unhoused pregnant people and families with very young children. This again is a great example of our work to provide long-term solutions to homelessness. And, and again, I wanna thank the Office of Supportive Housing and related staff for their efforts. The report notes that 1,033 households have received funding for housing services through this agreement, with 857 of those, uh, of those families currently utilizing vouchers for their lease. Uh, we still have another 146 that are looking for housing. Uh, and finally, with regard to item 80, consistent with my prior vote, I will abstain on the executive salary ordinance for the assessor, the district attorney, and the sheriff. Thank you very much. Do we have public comment on consent? We currently have a one speaker in chambers. Do not see any speakers on Zoom. All right, uh, same message. If you're desiring to speak in chambers, now's the time to submit your yellow card. The queue will close when the first person begins speaking. And for those of you on Zoom, the Zoom queue will close when the first Zoom speaker begins speaking. Uh, let's offer two minutes, please, to our single speaker. All right, our speaker in chambers is Paul Soto. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, first of all, I'd like to talk about uh, item number 19. I would like there to be a component of this um, funding to include children that were in the third to fifth grade during COVID. We have to track these children through time because of the educational deficits that were created and the emotional and mental impacts of COVID are going to start surfacing in their lives, but later. It's gonna have a delayed impact, believe me. Because the prison system, what the prison system had been doing for decades is monetizing the issues that were experienced by children in the third grade. And they were able to scientifically predict how many beds they were gonna need in the prison system in the future based on the issues that kids were experiencing in the third grade. So here we have a monetization of poverty and uh, social and economic conditions in the barrios and how the prison systems were monetizing that. Well, add COVID to that, and you have a mixture that needs to be tracked. So I would like that to be a component of that, of number 19. The other thing is uh, a supervisor, supervisor Arenas on number 27 requested that, and this was because of Dr. Sarah Cody's uh, statement that racism is a public health issue. Now she commissioned us a report on how to quantify how Latinos have been impacted by racist policies. And I mean in every single sector of uh, social, economic, and social, economic, and health viability in this county. So I would like that report to be cross-referenced with this health equity agenda because there, 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 there's gonna be findings in both that are gonna be consistent and kind of uh, one is gonna inform the other. So I'd like them both to be included. And uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Dennis, for the report. All right, that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Um, I, I will move approval of the consent calendar with the uh, additional direction and changes. Is there a second, please? Second. Second from Supervisor Arenas. Uh, Curtis, let's vote, please. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye, with an abstention on items 70 and 80. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Albert? Uh, yes, with the abstention uh, mentioned earlier. Thank you. Motion carries. All right, we have a time certain hearing uh, for item eight regarding a property located at 10 Kirk Avenue in San Jose, and we need to begin this item with a Levine Act announcement, please. Item number eight is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. Thank you, good morning. 
Thank you. Uh, good morning, Keeley, Deputy County Executive. I'm here with uh, Consuelo Hernandez from the Office of Supportive Housing and Kai Siddiqui from Facilities and Fleet. Uh, we have two uh, action items for you to consider today. Uh, first is um, uh, authorizing um, uh, the County Executive to execute all agreements associated with the acquisition of 10 Kirk. The second would be to negotiate a lease agreement with the current tenant at 10 Kirk Avenue. Um, this would complete our transaction. Uh, it started in March uh, with a notice of intent to acquire the property, um, and we hope to close the acquisition by November 15th. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will open uh, the public hearing. Do we have any speakers? We have two speakers in chambers, and no speakers on Zoom. All right, let's uh, provide two minutes to each of our speakers, please. All right, our speakers in chambers are Cole Cameron and Raymond Watts. Good morning, Madam President, Vice President, fellow board members. Most of you already know me, but anyway, I'm, I'm Colonel Rory Watts, retired U.S. Army. Veteran, and I'm honored to address the convening board regarding the issue that's very near and dear to my heart, and that's the acquisition of the property, better known as Tin Kirk. It is actually the facility for Santa Clara County Veteran Transitional Housing. When I first heard of that the county was considering purchasing this facility for veterans, I was overjoyed simply because of the impact that facility would have in benefiting our county warriors. I've always been a champion of veteran programs such as food insecurity drug and alcohol addiction, mental illness, education, suicide, and of course, housing. The purchase of 10 Kirk will be a beacon of hope for our county veterans by providing them a safe environment to thrive and leverage existing veteran services and or programs from VA Palo Alto office, from, from the Santa Clara County Veteran Service Office, Home First, and many others. This facility meets the immediate need of many veterans who are currently unhoused or on the brink of becoming unhoused. With provided housing, these soldiers can then focus on actions that personally benefit them, the community, and the county. Whether it's getting a hot meal, a hot shower, employment, or access to needed VA services, having a safe place to recharge will be a game changer. With the right operational changes and help from the county partners, Tinker can be a springboard for finding long-term housing for our veterans. I respectfully request that the acquisition of the property move forward as recommended. It will change the many lives within our county and not just our soldiers. Thank you and God bless America. Good morning, I'm Cole Cameron. I really appreciate this time this morning and all of your support in acquiring 10 Kirk. Uh, thank you, Colonel Ray. I uh, really appreciate everything you've been doing with us uh, in many different avenues. Uh, I won't repeat the things that he stated. I'll make this a little more personal. I worked as an outside facilitator in San Quentin Prison, having veterans from that circle housed at 10 Kirk. I've repeatedly gone back and looked at the facility, uh, talked with the uh, people running it, and uh, would think it would be a great uh, opportunity to supplement the counseling and support of their great staff that are really excellent, I believe, with additional support from our Silver Creek team at the VA, uh, the addition of our social worker and our VSO office on Winchester, and additional support uh, from our Palo Alto team. So I look forward to that being uh, purchased. And I would have, I think I heard, uh, a continued uh, agreement with the current people running it to be re-reviewed uh, with other options being considered. Uh, I really have been, I talked to vets, one of them was a, a Korean vet, six years there at 10 Kirk. This was just last week as a follow-up to facilitate my, my concerns and, and issues this morning. Uh, was really happy with everything. Uh, older vets, leave me alone. He, he, he was left alone, he liked the food, he liked the counseling. I spoke with another younger vet, uh, quite happy with everything. 
uh, and I feel like sometimes the staff is constrained by current leadership. So that's just something to further investigate. I don't have any hard facts to, to bring to that, uh, just a concern. And, and thank you so much for everything you've been doing. We have speakers on Zoom as well. We do. Excellent reminder to anyone on Zoom that when the first sp the sp first speaker begins speaking, we'll close the queue. So let's give that just a second or so. And how many speakers? Uh, one speaker on Zoom. All right, let's hear a single speaker, please. All right, our speaker on Zoom is Sean. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. I'll be brief. Um, I just wanted to say I wholeheartedly support this. Uh, this is one of the very, very, very few places um, in all of San Jose that I haven't heard negative remarks about. Um, I've had people go through this uh, uh, property, or I've had people go to 10 Kirk, stay there, say it was great. I've had people go there and stay there and get thrown out and still say it was great. Uh, so that's a rarity in uh, San Jose and the county. So I wholeheartedly support this, and I'm going to end my comment there with so much time left. Thank you. Um, looks like we had one more hand raised before the queue was cut off, so our speaker will be Blair Beekman. Please accept the unmute. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Thank you very much for noticing my hand. Yeah, I said it before time was you know, cut off in a reasonable amount of time. I just wanted to thank uh, Supervisor Ellenberg for, for asking if there's any additional public comment from the uh, Zoom and, and taking an additional uh, minute, you know, second, a few extra seconds to ask that question and to take time. Uh, Santa Clara County uh, public meetings, you don't do that enough. And the clerk, you know, uh, thankfully noticed my hand in time. Uh, really want to practice. Uh, openness and accountability and allow public comment. Uh, don't don't over make a, a meeting so over efficient that we lose public comment time and space. It's it's a good practice and it's it's enjoyable. <laughs> it should be enjoyable. I know efficiency is important, but but the public meeting process is too. And and thank you to uh, Supervisor Ellenberg taking the time to ask uh, for public comment on this item. Uh, and nice public comment from Sean as well. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. With that, I'll close the public hearing and turn uh, first to Supervisor Simidian for an anticipated announcement, and then uh, my other colleagues. Thank you, Madam President. Yes, we have been advised that item eight on today's agenda may be subject to the Levine Act, as indicated in the language on our published agenda. We've also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of our agenda. I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made, forgive me, I repeat myself, and finally I would ask that if any employee of the county council's office or of the clerk of the board's office or any other member of county staff or any other member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you, Supervisor uh, Chavez. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move approval of both actions um, from the staff, and then I'd like to make a comment. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you. Um, so first, I, I wanted to um, just thank the speakers who came forward and spoke, and I particularly just want to acknowledge the uh, leadership of our staff working with the seller to make sure that this um, property is protected for affordable housing. I know that was not easy and want to say thank you very much. Um, I, I do want to just ask um, a couple of questions about next steps. So the um, property, um, once it's purchased, could you just talk a little bit about the folks that are living there, the current contracts, what you anticipate happening with the property in the short run and then the long run as well? Sure. Uh, thank you, Supervisor, for that question. Um, 
uh, once we acquire the property, the uh, lease between the current owner and the current uh, tenant, which is the homeless veterans emergency housing um, facility, will be assigned to the county and transferred to us. Uh, then we will uh, negotiate or renegotiate the terms of that month-to-month -month, uh, lease so that they can, can continue to operate their programs on the site. Um, uh, you may uh, know that the organization um, has uh, operates emergency shelter transitional housing for homeless veterans. Those are funded by the federal VA and the local VA. Um, and those uh, operations um, will mostly continue, although there is some change in the um, grant with the federal VA. And then uh, we'll be working with the organization plus our local VA to see how we can continue to support uh, the operation there. In the long term, we have not developed any in plans. Uh, we have not conducted any analysis around long-term development. Um, uh, we, have to, uh, we believe that we need to acquire the property, assess the current operations, uh, and then uh, discuss with the county executive and the board long-term plans. So, colleagues, um, there, there are two issues that I want to make sure we address in the interim. And one is, I, I know you've already done this, but I'm just going to emphasize again that we continue to talk to the residents um, so that there's nothing surprising, nothing, um, nothing uh, that would be disruptive. And second, that I know that we all got a letter um, that explains some of the challenges with the facility, and I, I just want to make sure that we're um, doing two things at once. One is making sure that the programs that are being provided are to the quality and standard that the county would like to see them. Um, but second, that the um, that if there's any uh, interim work that needs to be done on the at the facility to make sure it's um, hab habitable and safe and all of that, that we. I know you all do this. I just want to make sure we put it on the record so people understand that you are doing that. Um, and then. You know, as it relates to the um, the long term, you know, one is that um, there are very few um, pieces of property that are this size. And again, I just want to say thank you for preserving it because I think that one of the hopes of Measure A is that it would be responsive uh, to what was happening in, in the market. And I think you're demonstrating that that's the case. And I want to make sure that we are keeping an eye on continuing to provide veterans housing and veterans services. And so while the board, I, I understand, would need to have a take a vote and there needs to be discussion about it, I just wanted to sunshine for my colleagues that um, f from my perspective, one of the opportunities we have here is to maintain um, housing and services uh, for veterans that will allow us to keep the that pipeline um, in particular really low because we'd like to be a county where no veteran is homeless. So I, I want to make sure that if we're not using this particular property for that service, that we are going to replace it to do so. So I, I recognize there's a lot of moving parts, but I, I for one just want to make sure we don't lose this commitment to our veterans community, which again, I know that we all feel that way. I just wanted to make sure I I um, shared a little bit of my thoughts about the future, but thank you very much for the work. It's, it's the right direction. Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, so thank you first to uh, Colonel Ray Watts, our chair of our Veterans Commission, Cole Cameron, and also on hiring homeless advocate Sean Cartwright, who just spoke earlier in support of acquiring this property at the Veterans Housing Facility at Ten Kirk. And I also want to thank our key staff, Key Lee, um, Consuelo Hernandez, and also James Williams, uh, actually in his former role as county counsel, and we've talked late night to try to get this negotiation, uh, which has been certainly lengthy and difficult for the last few years. Since 2013, this 4.3 acre site has offered transitional housing for thousands of veterans to help them get back on their feet, led by the CEO, Irvin Goodwin, who suggested this idea. This site includes housing for over 100 beds, dining hall, community rooms, green lawns, gardens, and relaxation area in the serene setting. That is a safe space for our veterans and helps in meeting those basic needs of housing and food and their recuperation. Right off of Alam Rock Road is also a good connection to various public transportation. I've been working on, on our county acquiring this since I first joined this board almost three years ago. 
this issue is very personal to me, and I'm very excited that this is finally happening. Because as a former Navy sailor myself, and a grandchild of a U.S. Navy sailor and World War II veteran, I'm definitely biased for our service members and feel obligated to do more to support my fellow veterans. After serving almost three decades, and including a year's boots on the ground in Iraq, I have personally witnessed the struggles on and off the battlefield through horrors of war, accidents, physical, mental injuries, PTSDs, suicides and attempts, and surviving countless life and death situations would do to people. Our veterans have served our country with honor and dignity. Over 60,000 of our veterans are now living in our county, and we certainly need to serve all of them that they so deserve. I'm fully committed to partner with our federal, state, and local VA, our county's VSOs, stakeholders, to bring in the additional resources to house more veterans when over a quarter of our homeless residents are veterans right here. We must use these resources to rehabilitate and modernize this property so that he has so much potential to serve many more men and women who risk their lives to serve us, to protect us from harm's way and our democracy. I feel it's my duty as a veteran and elected official to serve our veterans with honor and dignity. And for the thousands of veterans living in our county, I hope to have the support of my board colleagues to move this action forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a, a motion by Chavez, second by Lee. Uh, we've heard public comment. Let's vote on the item, please. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Elberg? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, um, we're now going to hear items nine and 10 uh, together. Item nine is OCLEM's report on the use of chemical agents in planned force responses. And item 10 is the Sheriff's Military Equipment uh, Annual Report and Proposed Ordinance. Both of these reports stem from AB 481, state legislation passed in 2021 that requires every law enforcement agency in California to submit an annual military equipment use policy and make findings regarding the circumstances, if any, of their permitted use. This legislation is one of many bills that arose after the murder of George Floyd in 2020 and has brought about unprecedented transparency in law enforcement operations that allows the public to know exactly what kind of military style weapons law enforcement has when they are authorized to use and are using such weapons and how much public funding is being spent to facilitate that use. One of the revelations of this increased transparency is a broader understanding that correctional officers very often must address the challenging situations of engaging with, treating, or addressing individuals in custody who are suffering from a variety of mental illnesses, largely because we don't have the proper system built out to ensure more appropriate care. And so as we dive into this conversation about specific uses of clear out to respond to difficult situations where custody staff is trying to figure out how to best engage with people with serious mental illnesses in our jails, I want us to remain clear on the overarching fact that any and all answers we come to will be wrong answers when these individuals do not belong in a correctional setting in the first place. I know that our county remains committed to urgently expanding our behavioral health system capacity and alternatives to incarceration. In the meantime, we need to consider how to engage with people in our custody whose needs and presentation present extraordinarily cha extraordinary challenges to custody staff, let alone to their own well-being. With that, I will turn over to I will turn to OCLEM to present their report, then we'll go to public comment. Then I will come back to the board where I will begin with some discussion organization uh, direction. Is Mike Janako presenting on Zoom? Or I believe here? he's on Zoom. Okay. And for clarification, I have a note from the clerk. We will take public comment on items 9 and 10. 
uh, at the same time following the OCLEM presentation. Um, thank you, President Ellenberg. I apologize that I wasn't able to attend this um, important um, item in person. Uh, the Acting Secretary of Labor asked me to come to Washington, D.C. to attend an event, um, and this was a pre-scheduled event, so I found myself on the West Coast, I mean, on the East Coast. Um, thank you, President Ellenberg, for sort of uh, previewing what I was uh, going to say, which is AB 481 um, does require, for the first time, um, elected officials um, weighing in on what the policy should be for particular kinds of military type equipment um, and gives for the first time elected officials and leadership of counties and cities um, a voice in how uh, certain types of equipment should be used um, by their law enforcement agencies. It is a <coughs> groundbreaking statute. Um, I am going to give a high level uh, preview uh, or overview of our report. Um, the report is obviously attached to the agenda um, and then talk about some of the procedural issues that have occurred since we issued our report. Um, but I'm not going to go over every jot and tittle in the report, um, but we'll be talking about some of the uh, overarching um, findings that we made as a result of the work that was assigned to us by, by this board. Um, after um, our report was submitted in late August, uh, there was a request um, that we present uh, our report uh, to the CCLEM, which is our counterpart, uh, the community, a counterpart of monitoring in Santa Clara County, which we did. In a three-hour meeting, we laid out all of the uh, work that we had done, the evaluations, the observations that we had made, tried to explain as well as we could the process that was used before chemical agents were introduced in the jail setting. And subsequent uh, to that, uh, the CCLEM membership had a uh, robust discussion on um, our report and um, what we had found and um, reporting back to this board, um, the CCLEM was determined through a vote not to take an official position with regard to the continued use of this chemical agent in the jail. Um, four of the six members believed that um, or voted to um, authorize or recommend this board continue to authorize chemical agents, but for lack of that fifth vote, uh, there was um, no majority vote with regard to that motion. Um, the choices um, with regard to uh, uh, cell extractions, which is what um, the clear out chemical agent is used exclusively for in custody. The choices are not good choices. Um, uh, I would uh, emphasize uh, what President Allenberg has already stated, which is uh, most of the individuals upon uh, whom chemical agents are used have no business in a custodial facility. And I don't think there's any uh, debate about that among us, the advocates, and most individuals. Nonetheless, they're there now. Um, and so when there is a situation where uh, medical health, mental health assigned to the jails and who are providing treatment on a daily basis to individuals who are in custody, make a decision that is important for a particular patient to be moved from one part of the facility to another, um, that we think that those decisions are primarily medical and mental health decisions. And <clears throat> that has not always been uh, the dynamic uh, in many of the jails that we have worked with over the 20 years that we have done this work. Uh, traditionally, uh, many sheriffs believe that the running of the jails and the decision about who's going to get mental, mental health treatment, who's going to be in which cells, who's going to get medical treatment, was the decision of the deputies and not of mental, mental health and not of the medical folks. That has been turned around, but we saw remnants of it as, as recently as 2018 when we looked at the Nunez report that was reported to you earlier this year. In that case, 
um, deputies made the decision that medical staff was not going to come in and assess uh, Mr. Nunez as he lay on the floor paralyzed. Um, and that has flipped around as a result of new leadership, as a result of a new culture in the jails. It is now metal, medical and mental health that are deciding if an inmate needs to be moved out of a cell. Um, and they are the ones that are the instigators behind those decisions, which we think that is a right-sized approach. And we saw that with regard to each of the instances in which um, Clara was used uh, during this past year. We looked at all of those instances, the body-worn camera, the fixed cameras, the specially held camera for the events, as well as all of the uh, work, negotiations, discussion, planning, and thoughtfulness that went into the decision about when, whether to go in, and if so, when, and then finally, how. I'll get to the how in a minute, but we found that uh, by and large, those decisions were thoughtful decisions. They weren't spur of the moment decisions. They were planned. A review of, uh, of our records were, was made. Consultation was made in every case with medical staff and mental health about the most appropriate way to go in, when to go in, um, et cetera. And sometimes these processes took hours. Sometimes they took days. And sometimes they took weeks before a decision was made to go into the cell. Um, but once a decision was made, uh, the correctional uh, deputies and their supervisors were left with two options. One was to go in the traditional way, which is with batons, with shields, uh, with other kinds of weapons and um, just essentially uh, open the cell and come right in and use physical force, significant physical force in some cases, to um, uh, neutralize the patient, to get him handcuffed, and then to extract him from the cell. Um, however, more recently, not, not like next last year, but over the past few years, um, the jail has tried uh, chemical agents, a particular kind of chemical agent, which is called clear out on the market, can be purchased over Amazon. It is a um, not a potent, not an extremely potent chemical agent. It's not like the tear gas that you see in crowd control. And obviously we have looked at crowd control and situations. And I think that was really the impetus behind uh, the enactment of AB 481 in part. But um, this chemical agent, uh, which is less uh, intrusive than straight OC spray, which ironically is not covered by AB 481, um, allowed in many cases, in half the cases that we looked at, uh, once that chemical agent was introduced in the cell, uh, the patient um, complied when in the hours or days before he had not complied, um, allowed himself to be handcuffed was decontaminated and then was moved on to whatever needed to be done next, whether that was a relocation or involuntary medication or what have you. Uh, we have been advised that OC spray is much more. Oh, Mike, you froze. And so the decontamination efforts are much more extensive. Um, Uh, um, so as a result of, of our evaluation, uh, we determined that um, it was reasonable and consistent with the policy that the jail monitors had agreed to, along with the sheriff's office just recently on their new use of force policy um, and was consistent with that policy. Um, we were asked um, and did try hard uh, to compare uh, what is done in Santa Clara County with regard to the use of this chemical agent with other jurisdictions. Um, but it was very difficult. That part of the project was a very difficult project because of the mere fact that we don't have the same level of access that we have to other county jails up throughout the state than we do with Santa Clara County. One of the reasons we were able to make the findings that we did was because of the level of access we had 
not only to the video uh, camera footage, but also to the after action reports and talking with individuals. And while we did some outreach to other jail systems, um, it's not the same to talk to somebody and ask through an interview what they're doing as it is to actually dig into the raw data material after action and process to learn what actually is going on in any particular system. So it makes it very difficult to compare. We also have begun to take a look at um, how um, county hospitals uh, who are housing those with mental illness are addressing issues in which somebody needs to be restrained. Um, but we're not there yet, and we're not sure that the um, that the lessons that are learned in the county hospitals will apply in a um, in an equivalent way with regard to what's going on in the jails. For example, um, when um, there's an attempt to restrain a mental health patient in a county hospital, um, and then there is um, resistance and there is injury to staff, uh, what we have been advised is that what happens next is that uh, the patient then gets unfortunately moved to jail and is now going to be treated in a jail setting, um, which is exactly, I think, what we don't want. So there are a lot of unanswered questions we have with regard to how um, hospitals in the county are dealing with this. We intend to look more. That was a commitment we made to CCLEM, and that's a commitment we'll make to this board as well, that more to be done there. We had a number of recommendations um, that were intended to um, provide more process to what we thought was already robust process, but we thought more could be done with regard to documentation. Uh, we thought that was should we, that before chemical agents are introduced, there should be a higher level of a supervisor making that final choice. Um, we thought that um, certainly there needed to be more attention placed on pre-existing conditions. Um, and um, so made recommendations uh, designed to improve that process. I think that um, because we're not going to do the three hour presentation we did with CCLEM uh, to this board this, this, after, this, this morning, I think I will stop there and certainly be available to answer any questions that this board may have about the findings um, that are included on our report. We thank the board. We've learned a lot as a result of this process and thank the board for the assignment. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to public comment. First, do we have speakers in chambers? I see the yellow cards. Uh, uh, we currently have uh, nine speakers in chambers and uh, 11 on Zoom. All right, so that brings us in the, in the one minute range. And before you begin, Curtis, let me note that if there is anyone desiring to speak in the chamber who has not already submitted their yellow card, Right now is the time to do it. The queue for in-chamber speakers will close when the first speaker begins. And to those of you on Zoom who have raised your virtual hands already, thank you very much. If anyone else wishes to speak, please be sure to raise your virtual hand before the first Zoom speaker begins speaking. At that time, the uh, Zoom queue will close. So let's begin with, you said 11 speakers in chambers? Uh, nine, if I counted correctly. Nine speakers in chambers. Again, looking, I don't see anybody dashing up with a yellow card, so we'll call it nine. Thanks, Curtis. All right, I'm going to call off the first uh, five names. So we have Michelle Mashburn, Paul Soto, Christine Clifford, Garmin Torres, and Sean Allen. And, and before they begin, just a reminder to everyone that this public comment period is for items 9 and 10. The, um, yes, 9 and 10. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Michelle Mashburn. I'm a resident of Santa Clara County um, in District 2. Uh, tear gas is a disability justice issue, and we need to start looking at it from that in that direction. And I want to echo what Dr. Susan Ellenberg said at the beginning, which was these things should be prevented before they reach the point of this type of scenario and situation. 
However, we yet do not have the people present and the people involved in those conversations that can thoroughly address those issues. HERD is an organization of disability-led, disability justice abolitionist work. They are very important in kind of mitigating some of these issues. And there's been work in these situations, and the county needs to work to bring those people into these conversations. I do not support the use of tear gas in the jails, and I think it's beyond time for that to be outlawed or restricted more further in this county. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe, we were denied trials in the instances of Andrew Hogan and Juan Nunez. Okay, if we had it, we were, they were, those families were paid hush money because the issues in the jail would have been explicitly articulated within the context of a trial because deputies would have had been uh, uh, put under oath to give testimony. And we would have been able to see very clearly what goes on in the jail. Sadism exists in our jails. We have to accept that fact. The Stanford experiment highlighted that, that when we create certain conditions, it's natural for the guards to behave in a certain way, and that is to dehumanize the, the people that are in their custody. And that was proven explicitly in the case of Michael Tyree. So we can't, we can't continue to act like this evidence doesn't exist and that sadism doesn't exist within the context of these jails. Hi. Um, no one wants chemical agents or physical force to be used in extracting a mentally ill detainee from their cell for whatever purposes. To me, as already stated, the solution to having these methods, to not having these methods, is to not have seriously mentally ill people in custody to begin with. They should be in a medical setting. I'd like the board to go one step further and ask OCLEM to examine our county's processes and systems to understand why people with such profound mental health needs end up in custody and not a hospital. Surely it's evident along the continuum from arrest and at booking and once they're in custody or decompensating that the person needs a medical setting. Why then are they in custody? What off-ramp should have been taken instead or needs to be created to prevent the incarceration? Where do these systems need revamping or creating? Um, <clears throat> to prevent incarceration to begin with or to move people to the appropriate setting. Also, please fold in um, agencies that work with the mentally ill. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm from SIREN, Services Immigrant Rights and Education Network. We have long been an advocate for human rights for over 35 years and are in support of more humane practices by law enforcement agencies, especially with regarding the use of chemical agents. The immigrant community repeatedly tell us stories of suffering and unimaginable abuse, threats of violence on their way to this country, and then, sadly, it continues once it with, from law enforcement in the U.S. A significant amount of the incarcerated population are also immigrants and people of colors. Chemical agents are unsafe for use on any human being, unsafe for our community, for the inmates in our jails. And better uh, use of taxpayer dollars could be used instead of chemical agency to more effectively investing in more mental health and crisis intervention professionals. Thank you. After Sean Allen, our next speakers will be Raymond uh, Goins. Alicia Chavez, uh, Xavier, and Melissa. Good morning, my name is Sean Allen. I'm the Legal Re Redress Chair of the Silicon Valley Branch of the NAACP. We oppose the use of uh, chemical agents in the jails. Uh, specifically, I want to let the board know that the, in 2018 to 2020, I uh, oversaw the uh, emergency response team at Elmwood. I was involved in the Hogan incident at Elmwood. Um, Although I disagree with the, uh, the reports of the conclusions of county council, however, we could have chosen to use chemical agents at that time, and we didn't. In the instances that I used chemical agents, um, 
even the staff members were affected. Uh, the staff members ran out of the facility one time. Well, watch commander ran out, of the, ran out of the building because of the exposure. And also, what you should be clear, what you should know, also know is that the Alexander Brothers Hospital in 2018 sent a memo over to the sheriff's office and asking them not to use chemical agents in the jails. I mean, I'm sorry, in the hospitals because of the exposure to the, to all people in the hospital, including that exposure, would come from the ventilation system. There was that degree of concern by the, that the hospital sent that memo over to the sheriff's office, even though the sheriff's office said no to it. Thank you. Um, good morning, my name is Raymond Gones, I'm with Silicon Valley Debug. But most importantly, um, I represent a population in which I was, I was form I'm formerly incarcerated. I just came home six months ago. I was in county jail about eight months ago, and I was in county jail for six months. I was in county jail from June to November of 2022. And in that, in that time period, I seen inmates get tortured by these chemical devices by being sprayed because they had a mental health breakdown that could have been prevented had the COs took the proper actions and seen that this individual is, is, is deteriorating, let's give him mental health treatment now. Instead, they waited until the very end, he was uncompliant, and they maced him. They drenched him with mace, went out to the sun deck, and because they couldn't take it, they came back and kept it up and left out. The, the sheriff's department said it's an alternative for use of force, that they don't go in. But I promise you, and they know that they will mace you, and they will go in your cell and still use force to bring you out after you were maced. That's what they fear realize. The force is still going to be used, whether it makes it or not. So saying that's all chance of the force is a complete lie. Hello, my name is Alicia Chavez. I'm an organizer with Silicon Valley Debug and a resident of District 3. We strongly urge the board to join us in our stance against lethal weapons like tasers and military weapons like tear gas in our jails to reject the Oakland report without first taking into consideration the community and incarcerated folks who have been directly impacted, and especially after the comments in the recent Spotlight, Spotlight article were made that Oakland supports tear gas in our jail. To reject the approval of the sheriffs to purchase unnecessary military weapons such as tear gas and to address the larger issues of true alternatives to incarceration described in Debug's community proposal to the ATI. Not only should the county not approve military chemical weapons to be used on mental health folks, all mental health folks determined by a psychiatrist to be treated with involuntary medication or diagnosed with a mental health disorder or incompetent to stand trial do not belong in jail. They belong in a non-carceral treatment. Hello, my name is Xavier Espana with Silicon Valley Debug. I am against the use of chemical agents in uh, force, use of force, speaking from experience of gas and OC spray in CDCR. Knowing these weapons are used for obedience from individuals like animals instead of compliance. Cutting off someone's oxygen is not a form of de-escalation, it's torture. It is not okay to use chemicals on humans like they are bugs, to fumigate their cells like they are rodents. Saying that these weapons, they're even combined with TAM, which is military use. Imagine saying military weapons are used in sales against humans who have nothing to defend themselves. And the fact that this has been brought up years in the past before and denied, and the fact that they keep bringing it up, nothing has changed. It's not good back then. It's not okay back then. It's not okay now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Melissa and I am from Silicon Valley Debug. I am a Santa Clara County resident. Former Santa Clara County Sheriff Lori Smith found guilty of all counts of corruption. Um, There's still COs who are still working there who were working under her, so the culture has not changed. It still remains. I strongly urge the board to join us in our stance against lethal weapons like tasers and military weapons like tear gas in our jails. Reject the Oakland report without first taking in consideration of the community and incarcerated folks who have been directly impacted and especially after comments in a recent spotlight article were made that Oakland supports tear gas in our jails. Reject approval of the sheriff to purchase unnecessary military weapons such as tear gas. Address the larger issue of true alternatives to incarceration described in D-Bucks community proposal to 
ATI. I also would like um, the board to watch the video that um, Debug uh, sent. Thank you. That concludes our public comment in chambers. And for public speakers on Zoom, uh, just an extra second to raise your virtual hand if you haven't already done so. When the first speaker begins speaking, the queue will close. All right, our first speaker on Zoom is Victor Sin. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. Good morning, Supervisors. I'm Victor Sin, Chair of the Santa Clara Valley Chapter of the ACLU of Stockton, California. We oppose the use of tear gas and chemical weapons in all law enforcement and carceral facilities. Tear gas is a chemical weapon banned in war and should not be used on residents for any reason. Pepper spray, formerly known as OC spray, is so toxic and dangerous that it is classified and regulated under state law as a form of tear gas. It can cause not only intense pain, but also blistering of the skin, respiratory arrest, and even an increased risk of stroke and heart attacks. According to KTCU's investigation, Santa Clara County is the only county in the Bay Area that uses the tear gas CS. We urge you not to approve the use of tear gas and chemical weapons by the Office of the Sheriff. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andrew Bigelow. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Bigelow. Uh, I'm born and raised in San Jose, California. I'm also part of Silicon Valley Debug. Um, I wanted to uh, strongly urge this board to not uh, approve uh, the lethal weapons and uh, military weapons such as chemical agents and tear gas uh, to be used in the county jail. Um, I think that uh, just because our county is inadequate in addressing mental health folks being incarcerated uh, does not give the right for the public to be presented with this false choice between uh, whether or not we should use military chemical weapons inside our county jails on defenseless folks in small cells. Um, I also think that um, folks should reject this, uh, this proposal uh, just based upon the testimony and, and, and from people who have actually experienced it. I don't, I don't know if anyone who's gonna be voting on this or people who wrote these proposals. Thank you, our next speaker is Michelle. Michelle, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. Hi, my name is Michelle Hunter. Um, I am a resident of Ben Clare County, and I stand with um, this community and with um, Silicon Valley Debug in their proposal to ATI. These um, weapons, these chemical weapons that are used on people like they're less than people. As a former CDCR employee working in a mental health unit, I can testify that there are alternatives if you actually want to do them. You have to make the effort. And I agree that this is not having somebody come into compliance because generally not enough efforts are made prior to just being able to use this agent to get people to come into obedience, exactly like a gentleman said earlier. We urge you, please, do not approve the use of these weapons against these human beings. Thank you. Our next speaker is Walter Wilson. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. Good morning. My name is Walter Wilson. I'm a uh, co-chair with the CCLEM and I am against using these chemical weapons in the, um, uh, the jail system here. Um, the idea that you can buy this off Amazon, as uh, Mr. Janako just said, is just insane. You can buy a lot of poison off Amazon. I, I can't even believe he even said that. It's like that this justifies the use of it. Furthermore, the fact that, you know, we have an obligation to protect these people. They're already, they're already living in a deficit because they have behavioral health problems. And I asked the question in our meeting, what are the long-term impacts of using this this product on people psychologically, and no one can seem to have an answer to that. So for me, 
I'm against it. I, I, I think that, that we have an obligation to stop using this on people in sales. I believe that it's torture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leica Camille LaRoque. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you'll have one minute to speak. Hello, I'm Leica LaRoque, community organizer at Asian Law Alliance, and we oppose the use of tear gas and other chemical weapons in jails. The use of tear gas is dehumanizing, dangerous, and traumatizing. Incarcerated people, especially those suffering with mental illness, are still human beings and should be treated with dignity. If we are truly prioritizing mental health, we should be looking at the larger issue at hand. Folks suffering from mental health should not be incarcerated. Instead of improving, instead of approving the continued use of chemical weapons in jails, make the effort to consider true alternatives to incarceration and unnecessary uses of force. Using tear gas on incarcerated folks suffering with mental health illness is trauma on top of trauma, and that is unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. Do you have one minute to speak? Uh, good morning. Thank you, Board of Supervisors. I'm Catherine Hedges. I live in District 2, member of Surge, supporting SVD back. Um, I am simply aghast that in 2023, we are using military weapons on people who are being held in prison and their mental with uncontrolled mental illness who should be under medical care. What are they even doing in a prison? They should be in a mental health facility. And why is it taking months to decide, oh, well, he's off his meds and, and he's getting worse. And hearing from people who've been in the jail about how these weapons are used against the, the uh, incarcerated people, um, Board of Supervisors, you need to stop this. Utterly today you were, well, I can't name names, but you know, all of you guys, you talk about mental health and how important it is. Don't depend on the. Thank you. Our next speaker is Samina Usman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. Hello, can you hear me? My name is Samina Usman. I am the government relations coordinator for uh, Secure Justice. Um, I we're absolutely against uh, the use of tear gas and other chemical weapons uh, in jails. Um, it's banned in war, for goodness sakes. Um, we we know that not only do these weapons cause intense pain, it has blistering of the skin, respiratory arrest, or even increased risk to strokes or heart attacks. And it seems as though in the case of Santa Clara County, clear out was deployed as like almost like standard protocol as opposed to individual assessment. Um, what we have is a problem is that we don't have uh, enough beds or enough um, um, you know, health healthcare elements that would, that would address the issues uh, far better than uh, a carceral way. We know that Solano County, they forbid tear gas and pepper spray, and they persuade people to take medication by calling their doctors and calling defense attorneys. That is a way in order to solve it. And Thank you. Our next speaker is Leslie Zeiger. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Hello, I'm Leslie Zeiger. I live in District 5, and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. Supervisor Ellenberg, three weeks ago, you requested that these items be held and directed OIR uh, slash Oakland to seek input from directly impacted people in the community at large. Neither has happened. They just resubmitted the same exact report as on August 29th. And when they had an opportunity to gather community input and input from directly impacted uh, at the September 7th CCLEM meeting, they instead chose to lecture community members and those impacted and tell them that they would only worry if uh, tear gas were being used or chemical agents were being used more than 30 times per year. Well, their own report says chemical agents were used 134 times in the first six months of this year. I urge you to stop wasting. Thank you. Our next speaker is Raj Jayadev. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. 
Good morning, I'm Raj Jada with Silicon Valley Debug. I'm calling on the board to no longer allow the sheriff to use chemical weapons in the jails and to not accept the Oakland report. The point of AB 481 was not solely to make an inventory publicly of the weapons by law enforcement. It was so that leaders like yourself could stop the imposition and use of those weapons on our community members. And in point to, to tear gas, Santa Clara is, should not be trying to build the largest arsenal of weapons to be used against those with mental health issues in our jails. The point is our county should be finding alternatives so that those with mental health needs could get treatment and support outside of carceral facilities is why we submitted our own community report in the ATI framework. And lastly, the analysis is not only on the dangers of the military grade weapon of chemical agents, it's who's wielding that weapon. You have correctional officers that have known evidence history of making racist lethal comments. And I think it calls into question the validity of- Thank you. Our next speaker is RM James. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. We need to ban these chemicals now in our jails. Look at the Nuremberg principles, folks. If you know or should have known that we're committing crimes against humanity and you don't stand up as board members, you're complicit in these actions. The Auckland report, Janako's report, they did not go and interview the 17 people that were gassed to find out what their experience was. We have not yet explored the alternatives that are used. I was on the LPS calendar for two years as a public defender. I never saw tear gas used against patients in locked facilities, even with extreme mental illness. Where's our public defender? Where is Molly O'Neill or somebody from her office who represents the majority of these folks? I'm a retired public defender from Santa Clara County, and I'm embarrassed that my office is not taking a stand here. I want you to look at the debug videos from those people that can speak from experience. This is torture. It's in violation of all kinds of human rights. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sandra Asher. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. Good morning. I'm a D5 resident, member of Surge of the ATI work group and a member of the Real Coalition Public Safety Work Group. I'd first like to uplift Michelle Mashburn's comments regarding this being a disability justice issue. It's unconscionable that our county continues to use military chemical weapons and tasers on individuals with mental illness in our jail even kinder, gentler tear gas. Would they use this use of force on a diabetic to force them to take their insulin? I think not. So why is it okay for someone with mental illness? The Oakland report attempted, report attempted to explore what other jails do, but they said it was difficult. Since we are the only county that uses it, I think there are many best practices we should be exploring. Instead of buying chemical weapons, such as tear gas for our jails, we need to address the larger issue of true alternatives to incarceration, providing community-based services and support instead of jail. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sean. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Sometimes when you're waiting to speak, you're really thankful for the company that you keep. Um, SJPD, uh, unleashed chemical agents on us during the George Floyd uh, protest. When I sucked down tear gas, I was tortured. I thought I was going to suffocate. It created lifelong trauma. I didn't want to comply. I thought I was suffocating. I was fighting for my life. The last thing I thought about was complying. I am still traumatized by this torture. And this was while I was outside, while there was some wind that I could have watched the tear gas in. I can't imagine what it's like being tear gassed in a cell when you're trapped with people with guns. This is nothing short of torture. My PTSD is lifelong and I was outside. Please don't do this to more people. Please don't sanction torture. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlotte C. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. Good morning, my name is Charlotte Casey. I'm with the San Jose Peace and Justice Center. And after hearing reports from people like Sean and individuals from Debug who have been tear gassed directly or indirectly, I'm convinced that using tear gas against an individual is a form of torture. I strongly urge you to oppose chemical weapons like tear gas in our jails. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Blair Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. Hi, Blair Beekman. Yeah, it's nice to hear public comment today on this item. Um, I, I wanted to address, you know, I wanted to thank OCLEM for the work of giving this report and for Santa Clara County Board Supervisors to want to address this issue. Um, you're wanting to address accountability in our jails, and that's so important. And then listening to public comment, it just made it very clear what we need to be addressing and, and working towards. So thank you for bringing this item today to, to, the, uh, to the board. Um, I really hope that with accountability practices, you'll simply want to, in the future, with uh, biometric camera use that's used in the jails, that you will simply want to offer uh, in the future uh, surveillance use policy reports for the biometric cam cameras that are used in jails. Uh, I don't think there's a national security threat. Uh, it should be just as part of the process as much as all the other technology in Santa Clara County. Uh, good luck to good open practices. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christine Fitzgerald. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Christine from Silicon Valley in the Pena Living Story. We're the plus one. What uh, Michelle Bashburn and uh, uh, Senator Asher have said uh, and to uh, pose the the, um, the thought, it's 2023. We are the one standout county that does not um, have a an alternative way of working with folks with mental illness, whether they're inside or outside the uh, uh, jail system. We need to do better by by folks that have mental illness. We need to uh, respect their needs and respect their humanity. Let's not approve anything to do with chemical weapons. Let's come up with alternatives and education for our guards. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, I'd like to organize our discussion such that we first discuss the use of clear out versus other force options. Second, that we discuss the impetus for the 17 cases of clear out use we're reviewing. Third, discuss any miscellaneous concerns that we hadn't covered. And finally, turn to the comprehensive military equipment use report and ordinance um, in item 10 to consider a motion on the recommended use policy or any other actions this board chooses to take. I'm also going to take uh, the president's privilege to begin the questioning for each section as it was my request that we dive into the use of clear out in cell extractions as a subset of the overall military use policy that we're being asked to approve today. Through uh, the chair. Please. Excuse the interruption, Madam Chair. Just as a process question, uh, I believe we're also being asked to simply receive the report at some point. How do you see that item being handled, if I may ask? We're being asked to receive the port in, report in item 9 and to approve or not approve the use policy in item 10. Um, I'm going to, at some point, make a, a motion just on item 9, and perhaps uh, another one of you will make the motion on item 10. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so first, with regard to um, a discussion on force options, uh, I understand that other counties do not use clear out, but do use uh, pepper spray, engage physically with people in custody, or employ other tactics. Um, I'm not sure. I think I'm directing the questions really either to... I'm going to focus on on um, OCLEM, uh, Mr. Janako, on, on directing my questions to you, but certainly happy for the, the sheriff to, to weigh in when, when you believe it's appropriate or useful. Uh, so to Mr. Janako, what were your findings as to our county's use of de-escalation and negotiation compared with other counties and the force options our county chooses to employ compared with others? Thank you for the question. The, um, as I indicated in my opening remarks, um, we certainly uh, know full well uh, every event of the uh, 16 uses of clear out in uh, Santa Clara County's jails because we were given full access to the information. And 
um, the video uh, information is extremely helpful uh, because it provides us an opportunity to put ourselves right there and watch from behind the lens of a camera or multiple cameras all that went on. Uh, I would say that, um, as I indicated in the opening remarks, um, there was a very deliberate and thoughtful approach to most of these cases. Um, when there was time to wait, uh, what we saw is a lot of waiting. And I'm talking about days and sometimes weeks. So, for example, on the ultimate uh, extraction based on a court order for forced medication, um, that's an observation of a period of time that can take days, if not weeks. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you um, because my question is about comparison to yeah. our our county and other counties. Do you have yeah. that information? Yeah. I do, um, although I'm, I'm, I'm going to be um, expressing a little frustration with other counties. One is we don't have that kind of access with other counties. So if, in fact, there's a video record of their cell extractions, we can't get it. Uh, we don't even know if there is or isn't. Um, if there are other force reports or after action reports that other counties prepare after a cell extraction, we can't get it. Um, because we're not we're not situated in a way where we have access to that information. We have had a chance to talk to people who run other jails, but that is certainly not the same uh, with regard to the level of scrutiny that we would like in order to do a fair comparison between what other jails are doing throughout the state and what is being done in Santa Clara County. Thank you. Um, so uh, ben it's very difficult. Thank you. Then, then what I'm gathering is that we, we really don't have findings that compare our county's use of de-escalation and negotiation compared to others, compared to others, or the, the force options that we use compared to others. Our um, Community Corrections and Law Enforcement Monitoring Committee, that CCLEM, uh, was particularly interested in how people in healthcare settings uh, respond to combative individuals to see if there were techniques employed in healthcare settings that could be uh, deployed in our, our jails. You did you did touch on that um, in your opening remarks. Thank you. Um, I understand that there's a method taught through prof professional assault crisis training, or also called PROACT, uh, that they use. Could you describe that method and any benefits you might see in that? Yes. Um, PROACT is a, um, it's been described to us as a relatively old school technique where when somebody, when there is a decision that somebody needs to be restrained in a hospital setting, um, what we've been advised, and again, we would want to dig deeper into this and actual, actually talk to folks who have, have done this and taught this, but we, what we have been advised is that uh, usually it's staff members at the hospital, uh, they come upon the person, everyone grabs a limb, another person has the medication, the restraints go on. These are, are soft restraints, which are not handcuffs, but they're much more difficult and much more confining on the patient once they are applied because they are then tied to a bed or a gurney and the person is essentially immobilized. Um, what we have been advised again, and uh, President Ellenberg, we want to do more here uh, but in the week or two that we've had to start digging in, we've been advised that there have been a number of injuries as a result of that technique. Um, so we're not in a position to endorse it without uh, further study. Thank you. And do you have any data on the injury rates resulting from, um, I think you may have just answered that. Uh, we really don't have um, data on the injury rates resulting from that use of force technique compared to the, the chemical agents our sheriff's office uses. So what, what I'd like is, um, and I'll make this in a, in a motion um, when we finish discussing all of item nine, um, is that we accept uh, CCLEM's recommendation and, and ask for them to come back in January with a report that evaluates alternative force options to clear out that are used specifically in acute psychiatric settings. Um, I certainly believe that, that our county, as well as others, uh, should be examined for best practices. I'm going to look now to my colleagues uh, for any additional comments or questions specifically on um, 
the the use of clear out versus other force options, and then we'll go on to the second. I, I have a question. Please. Could, could you please repeat your motion? I haven't made it yet. Oh, you haven't made it, but this is a future motion. Yes. I was okay. just previewing. Can you repeat? Yeah, yes, I, and, I, and I will restate it in the, in the full, full motion, but I'm, I would be interested in our accepting CCLEM's recommendation uh, and asking for CCLEM to come back in January with a report, with OCLEM to come back in January with a report that evaluates alternative force options to clear out that are used in, a, in acute psychiatric settings. Supervisor Chavez? Yes, thank you. Um, and I, I, um, I, I have a few questions, and if I get ahead of your framework, don't feel bad about just jumping in, President. Um, on, the, on the use of OC spray and, and the report that is in front of us, I was hoping that, Mr. Janako, could you just talk for a moment about, you started to talk a little bit about the, um, what you observed in terms of the, the being able to look at the tapes and, and the like. And what I wondered is, when you are doing that, is that something that you do um, on your own, or are you doing that in partnership with the sheriff's office? It, and the reason I'm asking the question is I'm just wondering if the way the, the um, if the rules of engagement, the way the sheriff's uh, policy is reflected is something that you saw in the, in the videos, and if you were able to verify that. Yes, uh, Supervisor Chavez, thank, thank you for the question. I, um, we were given everything we needed in order to accomplish this uh, within the county. So the Sheriff's Office uh, readily provided us with all of the video. And as I indicated, there are three um, sources of information uh, for video evidence. One is there are the fixed cameras that are already in the jail. Every one of the deputies who are involved in the um, extraction team are wearing body-worn cameras, so you have all those vantage points, as well as um, an individual specially designated to film the event and has a handheld camera to do so. We had that, we had the after-action reports, um, but really what was most helpful is the recording of all of the events, negotiations, strategies, discussion, and planning that preceded virtually all of these events. Sometimes there was exigencies, such as when a resident flooded their cells and they needed to act more quickly than they would in another situation where there's more time. But when there was more time, they took it and did what they could to try and reason, negotiate, bargain, offer extra food and favors uh, to individuals in order to get them to come out voluntarily. We saw that and we saw a lot of de-escalation uh, we think one of our recommendations is to do a better job documenting it on paper, but we did see it on video. And then if I could um, turn a question to the sheriff's uh, staff on the same um, subject. Ultimately, you know, what, ultimately in terms of when outside of the flooding cell, but when you decide that you're gonna need to use um, OC spray or, you know, as you escalate, are we responding to the needs of that client? Are we responding to the court? Are we responding to a medical professional? Could you just talk a little bit about the hierarchy of decision-making relative to that, to what prom promulgates that action? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, President Allenberg and, and esteemed members of the board. Uh, Supervisor Chavez, thank you so much for the question. I'm a Assistant Sheriff David Sepulveda, Custody Operations. Um, to answer your question, it depends on the situation at hand. So um, there's a variety of reasons why we would um, perform an extraction. Um, and then at that point, once we decide an ex extraction needs to be made, um, based on the negotiation factors and the level of decompensation of the person, their behavior, their history, um, everything is analyzed, then we determine whether or not we're going, going to use, uh, what tactics we're going, going to use. But to get to that place um, at the beginning, there's a variety of reasons. It, it could be a result of a court order for medication. Um, it could be a result uh, that the person has been deemed clinically um, gravely disabled um, and that um, further stay in their current location um, would further cause decompensation 
uh, which ultimately is a serious uh, risk of, to their health. Um, it could be um, because the person is um, harming themselves or uh, at a high risk of harming others uh, in the area. So there's a variety of reasons that uh, would, would require us to consider the extraction. Um, and it really is on a case-by-case -case basis. Hopefully I answered your question. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. I'm going to uh, note, as you requested that I do so, that that um, question specifically is our second um, uh, discussion, the need for cell extraction. So if you don't mind, I want to make sure first that we don't have any additional questions uh, from supervisors around uh, the use of, of the clear out specifically, and then we'll talk about the use the occasions on which the f this force has been used. So, and I apologize, I, I think I just inverted the um, OC spray versus the clear out. And I, 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 so I apologize for that, but perhaps I can then go to the clear out as well. Sure, on the use for that at, at all, as opposed to the circumstances under which we use any form of cell extraction. Yes. That work? Great, thank you so much. So I'm coming back to you on the use of clear out versus a, um, the OC spray. Thank you for the question, Supervisor Chavez. Um, again, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the situation at hand. Our staff are committed to using the least amount of force possible, and uh, which that means is um, we don't we don't want to escalate to impact weapons or physical force because those, those, those options generally require uh, that level of force um, in, ends in somebody getting hurt. Um, and so our options, what we look for is what's the least, uh, what's the most effective method with the least amount of harm? And so um, in these situations where there are plans use of forces, um, using, using the option of clear out generally is the most effective with the uh, least um, option of, of having any harm to the person or to the staff. And so um, before we exercise that option, we will consult with medical staff, look at the history of the person to see if there's anything that would indicate that that option would harm them, um, and then we Obviously, as, as mentioned uh, by Mr. Janako, we go through a series of negotiation steps before we introduce clear out, um, and that includes clinical staff, sometimes uh, medical doctors, registered nurses, um, the supervisor on the scene, the manager on the scene, which is a lieutenant, and then we also use our uh, multi-support deputies who are specially trained in, in CIT for de-escalation. Um, another, another group of folks that we also um, bring in is anyone who has a good rapport with the person. So anyone who's been working with the person for a long time and understands them, we'll bring that person to, to speak with them as well. So we go through all these steps before we decide we're going to uh, initiate clear out, the use of clear out. So then a follow-up um, question to that is, from some of the testimony, there there is, um, you know, what they're saying is that the spray doesn't just stay in one location. And I'm wondering, do you remove other people from the area prior to the utilization of any of these chemicals? Yes, we do. So usually the in, inmates in the adjacent cells are removed. Um, and we, we move them to another area so that they're not affected. Um, Clear out itself doesn't doesn't um, it dissipates quickly in the location it's in. It doesn't travel through the system. Um, OC is the one that would have more effect on anybody in, in adjacent cells. Why is that? Why would OC be more more? Uh, and I'm I'm reading that I, I have a, the staff report open, so I'm using that as my framework. But why would that be worse than than clear out? Because clear out's an aerosol, and it's and uh, once it's introduced, it, it starts to dissipate pretty quickly. Um, where OC spray is a, um, a liquid, comes out in liquid form, and then the the chemical stays on the clothing, 
uh, or wherever is sprayed, it you know can get on the floor, can get on the walls, um, and that as long as it's present, it's going to give off an odor for a while. So that's why it's going to um, have more of an effect on other other areas in adjacent uh, cells. And so for um, whether it's clear out or OC spray, I, I just want to understand is the there's a protocol for removing others, you know, like folks that are on, on the pod or within that um, cell area. Um, and then do we also have a process for cleanup that includes clothing, shower availability, the, um, uh, and then, you know, the, frankly, the bedding and any of that as well? That's correct. So as soon as a person um, is brought out of the cell, we immediately start the um, decan decontamination process. We um, give them a fresh change of clothes, and we will replace uh, any bedding in their cell, or blankets, um, their towel, their spare clothing, anything else, anything that's in the cell will be replaced. And is that true for adjacent cells as well? If, if the uh, folks in the adjacent cells are affected, then we would absolutely do that. Um, generally, though, um, the adjacent cells might have may, maybe get a, a whiff of it, but um, that whiff is not going to attach itself to anything within the cells. However, if the person says, "Hey, I still smell it, or I want to change the clothes," we absolutely 100% will will do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Supervisor Lee. Questions specifically on this uh, use of force? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, first of all, you mentioned that the they are supposed to move or clear the neighboring cells before deploying ERT. How many cells and how many feet are we talking about when you say you actually remove those individuals before the deployment of either, you were talking about both clear out and OC, right? They, either one of them being deployed, you would clear the cells neighboring, yes? Yes, so, so generally it's just the cell adjacent on each, if, if there's one on each side, we would remove those people. In some cases, those individuals do not want to move. They'll express the, the desire not to be moved. Um, and so we'll have, we'll, we'll have to respect their desire if that's the case. Um, because we don't want to get involved in another extraction process, right? Just, just to remove them. So what we'll do in those cases is we'll, if they stay, if they remain there, uh, then we'll have medical staff assess them after the event is over. And when you, so if you move them, do you move them to a cell on the same floor or do you move it to a different floor? We'll look for, uh, if there's an empty cell available, if not, then we'll bring them out to the, um, out onto the floor area where there's uh, rooms that we can place them in temporarily well, but while we're waiting for the extraction to be completed. Okay. Um, Right now, we have two different chemicals we talk about. There's clear out, which does have the CS, which is tear gas inside that compound, and that's why it's also listed as one of the military uh, 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 under the, the, the act. Uh, OC is one which does not have CS, and that's the liquid oily stuff that we talked about, slippery and whatnot. Um, looking the report on the various case numbers as provided by Oakland, I'm, I'm going to tell you some, some observation, I was surprised. Uh, it seems like Clear Out actually has been ineffective uh, in quite a few of these instances, instances where it did not at all affect the, the individuals. Uh, so at the end of the day, since that didn't work, the deputies still need to go in and physically uh, restrain the individual for them to comply. And then the good news, at least based on these reports, is that, well, there was minimum force shoes, use, they weren't injured, and they were able to be extracted from the space. Of course, you still need to clear it up because, after all, you just released using the, uh, the uh, clear out. Um, while the other thing I see is with the OC, it seems like that's something that actually is almost always has an effect on the vigil. Nobody seems like they could stand the OC because of the way the ingredient is. So I'm just wanting to ask that observation from you. Well, I th thank you for the question, Supervisor Lee. Um, the reality is, is either both or OC and clear out have different effects on different individuals. 
Um, and sometimes, based on the state of mind, it might have a different effect on the same individual on different occasions. So um, we, we tend to want to use the clear out first because it has a less of a lasting effect. Uh, we have no known injuries associated with clear out. Um, and it dissipates quickly, and we can decontaminate them quickly and get them, restore them back to their normal uh, state. Um, the OC, you're correct, it, it lingers because it stays on the, the person and uh, has much more of an active effect on their um, uh, nasal passage uh, and uh, watery eyes. Um, but in some cases, we see uh, individuals that will with just withstand that and continue to, to fight um, or want to fight. So um, what we're, we're doing is we're trying to escalate first at a, a level where um, we believe that there'll be less harm to the individual, and then we, we'll use the OC, and then if that's not working, we understand that we have to go in and use physical force to remove them. Um, so we look at it in that hierarchy because um, it, it, it affects the individual and the staff less to use the clear out because it, it um, dissipates so quickly. Right, so some of the instances I see is that you use the clear out first and that didn't work, either use a second bottle of clear out or you actually switch to use OC uh, and to see if that works. And it seems like with OC, that was usually would result in response. Seems like OC is something that always uh, would emit a response. No? Not, not necessarily. It, it, um, it, it is effective, but it doesn't always work. Um, and maybe in these cases, that, that's where, um, you know, after uh, un, looking at these 17 cases, maybe that's what was effective in those cases, but um, it's not a guarantee. Okay, so if these items, both clear out and OC, are not being used, what other tactic would you need to use to remove these individuals to comply to remove them from the cell, for example? So the only other tactic is to send the extraction team in and, and remove them with physical force. Um, obviously, our first steps are always the negotiation piece that was explained earlier, but when there's no other options um, and we know we have to remove the person for their own health and safety, then, then we'll go in with the team and use physical force. Okay. Um, on case study number 17, which seems to be a little different from the other ones, because many of the other ones, case studies that have shown most of the individuals have some type of a mental uh, uh, related issues, illness issues related. Case number 17 is different because they really talked about some type of assault that took place. Uh, saying to... Supervisor Lee, is yes. it, apologies for the interruption. Sure. Is all right if we just finish the the use of force and then look at the need in the different items? Um, sure, I, I could do that. Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, just want to make sure we are good on the use period of that kind of um, gas. Supervisor Arenas? Thank you. A question. Um, so I saw, uh, sorry, it just was on that page. Um, so there were 17 cases, but there was also uh, 10 additional cases um, that were reviewed um, and that had the ERT team involved, correct? So I think we are going to go then to uh, because I hear all of you want to ask about. No, the and the reason is because oh. there was a there was a uh, there's a question that related to the um, to uh, the chemical um, Great. released. Great, and, and I think we'll probably then bleed it into the that was a terrible choice of words, <laughs> um, morph toward um, the the need for cell extraction in different cases. So please go ahead. Okay, so then let me ask this question. Um, it didn't seem like the report acknowledged the impact on a pregnant uh, prisoner. Um, and I'd like to see if we can, and if whoever has the future motion, we can also take a look at what that um, physical consequence is, because one of those um, 10 additional um, cases 
there was um, there was a chemical agent used, and even though the even though the personnel knew that that prisoner was pregnant and the other one had allergies. And so I want to make sure that that's captured, even though it's one of 27, I think it's really important to acknowledge. Um, and then uh, along the lines of ventilation, um, none of the cases, and I don't know if this was um, excluded because they just, we didn't ask for it, although I think maybe we should ask for it because I heard Supervisor Chavez inquire about this, is the, um, the vacating of the nearby cells. And so none of the cases reflect that during the time where there's either negotiations happening or people getting pulled in to talk to a prisoner, um, that they, you utilize that downtime or that in-between time to actually vacate the cells. Um, nearby, so I, I wonder, first of all, um, when does that happen when you're actually in the moment doing that? Thank you for the question, Supervisor Arenas. Usually at the very end, uh, just before the extraction is going to actually take place, because the negotiation process can take several hours or sometimes, in some cases, a day or longer, um, so we won't actually move anybody until it's absolutely 100% necessary. I, I understand that. These are all absolutely 100% necessary. Otherwise, we would say this is kind of a, a default action. So um, I, I'd love to see what those nearby cellmates um, and their, mm -hmm. their impacts um, with a chemical agent um, are and if they've ever been um, recorded in some way or in a future report. Um, I'd like to see that. Um, and I know that they say that there isn't any long-term consequence, although I don't know what the, the consequence, uh, what that method of capturing that information is. Who determines that there isn't a long-term consequence? Thank you for the question, Supervisor Reynas. Um, generally, I, it would be medical staff, um, but we haven't seen any complaints or information that has come to us that has indicated there's been any long-term consequences. We are, um, though, happy to um, examine this maybe through a, a medical expert um, consultant at some point. We've been discussing that um, to, to get more information on, on the subject since um, these questions have come up. Uh, we're happy to do that. Uh, uh, to me, that would be a best practice, and so we're committed to best practices, and, and we'll look into that. I do want to point out, though, that <clears throat> this, the cells, the ventilation system in the jail, um, the airflow in, in, uh, exiting the cell goes out. Um, it doesn't go, it's not uh, circulated back into the jail system. All the air coming into the cells from the ventilation system are from the outside. And all, all the jails are built that way for a variety of reasons. Um, but um, I just want to point out that any air coming in from the ventilation system would be from the outside, not um, from within the jail. Got it. Um. Let me see. I, sorry, President Ellenberg. I'm, I'm just looking down to see if anything relates to. Okay, I think the rest of my questions have to do um, with more procedure. So thank you. Great, thank you. So let's um, go to the the, discuss, the second discussion of the need for uh, for cell extractions, um, and where I'll I'll start here is um, some specific, 
May I just add, I'm sorry to interrupt oh, you, be, but uh, could you just walk through again the rest of your framework? Absolutely. I'm sorry, I feel like we were all trying to adhere to it. And oh, I, thank I, you. I didn't mean to walk over the line, and so that clearly means I don't understand it. So Not a problem. I so appreciate through? that. So um, our first conversation has been on the f um, use of force period around what happens with the ventilation, one chemical um, versus another, impact on people um, that may be in adjacent cells. So that was specifically my intent was that that would really focus on um, the, the nature of the chemical weapons themselves. What I am uh, aiming to have us look at next is the need for cell extractions. And there may be questions, it, it sounds like there are, around some of the specific uh, cases that were examined uh, or that were reported on. Uh, the third is <laughs> essentially miscellaneous concerns, anything that, that I missed in the first two. And then the fourth will essentially move us from item nine to item 10, which is looking at the overall um, military use policy. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, let me just come back up here in my notes. Bear with me for one second now. Um, yes, thank you. So in the, in the second section of talking about any, any of the specific cases or, or, other, um, or, or other circumstances in which the extraction process has been or could be used. And, and I wanted to look at um, six of the 17 cases. Um, I, I understand, so I, I'm, I'm gonna, let me just say that more clearly. Specific issues with six of the 17 cases that I'd like to walk us through. Uh, for most of them, I understand that clear out was used to respond to situations where there was determined to be an imminent uh, risk of harm. So cases five through seven in the OCLEM report were motivated by a report from Custody Health to move an individual to the acute psychiatric unit and cases 11 and 12 were motivated by a request again from Custody Health to rehouse an individual uh, to Elmwood and a less restrictive mental health housing module. And this cluster of cases stood out to me because unlike the other cases, there was no description of an alleged imminent risk of harm that would signal an urgent need for a cell extraction. So my question is, in a, in a situation where there is an imminent risk of of harm to an individual, um, it seems that staff makes the determination that the potential risks of undertaking a cell extraction and the harm of employing clear out outweighs the risk and harm of not acting. Um, and some of OCLEM's recommendations speak to in improving the documentation on the sheriff's office and as to how the decisions are made. But in situations where a cell extraction stems from a housing move requested by Custody Health, it's unclear to me how a similar cost-benefit analysis um, could be conducted. It, it wasn't clear whether there was documentation in the housing request of the level of urgency that would allow Custody Bureau staff to assess the situation or if there was any formal feedback loop for Custody Health to be notified that after the to notify that the individual is resistant to being rehoused so that Custody Health could have the opportunity to affirm uh, that their request was indeed urgent enough for a cell extraction to be warranted. I'm gonna not make that a question um, right now. I, re I realize that it's big, but in, in instead what I, I would do is um, request that OCLEM work with Custody Health and County Council to review the custody health documentation for rehousing cases, for, re the, for the rehousing requests in cases five through seven, 11 and 12, and policy and documentation procedures that enables determination that a housing request is in fact urgent enough to warrant a cell extraction and return in January with any recommendations. Case 16, was motivated by a move to repaint the units on the floor 
Uh, and back to the standard of, of an imminent risk, um, I was concerned about the level of importance of what sounded like a routine maintenance project, although, although I do understand it was directed by the, the PLO. Um, could the Sheriff's Office on this one elaborate on the context for that, that painting project? It's case 16. Thank you for the question, President Ellenberg. Yes, so in this particular case, um, the county had already procured a um, contractor to perform um, maintenance on the housing area to, to improve the living conditions in the area. Um, and you're right, uh, the PLO had already complained that this, this was taking too long. Once the contractor was procured and ready, um, we gave the inmates in the unit a two-day notice that they would be temporarily moved um, so that we could um, perform the maintenance, which included painting and other important, important things that needed to be done in the unit. Um, all but one individual complied. Um, the one individual refused to move. We uh, initiated our negotiation process. We actually had the individual stay in the unit for a full day, 24 hours, um, by himself uh, while we continued to, to discuss and talk. Um, however, we did need to uh, get the work performed. Uh, the contractors uh, were, were ready and procured. There is a um, uh, process um, again that we go through once that that happened uh, where we um, renegotiated went through all the processes and steps and at that point it became um, a need uh, a need to move him to to perform the work so that the living conditions can be improved I, I, I'll just say for that one in particular without commenting on the rest that uh, to me, the convenience of the contractor and the work that needs to be done in in no situation should outweigh the the rights and and safety of a of a person in in custody. Um, that one really is particularly um, concerning to me and um, again, we'll go to a a, a motion of uh, for which again, I'll make <laughs> clearly, but just kind of teeing a lot of these issues up to really look at the policies and if we're going to approve this at all, how absolutely narrowly um, this can be construed. Uh, I'll look to my colleagues now for additional comments on any of the, the specific cases uh, where, where this was used. Supervisor Lee. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, about the um, pointing out that issue on case number 11 um, and 12, uh, which is interesting because it certainly was not a urgent uh, situation. And in, in that case, it was supposed to help the individual to allow them to go to a less restrictive uh, location. So basically, it's almost like rewarding to do something better, but because of the fact that they're not willing to move, they have to go through this whole um, scenario of going through ERT, getting, you know, uh, sprayed on, whether it's OC or I'll clear out here, uh, in order to move them. I mean, it, it, so I think the, these are the type of situations I think I share with you that uh, is it really necessary at that point if they, that's what they want to stay, either let them stay or um, so I'm, 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 I'm this is a question. It's, it's almost like why are we inserting that to make them go to something that's supposed to be a, a less restrictive or rewarded of a better position if that's not where they're willing to go? I, I guess as a housing question here. Thank you for the question, Vice President Lee. So the APU, or the Acute Psychiatric Unit, is specifically designed for individuals who are gravely disabled and need to be stabilized. Um, once they're stabilized, it's important that we transfer as soon as practical, transfer those individuals out, making room for other individuals who need that level of care. It's a high level of care. Um, and um, one, one important issue is that during 
their time period in there, there's therapy sessions, um, either group therapy, individual one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. things like that. And so those are important things that have to happen. Um, when we have a census in the APU that um, is just there, um, not receiving, they can distract the other individuals. Uh, we often see them distracting them uh, with their therapy and their recovery. Um, so it, it also impacts uh, the out of cell time for the others that are in the in the unit that are receiving treatment to be stabilized. So. There's a variety of factors um, that impact the clinical process for the in other individuals that are in that unit. So we try to remove those folks out as soon as possible, as soon as practical, um, to get them back into their general housing area so that they can also receive the other things that are available, uh, that are not available in the APU, like um, programs, um, tablets, uh, commissary, things like that. And the APU is very restrictive for a variety of clinical reasons. Um, and so we try to um, just reserve that specifically for those individuals who are in dire need of that housing and prevent any distractions from happening. So, um, and to have the bed space available for those who really need it. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think you just raised something new that I didn't think about is that in APU, they do not get those. Uh things, like you said, tablet programming and commissary, that might be a separate uh, question to ask in the future. Um, in terms of APUs, is that the A floor, the, the psych units we're talking about? Correct, that is 8As. Yes, 8A on the 8th floor. Right. I mean, it's almost like a circular argument that they are supposed to be stabilized, good enough to move into another area, but clearly they're not willing to leave. So it seems like they are not complying because they probably are not ready to leave. Uh, so I think it's like almost circular arguments. Like if that's the case, maybe we should just keep them there because they are not stabilized enough. Um, so I, I would love to answer that question, but I think that's probably more geared toward the psychiatry staff who made the determination on if they're stabilized or not. Um, there, are, there are some individuals we have in custody that um, may choose not to leave for a variety of other reasons, um, manipulation, mm -hmm. uh, other things, other factors, um, or someone's in the unit that they, uh, um, that they want to be near, uh, things like that. We've seen that happen. So there's a, a variety of reasons um, that they might want to stay. Um, but yeah, I would I would defer to the um, clinical staff on answering uh, that question. Thanks, and I would think non clinically staff that the the people on in the APU have to basically meet LPS uh, criteria. Thank so you. I wonder right. if they're not meeting it, and other people are that need to come in. I, out of my league there. Okay, so. Um, of those cases that we have uh, stated at the OCLEMS report, uh, how many times have we used these two chemicals at the APU as opposed to the other floors? Like <clears throat> the eighth floor for psych units only versus the other floors. Can you, can you give me some type of estimate? I'm sorry, Supervisor, I don't have that information, um, but I, we will happily get that for you. Sure. Would you say more of it has been used on the eighth floor than other floors? I, d I don't think I would say that. I think uh, it just depends on where the extraction occurs. Um, so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you that. Right. Okay. But, but obviously, eighth floor is the psych floor. So unless they have a psych issues, they will not end up in the eighth floor, right? Well, the, the, the APU is on the eighth floor. Mm -hmm. um, and in a lot of cases, in order to get somebody to the APU is when we do the extraction to get them to the APU. And that's when the chemical agents may, might be used. Right. Because they're, full, they're decompensated and they're a danger to themselves or others or all the above. Um, generally in the APU, um, they're, they're receiving services and treatment at a very high level. And so it's not, it, so we don't necessarily have as many extractions in, in there as maybe we would in other places, but I don't have those numbers. 
I mean, it, it just just to s tell you where I'm I'm leading at this point is I I find the use of this um, these chemicals on the eighth floor to be just completely inhumane, given what they're going through and whatnot. As the other floors, I'm still con trying to figure out what the need is. Uh, for example, like on K17, right? This is not a psych issue, right? This is where you have individuals fighting, right? There's some assault going on, and they are not trying to comply. They were using the 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 uh, let me read this. They yelled and were belligerent, ultimately breaking the glass in the door with their tablets. Uh, so they are getting violent using these tablets and whatnot. So they, in order to get them to comply, uh, to get handcuffed, they used clear out and then they were able to get handcuffed. So that's clearly one of those non-psych issues where this was actually used in order to get compliance. And short of which, if we don't use it in that situation, what would happen? If we don't use the... Any of the chemicals. If we don't use any chemicals, then we have to, we would have to physically restrain the person. So staff would have to go in and perform a physical extraction, um, physically restraining them, which generally leads to somebody getting hurt, whether it's the individual or the staff. And I do want to, uh, just for context of your question, um, we have eight um, special management units, which are mental health step-down units. So mm -hmm. we have eight other mental health units uh, around the facilities. It's not just the eighth floor. Correct. Now, in terms of the, uh, no, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. So let's talk about the physical force that will be used right now. What are the deputies allowed to use in terms of physical force besides the hands? What other equipment do they have without using the chemicals? No other equipment, sir. No baton, no sticks, nothing, right? No. So we, um, for, for cell extractions, um, in, in some cases, the deputies do have a baton um, for the cell extraction. It's mostly used for distraction. Um, but um, as far as other, no, there's no other weapons. And only under certain circumstances would the baton be used. So baton would be the most serious weapon or equipment that would be used at a situation like this, correct? Correct. Okay, all right, that's all I have. Thank you for now. Other questions in this section? Supervisor Rennes. Thank you. Um, so I have a question around um, I understand four of the cases that were outlined were court order medication, and this is something that's just been recently implemented in the last two years. Um, what are some of the lessons learned for those four particular cases? I'm sorry, Supervisor Reynos, which four cases are you referring to? So there are four court-ordered medications out of the 17. Oh. What are the lessons learned from those cases? Because I'm guessing that medication can be scheduled at a certain time. And when a uh, individual is outside of a cell, could after lunch, something of that sort. How, what are the lessons learned for those four court-ordered medication cases? Thank you for the question, Supervisor Arenas. Um, so generally, it isn't, or it has nothing to do with when medications can be delivered. Um, so patients that are receiving psychotropic medications do get their medication on regular intervals uh, dispensed by the nursing staff. When a court, uh, when there's a court order for medications, it's only because the person has stopped taking their medication, or is refusing to take their medication, have decompensated to the point where they become gravely disabled. At that point, then the um, uh, mental health staff, along with uh, counsel, will seek a court order, which generally takes. I think Dr. Barzeev uh, mentioned that it takes about three weeks to get that court order. Um, and in that whole process, in that time, if the person starts taking their medication and, and recompensates, then, you know, we don't need to pursue that. But in most cases, 
the person continues not to take their medication and gets to a point where they're gravely disabled, clinically gravely disabled. So that's the only time when we would um, initiate a forced medication after the court order, but after all this process has been done. So that would be roughly three weeks after. It, it could be from the point that they start the um, court-ordered medication process. Right. So my question would be, what, what, are, what are some of the mitigating um, strategies that could be used in the interim? You know this person is um, decompensating and will continue to do so. So for three weeks, that person is sitting in their cell. What, what, what is typically happening? Because I'm, I'm guessing they, they come out of their cell at one point or another. It depends on the individual. So we do um, continue to provide a high level of services to that individual out of cell time, um, time with their clinician, their therapy. Um, everything is done with the goal of getting the person to um, get back on track with taking their medication. Um, they're not just sitting, waiting, and nothing's happening. It's, there's a whole process. Um, and they're under a doctor's care. Um, they have a team, a behavioral health team that's assigned. Each, each person has a case uh, team assigned to them that works with them to get them back to where they need to be. Um, so it's not a matter of that once they stop taking their medication, we just let them sit in the cell. There's a whole process that continues uh, every day. I understand yeah. that there's a whole process that continues, but a court order is required in order for that person to get back on track. So I'm going to assume that ultimately these folks um, had to be forced out of their cell. Um, to comply with a, a medication um, order. Um, but in the meantime, I, I don't know what, and, and this is, a, this is a, a question, maybe not for, for you, Sheriff, but maybe for Custody Health, is um, I'm wondering what that breakdown um, is of, uh, of the plan for medication and um, uh, behavior management is in, in the meantime because it also impacts the way that you interact with that individual for three weeks. So th this, for, for four of these individuals, this has been, you know, this is a process of maybe a whole month or a month and a half because it takes some time for some of those individuals to begin to behave differently once they stop their medication. It's not like the second day that they miss their medication, they are now decompensating. So it, it is a period of time that there is different interactions with this individual that incrementally, I'm going to assume, are worse and worse. Um, and so I'd like to know from, from Custody Health, what is that management plan? How, how does Custody Health help support those interactions so that you know, ultimately, we don't lead to um, removal, a uh, forced removal of a cell. Um, Supervisor Dennis, I'm happy to get back um, to you with a with, with an answer to that about the process between what happens in the interim. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I know that the last time um, Dr. Day was here, I had my own concerns about custody health. Um, and how that functions. Um, and so I know that, that if one system isn't working as efficiently and as well as it can, another system will also have to compensate for it and will be impacted. Um, but I know that there's also an after action review um, and there's lessons for the Sheriff's Department also. Um, and some, some um, policies that needed to be reiterated or um, counseling reminded. Um, so I'm going to stay along the, the, the lines of when um, 
there's folks who are being impacted by medical or mental health. Um, and I think 14 of those cases were categorized that way, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So Custody Health tells the Sheriff's Department what to do, tells the deputies what to do, and there is no questioning of what that plan is. Basically, you have to comply, or what is that second opinion? Thank you for the, the question, Supervisor Arenas. Actually, so... They don't tell us what to do. They tell us, they give us the clinical order that the person needs to be moved to. Either they, the person has a court order for forced medication or the person uh, has been de deemed gravely disabled um, to the point where they need to go to the APU. Um, so they provide us that information and then we take over from there. So um, the first thing we do is ask, well, if it's a, if it's a transport to the APU, how, how um, critical is this move? Is it an immediate need? So we do an assessment to determine if it's an immediate need. You provide uh, that assessment to Custody Health? We work in tandem. We're a team. So but how does that feedback get back to Custody Health? Is that in a form of a report? And Verbal, like what does that look Generally, like? Generally, it's, it's verbal for, for that moment in time. So we'll go do an assessment, then we'll, we'll meet back with the uh, behavior health team. Um, we'll look and we'll, we'll tell them, you know, in this particular case, uh, we're gonna wait it out. We're not gonna, we're not gonna to move this person immediately. And that's, most cases is what we do. Uh, we'll wait it out as long as we can to the point where, um, because- When you say because, wait it out, what do you mean? Meaning we're gonna go through the negotiation process that we that was described earlier, where we're going to bring in clinicians, we're gonna bring in staff, uh, custody staff, and explain to the person and try to get them to cooperate a variety of ways. There, there does become a point, though, in certain circumstances where no action is not acceptable because the person may be in such poor condition that leaving them in that space would further harm them. And so um, that would be unacceptable on our part. So um, it's a variety of, of, of actions that occur once, once we're told that the person has to go to the APU um, before uh, we actually perform the extraction. So there is a constant communication between custody and custody health staff um, on all these cases. There, nothing's, no decision is made in a vacuum. Um, we're, we're definitely working tandem with them to make sure that these things need, that need to be done get done properly and in the best way. Uh, with regard to forced medication, though, once we get a forced medication order from the court, uh, we'll do our best to negotiate, but then we understand that that person needs their medication and, and, and we'll, we'll act on that quickly. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I, I'll go, I'll default to some of the recommendations that have already been made within the report that I think are, um, um, are going to potentially improve the interaction um, between uh, deputies in um, custody health and individuals in in our jails. Um, I just wonder if there is an additional way that we can have um, a second opinion on some of these assessments um, or some of the strategies that are being used or the plans that are being formulated because these these individuals are gnawing at folks who are coming in to work every day for a month and a half or two months. And so, there, you know, we are all people, we're human beings, and um, I certainly understand um, that some inappropriate behavior can get under your skin, because uh, I have a 15-year-old son. <laughs> and. Uh, 
Yes, that laugh is from somebody else who has a 15-year-old son. <laughs> um, and an eight-year-old girl who believes she's 15. So th there's, you know, there's dynamics that end up kind of maybe developing after some time. And so I think it's really important to have um, maybe a new set of eyes or a second opinion or something that allows for some, um, for some, level of neutrality. And I'm, I'm gonna go back to just us as human beings, as parents, as brothers and sisters. I had five sisters, so I think you can imagine how that went for the bathroom. Um, we are all human beings and things will get under our skin. And so I wonder if what we could do is, as part of some of these recommendations, have some of the folks who haven't been part of the leading up to and the decompensation behavior of certain individuals so that they could be some neutrality. And I'm, you know, I'm being very reductive in terms of bringing it back to myself. Obviously, my kids are not individuals in, in any kind of system. Um, and I'll default to their dad to some time when I might throw my hands up in the air and like, that's it. I don't know what else to do. Um, and certainly, you know, this is, like I said, not a perfect example, and, and I recognize it's reductive, um, but it's the only thing that I can really understand in terms of human behavior is those of us, when we live together, um, we, we sometimes get under each other's skins, and that's that is definitely an environment where people are living together every day and behaving with one another and interacting with one another, not some, and sometimes not necessarily in the most positive way, right? You're not, the, the, most people are not there under the best, for the best reasons, under the best conditions. And so I'm wondering if what we could do is have, and this will go back to custody health, is how do we help alleviate some of that buildup? Because we know it's gonna take three weeks to get back a court order and, and, and potentially a second opinion on, on the use of the uh, extraction of a cell. Um, and I, I'll default back to one, something that uh, President Ellenberg, you cited, um, they were moving somebody from a less restrictive place, and it, was ne it wasn't necessarily a bad thing, it was a good thing, but yet there was a forced extraction. Um, so uh, I, I'd love to see that be part, uh, integrated into the recommendations. And, um, and Rocio, I know that Dr. Day isn't here, so I'm gonna assume that you're gonna tell me that you're going to follow up on that. Great, okay. And th that's it, thank you. Thank you, I, I think maybe this is a good time to offer a motion on nine and then go back to my um, colleagues to, uh, to make sure that, that we're addressing everybody's uh, concerns. So, uh, so for item nine, by motion is, and it's a little bit long, um, number one, to amend authorized uses of custody bureau military equipment listed in appendix B to incorporate OCLEM's recommendations one through three, and I'll share um, what those three recommendations are. Number one, that the sheriff's office should generally prohibit the use of chemical agents on individuals who have documented medical conditions, uh, particularly that involve respiratory issues. Number two, the sheriff's office should require its emergency response teams to consider prior responses involving the same individual to learn what tactics and tools were most effective or not, weigh that information when selecting force alternatives in planned force events, and document their reasoning. And three, the sheriff's office should require that a lieutenant authorize all uses of chemical agents in cell extraction incidents. The second piece of the motion is to direct OCLEM to report back on implementation of the rest of the recommendations in six and 12 months, which I understand the sheriff's office voiced uh, during the CCLEM hearing, and they're already working on it, thank you. Number three, 
to direct OCLEM to work with the Sheriff's Office, Custody Health, and County Council to report back by January with an evaluation of alternative force options to clear out used in acute psychiatric settings that examines our own county as well as others for best practices, a review of video of adjacent cells and surrounding areas to ensure that they were evacuated and promptly de decontaminated, policy options that would limit the use of cell extractions for facility maintenance to situations where the maintenance work is an emergency, an exa and an examination uh, and recommendation, an examination of and recommendations for improvements to the policy, procedure, and documentation around custody health requests for housing when a cell extraction is involved. So essentially, I tried to pull in the OCLEM and CCLEM recommendations. And again, this is just the piece about cell extractions um, and the use of any kind of chemical, um, chemical weapon, um, not a commentary on the overall military use policy. And, and I do want to send a thank you to the CCLEM committee members for their really rigorous review and work on this item. I see the chair has joined us in chambers today and, and certainly as well as the sheriff's office for responding diligently and with full transparency to requests on this item. I'll second have some questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> So um, OCLEM actually has seven recommendations. You only have three in your motion, right? Are you interested to add any of the other recommendations at all, or any reason why you omit those? I felt that these were the most significant and impactful, but if there is an additional recommendation, I'm, I'm happy to hear it and consider adding to this motion. Sure. So uh, let me go through one by one. So recommendation four is saying that the sheriff office should explore the possibility of new technology um, that may allow for clear communication while also protecting employees from the adverse effects of chemical agents. Uh, I, go ahead. I, I, my staff is constantly helping me, so thank you very much. Sure. Um, to Auden with the quick answer, the, um, the response to why we just included three is that the others are not directly within the scope of the board. They fall under the military equipment use policy. So maybe appropriate for um, a motion on item 10 to include there. Okay, so we are dealing with that after we deal with nine. So that's something we'll deal with potentially later. Okay. That, Thank you that to helps. my team for the, Thank you for the quick lifeline. Okay. Through the chair, could could you? It's, I don't know where. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's me, Margaret. Um, I know only only women understood that one. Um, I'm wondering if you could repeat the um, the recommendations that you included. Absolutely. So first, it's to incorporate OCLEM's recommendations one through three, one through three. which I won't read again because I think that makes it more confusing. It's second, to direct OCLEM to report back on implementation of the rest of the recommendations um, in six to 12 months, which they're already working on, and three, to direct OCLEM to work with the Sheriff's Office, Custody Health, and County Council to report back by January with an evaluation of alternative force options to clear out used in uh, acute psychiatric settings that examines our county as well as others. Uh, two, a review of adjacent, uh, a review of video of adjacent cells and surrounding areas to ensure that they were in fact evacuated and de decontaminated. Uh, three, policy options that would limit the use of cell extractions for facility maintenance to situations where maintenance is actually an emergency. And finally, an examination and recommendations for improvements to the policy, procedure, and documentation around custody health requests for rehousing. Uh, when a cell extraction is involved. Uh, and I'm, I will hear you out, and then I'm happy to. I've evidently been neglecting Supervisor Simidian, who has had his light on for a while. So with my apologies, I will come right to you next. But, go, but was, was that clear are and you, helpful? Are you, uh, yes, that was, that was clear. Okay. I wasn't sure if you were allowing me to speak. But yes, absolutely. Okay, please thank, continue. Thank you. Um, if you could please add um, that um, 
behavioral um, uh, manage behavioral and, and medical management uh, planned that um, transpires between um, or that hap that's supposed to happen that level of assessment that takes place between when uh, an individual is noticed to be decompensating and then when um, the actual um, court order happens is a month and a half and so I was I was uh, told that there's a plan or I don't know if there is a plan or just an assessment that happens, but I'd like to see what that plan is, that behavioral uh, medical plan from Custody Health. Um, and Rocio acknowledged this, um, but I'd love to have it as part of the motion so that we can actually have it come back. I'm, I'm happy to do that. I just want to ask uh, Rocio, is, is this something that can be shared as a standard plan? I assume there's a there's something unique for each person that's impacted. I want to make sure that we're, we have a uh, unified understanding of what this would look There's like. There's an overall process, like a protocol that mm -hmm. is used by the psychiatrist and medical team um, that I think is shareable and I think it sort of then gets adjusted based on the needs of the, of the patient. I'm glad to incorporate that in the motion and I shall hope the seconder agrees. He's, he'll, he'll be oh, right great. back, I'm well, sure. While the seconder comes back, I'll ask Rocio, would that, um, would it, 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 I think it's great if we have it in, in the, the motion. I was going to ask if, if maybe an off agenda report would also, you know, I could take either, either one. Um, the, the other piece is the, the second opinion piece that I was discussing and, um, uh, as you review some of the recommendations that are happening, that are, um, that are being uh, suggested here, that we also take a look at, and I think it was under recommendation, the first recommendation, um, or any of them actually, when we take a look at um, when Custody Health um, asks for an extraction, is there a, or um, for that matter, um, the, the deputies, what, what is the process and can we build in a second opinion um, so that we can have a neutral party who hasn't been part of, of the decompensating behavior um, for weeks and weeks? So that would be my other piece. Is that, so again, again here, is, is that something that is already part of the the protocol process I um, I'm scrolling up to find the chart that describes the the steps in the in the um, phases of the planned UOF oh use of force uh, cell extraction um, I, I realize we don't have a neutral external third party but do we have um, it looks like we we have a variety of different people from different perspectives come in. Are you talking about somebody from I'm, outside of the system well, entirely? Well, uh, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I could leave it up to 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 okay. the staff to make that recommendation. I okay. think um, our county exec is ready to say something about the matter. What I'm just looking for is some level of neutrality as uh, the buildup of, of, of an individual's behavior yeah. is displayed over time. Um, and so, so whatever that mechanism is, I'm calling it a, you know, a second opinion, but it could be you know, whatever the staff, are, whatever sure. best practice is, whatever the professional um, staff. Um, Good, agreed. And James mm -hmm. wants to weigh in, and I'm thinking also about if, if it's an LPS conserved person, maybe their conservator is. Is one yes. too. That, that's great. Um, I was just going to make a suggestion in. that I think we can highlight that as part of the process off agenda item that comes back, and then if there's follow up that that needs to happen based on that, that can occur. But I think it would first be helpful to lay out the process and who's involved in that process, um, because I understand. I think the the question and request, which is, you know, are there multiple perspectives and touch points of folks who don't necessarily have um, the established history with the person? Obviously, that person's important, but somebody else who uh, is coming in as well. So I think 
we should first provide that process item and then follow up accordingly. Great. That, that, that would be wonderful. And I have one other question. I wonder how Oakland um, typically includes um, uh, the voices from our community. And I just want to thank the folks who are here um, and who have spoken up. Um, whatever your position may be, this, you know, uh, and I'm absolutely respectful of it. Um, the reality is that there's things that happen in our system that are not perfect, and that there's things that are really tough that are both sides of staff, whether it's medical staff or our deputies encounter. And so um, I, I recognize that there is no perfect solution. Um, and, and wouldn't it be great that if we just didn't have a jail system to begin with, um, so we wouldn't have to be dealing with this, but here we are. Um, and, uh, and I'm wondering, how do we hear from our community and integrate some of those concerns, um, and particularly Oakland, because I, I hate for us to be at this point in, in the process and folks coming in with, with some recommendations and not being part of, of their, their voices not being heard. So I wonder if we could have um, maybe uh, more inclusivity of our of the voices of our community um, in the in the reports, um, and that way they can figure out whatever mechanism hap, you know needs to happen. Thank you, Supervisor Smidian. Madam President, you have a motion on the floor. It had three parts. Yes. Some of the parts had subparts. Um, I wanted to hear the first part of the motion again, if we could please, because I heard you talking about amending and I wasn't quite sure what that meant in the context of receiving a report, which is the recommended action uh, on item number nine. The first was to amend the authorized uses of custody bureau military equipment that are listed in appendix B to incorporate recommendations one through three. And is that in respect to item number 10 rather than item nine? Number nine. And President Ellenberg, if, if I could just interject for one moment. Yes, please. So with regards to conditioning the ordinance, that should be a motion on item 10 rather than item nine to the extent you're conditioning the use of this particular equipment. Let me think this through because my intention was to have the Sheriff's Office, County Council and Custody Health work out tighter protocols and use allowances only with regard to custody health, which is under the board direction, not in the military use policy, which applies to the sheriff's office. And if I did that incorrectly, I will roll it back. I think to, to the extent that your, your motion calls for uh, an analysis of the policies or report to look at alternatives. Uh, I think that all can fit under item nine, but to the extent that you're saying in order for something to be used, certain recommendations from OCLEM need to be attached to the use of that uh, equipment in the immediate, that would need to be attached to the ordinance itself in item 10. Then I'm gonna pull that part back from my motion and if somebody wants to pick it up and put it in item 10, that's fine, but to be, and I, and I really apologize for the confusion. My, my intention really is just to focus on custody health in item nine. Thank you. So does that mean that the first of the three parts of the three part motion? It would seem so that that needs to come gone. out. Okay. Then could I ask for a repeat on the second and third parts of the motion. The 
I'm looking to make sure there's not further um, a further error on my end because number two is for the sheriff's office, but this isn't in the use policy, to require its emergency response teams to consider prior responses involving the same individual to learn what tactics and tools no. I, I'm just, I'm so sorry. Give me just a minute here. Okay, all of item one is gone. So number two is to direct OCLEM to report back on the implementation of the rest of their recommendations in six and 12 months which the sheriff's already working on. And number three is to direct OCLEM to work with the sheriff's office, custody health, and county council to report back by January with five, six things. Um, an evaluation of alternative force options to clear out used in acute psychiatric settings. Uh, a review of the video of adjacent cells and surrounding areas to ensure that they were evacuated and de decontaminated. Um, three, um, third one is policy options that would limit the use of cell extractions for facility maintenance to, to emergency situations. And finally, an examination and recommendations for improvements to the policy procedure and documentation around custody health requests for rehousing when a cell extraction is involved. Madam Chair, um, I take what I'm going to call old number two and old number three to be basically just direction to OCLAM. Correct. To whom we do have the ability to give direction. So uh, that's a, a part of what I was trying to yes. uh, hang my hat on. And uh, I wonder if you and the secondary would be willing to add to that uh, just the recommended action, which is to receive the report with that additional direction. That is far simpler, thank you, yes. Thank you, and um, uh, I look forward to supporting that motion in a moment. I do wanna say um, a couple things. I, and I also wanna clarify a couple things. I think um, for the folks here from the Sheriff's Office who are looking uh, up at the dais, I don't know if it's me, the board, or you know the larger universe, but uh, with a, you know, sort of hope that there'd be some clarity about like who's doing what with whom about what. Um, I think you can tell from the conversation we've had and the testimony we've taken, um, this is a matter of great concern to all parties, certainly me. I don't want my lack of comment to be misconstrued in that way. Um, I hearken back to the comments from Mr. Janako, OIR group, OCLEM, hour and 45 minutes ago, who I think said, um, this is the least bad of a bunch of bad um, uh, choices, and that's kind of where uh, I landed. Um, I'm looking to county council now because I think, um, colleagues, uh, I am recalling some of the struggles around these issues, which we engaged on even before there was state law. We, we knew we didn't have the authority that the state law now gives us, but we went through some of these use of force issues um, on our own initiative, you know, a couple of years back now, I think, um, and ran into a couple of hard realities. Um, one is that, a major one is, was, that, um, it's rare that I remember the code section, but I think it was section 25303 uh, of the government code um, created sort of a catch-22 for our board because it said, hey, boards of supervisors, you are not the boss of the independently elected sheriff, which the previous independently elected sheriff made a point of reminding us of from time to time. On the other hand, it said, you still have the responsibility for oversight and for budget. So here we are having some oversight conversation and having some conversation about budget to the extent that the various military equipment that is being described has to be paid for out of the budget. And so the question is, how do you resolve that tension 
between the you can't tell us what to do and yet you have responsibility for oversight and budget at the Board of Supervisors level. And here, I think, is the answer to that question. We do have the ability to say, and have said in the past, sorry, we can't fund this particular product if we don't have reason to believe that it is going to be used in the most responsible and appropriate way. So for example, and I am not going to insert myself in the county council's world, and if they want to stop me, they will. I doubt, frankly, that we have a lot of authority legally if the sheriff's department wants to push back to tell the sheriff's department how to handle extractions. That's why there's an independently elected sheriff. That doesn't keep me from having strongly held opinions on the subject, doesn't keep me from articulating them, doesn't keep our board from having opinions and articulating them, and it doesn't keep us from using OCLEM and CCLEM to look at the matter, make recommendations, and hope that we could find common ground, as I gather you all have in this particular instance, which I find somewhat encouraging. But this tension is built in. It's going to be built in. As long as 25303 is there saying, well, you can't do this, but you have to do that, we're going to be stuck. So where I am today is I'm prepared to receive the report. I thought the report was well done, frankly. Um, and I thought that that opening comment, uh, now almost two hours ago, was really the one that set the unfortunate stage, least bad of a group of bad options. Uh, and um, my hope was, and I have some encouragement, uh, frankly, from the new administration, that if we engage OCLEM, and CCLEM, and the larger community, and the board, and our professional staff, and identify ways in which the process can and should be improved, that we could articulate those, and that a sheriff who was trying to do the best with the team, a sheriff's department that was trying to do the best, would say, yeah, thank you for those suggestions, we'll make those improvements, and we would get to a better place for the people we care about which is actually the only goal here that you know, I think matters. So um, thank you for letting me weigh in with my opinion. I'm trying to help clarify a little bit uh, for you all, uh, the Sheriff's Department, what I think our appropriate role is, what I understand our limits to be. And uh, I'm sure we'll get into even more nitty gritty when we get to item 10. But for the moment, I'm happy to support the motion on the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Supervisor Chavez? Yes, thank you. Just a couple of um, issues that I wanted to raise um, to the president and to the county executive and to the sheriff. Um, I would like, as we have these discussions, to make sure that um, sitting at the dais is um, custody health, behavioral health, the courts, and anybody else who's part of the decision making. I think this today was a very difficult discussion in part because we don't have all of the participants who are responsible for the, frankly, even the triggering of the decision making relative to when a, a person um, is in need of extraction. And I, I think that if we, if we don't have discussions with all the parties, we're, and even if we don't have the power to determine under what circumstances the court can request an extraction, that mutual accountability can't rest on one part of the organization. It's, it's, to me, it's been difficult to have this conversation. And I was actually listening carefully to my colleagues' questions, and in particular, um, Supervisor Arenas, and not being able to get an answer because we, we don't have somebody here who can say, under normal circumstances, when we have an extended extraction period, here are the actions that are taken, here's how the psychiatrists are engaged, here's how the medical personnel are engaged, because none of them are here. So I, I just say, as we agendize these in the future, it would be, to me, um, inappropriate to continue to agendize discussions that are so cross-jurisdictional without all of the partners here. Um, the second thing that I want to just um, add is that I, I do think that as a product for any future discussions in addition uh, to adding that more team approach, and I'd like to ask that the maker and the seconder of the motion include that in direction for future discussions, if you're comfortable Absolutely. with that. Absolutely. 
And then the second is, I, I think the point, again, that Supervisor Arenas raised around the decision-making matrix, because I thought it was an interesting question posed to you all about, do you take direction from the medical staff? And as a matter of fact, you, you don't. Um, and you all give each other feedback, but I think that the, the lack of um, clarity under which you, you all have to operate in this venue make it very dis difficult to understand all the different partners and players that are making decisions. So I also think that, again, when this comes back to the board in, in January, that that decision-making matrix, as convoluted and confusing as it is, come back to the board for transparency for the public. Again, I want to just acknowledge the point that um, Supervisor Simidian raised about wherein we have um, direct oversight and where we have um, opportunities to give input and share influence. But if that also could be included in with the maker and the seconder of the motion's um, concurrence, I would be happy to vote for the motion. Yes. Thank you. All right. Why don't we give an additional comment on this part? Yeah, first of all, I just want to thank my colleagues. Uh, uh, very um, thoughtful comments on this. I think we actually have, if anything, uh, a concurrence of where this thing needs to go. Um, what Supervisor Stravis mentioned, where's custody health? Where's these key players today? I think is is clearly uh, a, a miss for us to, to get into more, more answers. Uh, than, sometimes I feel like we have more questions than answers before we start this uh, uh, meeting today. Um, let, let me say first, I, I just want, do want to say thank you to Mike um, Janako Oklem. Uh, CCLIM uh, members, uh, OIR, the Sheriff's Office, and those who have submitted public comments for this very important discussion today. Uh, while OIR has found the handling of these incidents to be in compliance with policy, we certainly have a very uh, important responsibility to make sure that we are still improving our service. Uh, we certainly need to make sure to be trying to be proactive, uh, understanding the needs of those who are incarcerated uh, to, to protect their health and safety, while the sheriffs also need to feel that they have the proper tools uh, and training to be able to do their job. Uh, I certainly appreciate the lengths of which the sheriff's medical staff has gone into making, uh, saying the use of these chemicals being last resort. But at the same time, we certainly need to continue to think critically about the tools we are using here today, how we're using it, and how to mitigate the harm uh, as a whole. Uh, that when I mean harm, I don't necessarily mean harm, um, uh, physical harm, but also mental and physical harms to both those who are incarcerated and those who are exposed to chemicals, which are our staff members and our own deputies that's using them or near it, or the adjacent cell, for example. So I think we are trying to get to that uh, stage by this motion uh, made by uh, uh, President uh, Ellenberg uh, that is going to look into many of these issues. But one of the issues that really troubling me is the fact that uh, when we are using these chemicals on someone who clearly has a mental health issues, that's really disturbing to me because of the fact that if you look at a mental health institution, would that mental health institution be using the same type of chemicals or do they have other means to deal with these issues? Uh, so just because of the fact that it is a, a jail setting that's being used for other purposes, having those same tools being used against those who, are, um, uh, who have mental illnesses, uh, in this case, I find that to be extremely disturbing. I just put that on the record. And that I'm hoping that the um, review that's been suggested that will coming back to us would address this issue uh, very clearly, whether that's truly necessary or there are absolutely other means in order to deal with these issues in the future. Um, the need of using any tool, all the tools available to our deputies, something that I'm very concerned about, uh, especially a lot of these issues are potentially life and death. Uh, things move very quickly can deteriorate very quickly. People are trying to harm themselves or harm others. And we certainly do not want to take away tools that would also protect the safety of our deputies working in there, as well as those who are incarcerated, those who are, who are in no, other, other uh, incarcerated individuals as well. So this balancing act is not easy. Uh, and I certainly look forward to uh, much more discussion and trying to find ways that we can improve our uh, our services, and at the end of the day, I really hope that 
uh, the need of the use of these tools is minimized, if not completely eliminated in the future. Uh, and if there are ways that we could do that, I think that's that's all we are hoping to accomplish today. And I just want to make sure that uh, our, our deputies don't feel like we are saying they're doing a bad job for uh, the use of these tools. I, we have seen on these reports many of times they have been waited for like 24 hours before this was being deployed. So certainly a lot of patience has been used and then we, we see that. Uh, but certainly I think there's still room for improvement and that's why we're here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Why don't we vote on, I, on the current motion and then I'll have a question for all of you um, about the military use equipment policy conversation. Curtis, let's vote on the current motion. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Elmer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll note um, that it is 1.30. We haven't finished with this item. We still have um, the military use equipment, and we have members of the public who are probably hoping that we will continue to um, move through this. We also have clerk's office and TV folks um, who maybe need a break at 1.30. So I'm curious to know, as, as one supervisor, I, I don't have comments on this item. If we have a lot of conversation to have, I might recommend that we do a quick break. And if not, I'm happy to move forward. Supervisor Smidian, happy to I'm, hear your opinion. I'm happy to make a motion. And um, if there are suggestions for incorporations that I have not included, I'm open to those, whether they come from someone who is prepared to vote for the final motion or not. So here is my, here is my motion. Looking at item number 10, the recommended action uh, held from August 29th is the adoption of the ordinance uh, amending sections 820-8 and 820-9 of chapter one of division 820 of the County of Santa Clara ordinance code relating to adoption of the Office of the Sheriff's Military Equipment Use Policy. Uh, and uh, I will move approval of the recommended action with, uh, if, if uh, there is agreement by the Sheriff's Department, which I'm going to ask for right now in real time, to adopt all eight of the recommendations contained in the OCLAM report at what I believe were pages 40 and 41 of that report. And if I may ask the sheriff through the, through the chair. Absolutely, Sheriff Johnson. Yeah, good, good afternoon, uh, members of the board. I really appreciate the conversa conversation. And just very briefly, I would also like to thank uh, Oakland for their analysis of item number nine. Uh, providing that feedback and those recommendations that were just mentioned. We are very much open to those recommendations, implementing those, and we'll be able to provide that feedback as requested. Um, you know, one of the things I just want to highlight for the community is I know, I know in this board as well, I know this is an important issue and there are concerns about using this type of equipment in our community and in our correctional facilities. And one of the things that has to be there, well, two things actually, is there has to be training and there has to be strict protocols and oversight. And the beauty of this county is that we have those things in place to ensure that we're using these thoughtfully, effectively, and compassionately. So I am very open to your suggestion uh, and recommendation of including those eight recommendations uh, positioned uh, in item number nine for item number 10 as well through the chair. Mm -hmm. Sheriff, I don't want to, I don't want to lawyer you uh, to death here, but open to is different than committing to. And so I just want to make sure we could do this one of two ways, either of which would be acceptable to me. I don't know if there's a second and a majority of the board, but if you wanted to say open to, because you wanted more time to look at it, then I would move that we approve this contingent on your agreement to those eight and that that agreement and implementation be confirmed by OCLEM with CCLEM uh, involved as well. 
And that would simply mean that we had taken an action that was contingent on your subsequent action as confirmed by OCLEM C. Clem. Or you can just make the commitment today uh, that it will be done. And I would say then I'm prepared to move approval as of today, but with a direction to OCLEM and C. Clem to provide off agenda report confirming uh, the fact that all eight of the recommendations have in fact been adopted. We do commit to those recommendations with the exception, if you remember, uh, recommendation number six, I believe it was, was actually directed to custody health. So I would uh, really feel much more comfortable in giving you the commitment for recommendations one through five and then uh, recommendation seven and eight. You're gonna lawyer me when I'm lawyering you. Thank you, Sheriff, <laughs> that, that works just fine. Uh, I am, I'm happy to make the motion with uh, items one through five and seven and eight as just clarified uh, as necessary preconditions and with a commitment to uh, the, from rather the Sheriff's Department and with direction to OCLEM and CCLEM to confirm uh, off agenda. Now, let me just ask Madam Chair, and thank you for the second Supervisor Chavez. Madam Chair, um, did the uh, CCLEM um, recommendations or requests get satisfactorily and fully addressed in item number nine in order to ensure that we don't lose track of their uh, concerns as we go through the process? I believe so. All right, then I think my motion stands uh, as, as is. And again, uh, I'll say gentlemen, because that's what we got today. Um, I, I hope that the motion, the second, subsequent vote if it's forthcoming, um, does not in any way convey to you a lack of concern on my part or on the part of the board and the community about this larger set of issues that has been raised. Quite the opposite, thank you. Supervisor Arenas. Uh, thank you, I uh, appreciate the motion on the floor and, um, and, being, and having that be contingent on those rec recommendations being followed. Uh, whether it's through the sheriff or custody health. So I appreciate that, um, Supervisor Simidian. As um, we all know, uh, who is in our systems are uh, brown and black men or women. And, um, and so I, I need to make sure that, uh, first of all, our systems um, that prevent uh, our brown and black communities from entering um, the justice system help prevent, right? That's our role. Um, and then once that happens and they happen to be in your system that they are um, respected and honored and, um, and treated compassionately. And I heard that from you, uh, Sheriff. And so I will um, continue to um, reconnect with you to maintain that level of commitment to our community. As you know, it's absolutely important. Um, there's been structural racism built into our systems for, for many, many, many years um, that there's going, and that there needs to be a lot of work done by both you and the Board of Supervisors to undo some of that structural racis racism so that we can be at parity with the rest of the residents here in Santa Clara County. And so I will um, uh, support the, the, the motion on the floor and, um, um, and just wanted to make sure I hold those comments and, and um, look to you, Sheriff, for your um, continued commitment. Um, and, uh, and I look forward to, to seeing what those recommendations and the, that feedback looks like. Is, will that be in a report Supervisor Smidian, how? Thank how you for the reminder. Uh, if I may just yes. um, add, uh, I think I, I, I missed my opportunity uh, when I was reminded, or we were reminded about custody health to add to the motion if the seconder is amenable direction to the county executive to uh, implement recommendation number six, which is about the custody health after action reviews and to uh, ask that or direct that uh, I think we get, and uh, I'll look to County Council on this one, an annual report 
at the end of a end of a year. Yes. Um, so I, I would simply, uh, and the annual report is provided by whom, if I may ask, Mr. Ryan, through the chair. By the sheriff's office. Then I think uh, I would. Uh, di can't direct, I would exhort uh, in the motion uh, the, um, a very detailed annual report uh, and direct OCLEM to uh, provide analysis on uh, whether or not we are um, following best practices as they may emerge during the coming year. In other words, I think one of the things we're, we're struggling with today is that we're we're in a different time and place, and we're learning some things as we go, and I just want to make sure that the report we get at the end of the year comments on whether or not the recommendations have kept pace with emerging best practices, and uh, so I will request that of the Sheriff's Department in the motion if the seconder is amenable, and direct OCLEM to comment on that as well as part of the annual report process. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez, then, great, then uh, Lee. Oh, Supervisor Lee. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, to make a motion, I do have a friendly amendment to ask, uh, and that is to ask the Sheriff's Office to look into those AR-15 that was proposed to be purchasing, which is up to 185, uh, to replace the older model of the same weapon. Uh, my understanding is that, uh, you know, when it comes to weaponry, the fact that they're old does not necessarily mean they were uh, off commission or bad. I think there might be ones in worse shape and there's some in better shape. So I'm just going to ask uh, uh, as a friendly amendment to see if they could actually take a look of some of the ones they're turning in. If they turn out to be in fairly good shape, it's not really need to replace. Don't replace them just because they're old. Uh, if that's, that's something that's amenable uh, to the maker and, and maybe Mr. Sheriff could uh, chime in on that the request. Uh, colleagues through the chair and sheriff, um, I would be happy to incorporate a, an amendment with the consent of the seconder that uh, directed uh, or that uh, at requested a, um, a review of that particular weaponry with an off agenda report back from the sheriff's department once they have done the review and reached a conclusion. But that would not change the actual authorization that is contained in today's um, motion. Good afternoon, board. Uh, we certainly can provide that off-agenda report. Um, we'll re-look at the, the, um, the inventory and ex let you know exactly what's needed. A lot of them are over 20 years old, mm -hmm. and obviously we do not use them uh, very frequently, if at all. In, in use, but they are used in training quite frequently. So we'll be happy to report that back. Thank you. And that's comfortable with the seconder. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to the sheriff's office, to OCLEM, to CCLEM, uh, to our county council, to Rocio representing. Uh, Custody Health today. I, I'm so grateful for the thoughtfulness uh, of this conversation, um, for the new tone and relationship that we have um, under the leadership of, of Sheriff Johnson, um, and, and also grateful for the, the law that really requires this kind of transparency and provides the, the groundwork for this conversation to uh, Supervisor Simidian's point, not that we couldn't have had it without, but it ensures that we do and that the public um, is aware. Uh, with absolutely all of that, I'm, I'm still going to explain in advance of the vote that, that philosophically, as one individual, I cannot get myself to an approval of the use of military equipment, weapons of war, to people in our custody, um, period. And, and I don't want you to think that there's something else that you could have or should have done um, to get me there. Um, I, I can't get there, but I can, will continue to work with all of you to ensure that we are um, implementing policies and practices that minimize trauma um, to people for whom we are responsible. Um, I will continue to work um, toward 
further expanded alternatives to incarceration whenever it is uh, safe to do so, and hope that you will continue to view me um, as, as a partner and willing to, uh, to continue to learn and move us in the direction of real reform. So thank you all. Curtis, let's vote. Uh, excuse me, I didn't catch a second on this motion. Second by Chavez. Thank you. Supervisor Arenas. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Yes. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Ellenberg. Abstain. All motion right. Um, with that, it is 144. We are going to um, take a recess until 215. Thank you, everybody. Oh, he's right.
All right, it is 2.15 and we are back. Welcome, Jess. Um, Thank please you. Please do a roll call to establish the continued presence of a quorum. Supervisor Arenas? Here. Supervisor Chavez? Here. Supervisor Simidian? Here. Vice President Lee? Present. President Ellenberg? I'm here. Thank you, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Item 11 is the De Anza West Valley Clinic Feasibility Study. And we have Paul Lorenz and Jeff Draper. I was making sure I couldn't see that far. So good afternoon, President Ellenberg, members of the board. Paul Lorenz, Chief Executive Officer for Santa Clara Valley Healthcare. And joining me is Jeff Draper from uh, Facilities. Uh, so in this uh, report back, you have a feasibility study regarding the De Anza Clinic or the Valley Health Center on the De Anza campus. Um, in the report, it provides for an estimate of cost associated with the project as well as a summary of the services that would be provided on the campus. And again, those services include primary care, uh, primary care behavioral services, as well as the supported uh, functions such as laboratory and imaging services. Uh, with that being said, I think uh, Mr. Draper and I uh, can take questions. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. you. Um, let me begin by saying thank you again to Supervisor Lee for being the co-sponsor uh, of this event, and Mr. Lorenz and Mr. Draper, thank you both for making progress to date. Um, they're uh, cast in a shadow, but I think at the rear of the chambers I see both uh, the new chancellor for uh, Foothill De Anza and the board president for Foothill De Anza. And Madam President, if it wouldn't bend protocol, I, I wonder if we could ask them to come down, take a seat, and maybe engage them in real time and make a little progress here. I know uh, they can't speak without action of their board, and certainly I can't speak without action of our board, but I just think there are some uh, issues that we might address sooner rather than later. And uh, Doug here will. Is that agreeable? I'm, since I've kind of done it, I apologize, <laughs> Madam Chair. I just kind of waved them down. Indeed. Thank you. Um, I, uh, let me say thank you. Um, let me say welcome again to uh, the new chancellor. I'll let the chancellor and the president introduce themselves uh, once they get a seat and get a microphone that works. Um, but uh, for those of you who don't know, our, our new chancellor is literally here, what's it been now? Two months? And uh, on this particular project, colleagues, when I spoke to uh, Board President uh, Ahrens, uh, I said, you know, I, I really think it's gonna be important that the new chancellor be engaged. And uh, he said, absolutely. You probably ought to give him a you know, decent opportunity to get himself settled in. And so 36 hours after he arrived, I was on the phone uh, with the new chancellor saying, can we talk? So could we let them introduce themselves? And then I'll have some questions for our team and for them as well, if they're in a position to respond. Thank Do you so go ahead and introduce yourself, Mr. Ahrens. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madam President. Uh, Patrick Ahrens, the president of the Foothill De Anza Community College Board of Trustees. I'm really excited about this potential referral and to be here supporting this project today. Madam President, uh, member, uh, other supervisors of the board, uh, I'm so excited to be here. I'm Lee Lambert. I'm the chancellor of uh, the Foothill De Anza District. And this is a very, very exciting project and a much needed one to provide services not only to our students and faculty and staff, but more importantly to the, to the residents of Santa Clara County and, and the surrounding community of, of De Anza College. Good to meet you, President Lambert. Thank you both for being here and thank you for accommodating our somewhat unpredictable schedule today. Uh, Mr. Draper and Mr. Lorenz, let me just ask, um, there was some back and forth about the site, the location, when uh, we had last had a chance to have some conversation about this at Health and Hospitals. Do I gather that as of today, there is at least general tentative agreement on the proper location on the foot, on, excuse me, on the De Anza campus uh, for the project? Uh, yes, Supervisor Smitty and, and the board, there, they, there's general agreement as to where this is, it's going to be. Great, thank you. And the other issue that's been floating around, and it's not a small one, uh, colleagues, and uh, again, I want to thank Chancellor Lambert for being available literally his second day on the job to have this uh, conversation, is there's, uh, in the feasibility analysis, there's discussion of the fact that um, uh, replacement parking and additional parking 
could be as much as a twenty twenty five million dollar add on uh, you know adding forty fifty percent to the cost of the project frankly um, and that that gave me pause because um, it has been my impression, and I'm not there on the ground, that in fact um, there is more than enough parking, and I use that term almost in its literal sense, more than enough parking uh, for the demand that exists at De Anza, particularly given uh, the declining enrollment, which is not unique to De Anza, it's a statewide phenomenon, and particularly given some of the redesign of the campus as the Flint Center is um, gone, uh, and particularly given the move towards hybrid uh, learning, which uh, kudos to Foothill De Anza for being a leader in that world. Um, so uh, I understand uh, from my days at the state that there are a lot of rules that sometimes get sent down from up above, uh, but I also understand there are usually ways to say, mm, can we get a waiver on that one, please? And so I wanna ask, where do we stand on this issue of parking? Because as I try to move our organization here at the county towards um, uh, completing this project, and, and everybody's been marvelously supportive so far, you, you know, I think if we could take that, what I consider probably unnecessary parking, I understand faculty needs, I understand student needs, I understand staff needs, but where is that one? I'll stop talking and let you answer the question. We obviously haven't entered into the final negotiations for the, the site, so to speak, and, and in terms of uh, developing the final scope of the project, so it's still a discussion to be had. And through the chair, if I may, could we turn to representatives of Foothill De Anza Community College District and see what their thinking is about how we might address this challenge? Certainly, thank you, Supervisor. I'll just say, uh, and I'll let our Chancellor chime in, anecdotally speaking, when I was a student at De Anza, we had 10,000 more students on campus than we do today. Uh, that not accounting for COVID, it's just the, the attrition rates, the decline in uh, the birth rates, the um, lack of affordable housing in the area. We had um, a much larger student population on campus, but um, that's definitely something that we're very open to either having or not having, and I'll let uh, Chancellor Lambert finish. So Supervisor Sumitian, uh, so this issue is bound up into a larger set of uh, uh, issues as you noted earlier. So if you look at the trends around higher education, it's actually moving away from just a place-bound uh, component of one's uh, learning experience. So the question for us is what's that delicate balance around that? But I think what we're gonna see is, it, is this continued decline around people just wanting to be there face to face. So that's one piece. And I think the other thing is redistributing people throughout the campus will be another facet for us. So what you're gonna see us do is take a closer look at the parking patterns. Um, having my team uh, take a closer look, especially since we'll start the new term uh, next week and follow that flow for the next month or so. And then we'll be in a better position to have these more, uh, uh, more precise conversations, if you will. Uh, but I, at this point, I, I, I'm very open to you know, rethinking that whole parking component of, of the project. Supervisor Smitty, let me just want to be clear um, here. I'm, I'm happy to have them come up to each make a statement, but I want to make sure that we are not engaging in an extended um, back and forth as part of the, the presentation today for this specific item. Actually, I want to engage in an extended back and forth, Madam Chair, if you will uh, give me that courtesy, because um, I think looking at Mr. Draper and Mr. Lorenz, um, they have um, struggled with <coughs> changing leadership. It's not anybody's fault. I mean, we just, we literally had a chancellor who was on her way out the door, a new chancellor who had not yet arrived, a mid-level manager and I, uh, uh, who had uh, facilities responsibility who I believe is either now retired or is close to retirement or maybe retiring or is late in her career and has not yet had an opportunity, forgive me, to weigh uh, the pros and cons on a larger scale in the campus. So if we could, and the other challenge, Mr. Draper, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I think the two teams were getting together, what is it, once a month to talk these issues through? That's correct. Yeah, if there's something that has a sense of urgency, and you know, I would hope that this does, um, then 
you know, my definition of urgency is at least once a week. Uh, your definition might be split the difference and have meetings a couple times a month. And yes, while it's probably not the norm that I sit here and try and negotiate this in a real time meeting, Madam President, if we can use this opportunity to get a little bit more um, engagement on both sides a little bit more quickly, then that's tens of thousands of people who would have access to health care who otherwise don't have it sooner rather than later, and I think that's a good use of the time. I have only one other request other than uh, to say happy to move to receive the report with direction to our staff to um, pursue any and all avenues that would permit us to avoid construction of unnecessary parking consistent with the mission of the campus. <laughs> Number two, to please try and move more quickly by virtue of meeting more regularly, and I believe there's agreement on the part of the college district to do that. And number three, to call out with greater specificity and more deliberateness um, the role of mental health services, which I think are perhaps to be inferred from the family practice identified in the document, but which are not called out specifically and which I think um, is an important component of what we hope to create. So let me respond, thank you. Um, I appreciate the the urgency with you, with which you want to move this forward, and certainly it would be appropriate to pull all of these folks together um, for for a meeting to move ahead, as you suggest. I, I will note that it is not necessarily um, part of the business of the board to do it here, and would request that in the future, even a a heads up to let to let me know. Um, in terms of planning meeting time, it was it was an unanticipated um, form of discussion. So I appreciate that you very much want to get this done quickly. I will certainly not cut it off today, but want to note that I, I do believe that meetings like this need to happen, need to happen with urgency, but not necessarily in the context of a Board of Supervisors meeting. Thank you. If I can I'll get a second, we can move quickly, Madam Chair. <laughs> I'll make a second, and I have a quick comment just to slow it all the way down. Um, I just so, first of all, I think this is very exciting. I want to reiterate, um, parking will kill our community. I'm looking at those costs, and it doesn't really make sense. But one thing I would love to make sure, I, I, I believe was already incorporated in a previous discussion, is just to take a look at how, the, how child care um, access is also available on the campus. Uh, and, and if there would ever be an opportunity to rebuild uh, child care that, that again could suit both our employees and the De Anza employees and staff, I, I just want to make sure that we're, the folks who are working on our child care work uh, through Sarah Duffy at least get included in the discussions. Thank you. Supervisor Arenas. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, and I'm not going to try to open up a discussion. I just know that that at a um, community college level, there's a lot of folks who um, can't afford to access um, a health care system on their own, or they've aged out. And so I, I see the point in in bringing, <clears throat> excuse me, in bringing um, health services to the community and to especially to a younger generation. But I'm concerned about that comment. Um, and so maybe in the next um, uh, report, we can um, have um, a summary of the, the student population on campus, because I did hear you say that, President Ahrens, that there is a lower student population on site. And so I just want to make sure, um, and you probably have already done all this in terms of analysis. I'm new obviously and so i'm just trying to catch up and so part of what i would like to see is um and my request is that we see all this analysis presented um that has happened or tra probably transpired through your original request um supervisor submitting and i just like to see it back all in one place um and that way i can appreciate the the project a little bit more thank you Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you. Um, 
the issue I have is regarding the mental health services uh, to be provided. I believe uh, there will be mental health services uh, provided on site. Uh, and also, in addition to services itself, I think it will be important to also be able to provide the training uh, for students and others uh, using the site for, for that. Am I correct? I think that our, both teams are still in negotiation on that, but I, I think our district would be happy to in, include any mental health services to further support our county residents. Absolutely. As we know, this is one of our most desperately needed workforce right now. Uh, and the second thing I want to mention, there is some discussion about the solar replacement to uh, keep this as green as possible. Uh, I would just like to urge to see if you could look into having this built at least leaks over or higher. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Supervisor Smidian. Um, I would just uh, incorporate all three requests as part of future feasibility analysis. I do want to underscore, um, with the consent of the seconder again then, um, the child care facilities mm -hmm. might best be provided elsewhere on the campus because then the building standards don't get caught up in all the OSHPOD, HKI, whatever we call it uh, these days. Um, I think we will be pleased to see the diversity of the student population that De Anza serves. We, one of the other changes that uh, uh, President Aarons might have mentioned is that what used to be sort of not only place-based but sort of boundary-limited enrollment has really now become a resource for the entire county uh, and um, that's going to be reflected in their population, I feel almost sure. And uh, obviously, to the extent that we can uh, do all this in the greenest possible way, we want to. So whatever you can bring back. And, and I can't resist, Madam President, every dollar we save on parking we don't have to produce is a dollar we can invest in a greener building. So with that, I'll ask for an aye vote. Thank you. Do we have public speakers on this item? I have no requests in chambers or on Zoom. Let's vote. Supervisor Arenas? <laughs> yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries 5-0. Thank you very much. Uh, returning to Supervisor Simidian for a referral on a wireless service backup power. Let me just say thank you to all parties as they uh, make their way out of the chambers. And then that takes us to item number 12. Uh, colleagues, um, I think this is mostly self-explanatory. Uh, so. Uh, in layperson's language, what I would say is um, in a moment of emergency, people need to be able to communicate. They can't communicate uh, in many instances when the power is gone. Uh, we believe that the uh, state's Public Utility Commission has issued a directive that should ensure adequate backup power for communication systems for at least three days, which in my view is a minimum. Uh, in fact, the experience on the ground, not just as reported by constituents, but by our own staff and observations and uh, working with local legislators, suggests that uh, if that's what's supposed to be happening, it isn't really. So uh, move the recommended action as contained in item 12, packet page 322, and uh, in the hopes that by working with others, we can uh, keep folks safe, particularly in these tier two and tier three high fire threat districts, which run through, I think, at least three or four of our districts, colleagues. All of them. Second. Second. Public speakers on this item. I, d I didn't catch if Chavez or Lee got the second on that one. Chavez. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to second it. Great. Thank you very Sorry, much. Sorry, I didn't want to leave you we there. We were a second away from rock, scissors, paper. Yeah, there you go. Quick fire. Uh, I have no request to speak in chambers or on Zoom. President Ellenberg, if I may. Please. Uh, <clears throat> Supervisor Smitty, I just want to clarify that the reference to county council bringing recommendations into closed session refers only to bringing recommendations that need to bring be, be brought in closed session and closed session and be brought in either open session or closed session as appropriate. Yes, and in fact, thank you for the prompt because it allows me to say, obviously, anything that can be an open session, I would prefer be an open session because I think the public has an obvious and vested interest in um, what's happening or not happening, as the case may be. And with the consent of the seconder, uh, I meant to uh, add to the requested action uh, a review of roads and airports uh, uh, processes on encroachment permits 
uh, because I am told that one of the, some might call them explanations, some might call them excuses for not moving expeditiously, is that people need to get uh, encroachment permits, they say, to get to the devices that they need to back up, and we need to make sure that we are not, in fact, an impediment to getting that work done. So the, uh, in addition to the planning referral piece, uh, we would also re review uh, at air roads and airports the encroachment permit process with the consent of the seconder. Yes. Thank you. Call the question. Supervisor Reynas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. Pres Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries 5-0. Item 13, um, again to Supervisor Simidian, this time with Supervisor Chavez for a referral on an all-inclusive playground matching grant program. Thank you, Madam Chair and colleagues. Uh, to give credit where credit is due, uh, and I think Supervisor Chavez will recall back in the day when the folks at Rotary Play Garden were uh, doing their good work and coming up just a little bit short, it was our colleague, Supervisor Yeager, I think, who came to us and said, could the county step up and put just a little bit in the way of resources into the mix? Um, and we agreed unanimously to do that. Then uh, a similar occurrence uh, in uh, Palo Alto with the Magical Bridge playground there in Mitchell Park. And uh, again, a modest contribution. I think it was I don't know, $150,000 or so. What was fascinating to then watch and gratifying in many ways was that um, folks came not just from all over the county, not just from all over the Bay Area, but literally all over the state, the nation, and the world to uh, experience these two all-inclusive playgrounds. And so what we realized is we could play a role, an important role here at the county in serving as a catalyst to grow the movement, for lack of a better uh, way to put it, and also very directly provide more in the way of uh, opportunities for our families to access all-inclusive playgrounds that really were uh, appropriate for folks of all abilities, disabilities, and ages. Um, we have uh, done that with uh, two rounds. The first round proved so successful in 2017 that we uh, followed it up uh, almost immediately in 2018 with a second round. Uh, time has passed. I think there are now 24 projects that are either underway. Some of them are actually completed uh, and uh, being enjoyed today. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, clear indication is that if we had one more round of these grants uh, at the same level, uh, there would be takers and we would continue to grow the movement. And the movement is growing. I, I am, uh, by virtue of the fact that I once represented a piece of Santa Cruz County, I'm on an awful lot of Santa Cruz County lists, and they're all excited about their all-inclusive playground effort in Santa Cruz County. So the movement is growing, uh, and um, uh, I appreciate the fact that Senator Chavez has been a partner all along the way in this, so let me say thank you again. Uh, I will move approval of the recommended action and ask for a second from my colleague, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, I'm happy to second it. And one um, additional request that just popped into my head is that it would be great to get an update from staff about where all these projects are in development, just so the, the board has an opportunity to see the totality of the outcome of this really important investment. Happy to incorporate that as direction to staff. All right, uh, Supervisor Arenas, then Lee. Um, thank you. Um, as the mom of a, of a very premature baby um, and who've received services from early start, um, I had to look for my own um, uh, after he aged out from early start because it goes up to three years. And then the school, of course, wouldn't pick it up. So um, that's one of the reasons I became a school board member um, to pick up that fight for um, not only my child but others like him. Um, and so I, I really appreciate um, the the referral um, we I've seen it on the other side come through, um, and uh, I see how how our um, our city of San Jose has, is better because of it. I myself had to go to Jamboree. <laughs> it doesn't exist anymore, but I went to Jamboree in order for my son to continue to um, enhance his movements, his gross motor and fine motor skills, but. Um, that's a thing of the past now, so we rely really on a lot of our public um, 
equipment to to be able to do that um, well a lot of a lot of folks who don't have uh, the resources and so one of the things I was thinking about was an equity analysis and I don't know if one has been done in the original or second round but I'd love to see if we could get that integrated into this um, as you heard earlier there were um, a lot of parents who called in from parents helping parents and who represented the um, the immigrant disability community and how um, left out they felt in terms of um, representation. I, I'd like for us to make sure that we keep those um, communities in mind and that when we choose uh, to offer these kinds of public playgrounds that they're in places where there will be um, maximum um, enrichment um, because the folks really, really need them. And so I'm, I'm happy to support. Um, I just like I said, I'd love to see an equity analysis done on um, on future projects. Supervisor Lee. <clears throat> and so I'm, oh, I'm, sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm asking if you would accept that. Nodding and smiling and saying yes with the consent of my seconder. Uh, absolutely. Love the smile. Well, first, I want to thank <clears throat> Supervisors Minnie and Chavez for introducing this uh, really uh, impactful referral. Uh, so after uh, reading this, we researched and currently found out we have five all-inclusive <clears throat> playgrounds in our own District 3 uh, due to the previous rounds of a county's all-inclusive playground grant. And I'm very excited about the potential of bringing back this program, having more of these playgrounds built uh, in our county. Playgrounds are inclusive to children with physical and cognitive disabilities and allow for play among all children are really essential. It is not enough for playgrounds to simply be accessible to children with disabilities. They should be inclusive so that all children receive the same opportunities to have fun together and do not have to be sidelined just to a few activities. Also, play is the key to a so child's socialization and allows them to develop social skills learn problem-solving skills, and learn to manage their emotions, among other things. Playgrounds are safe environments where this socialization can happen. So therefore, I'm extremely happy to support this referral and I'm hopeful for the potential of more inclusive playgrounds throughout our county uh, with the lens of inclusion as being mentioned earlier by my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. I will um, add what is potentially an unpopular uh, opinion here, but I, I am so grateful for the, the, the investments that the county has made, $20 million uh, already, plus the Rotary Playground um, support, and, and it was very exciting. I wasn't on the board then, but was a part of the development of the Rotary Play Garden. Um, I hope I don't need to emphasize what a strong supporter I am of inclusion, and, and not only for children, but for older adults who should be able to access uh, this as well. Older adults are um, uh, frequent users of, um, if not the swings and slides in playgrounds, of the, the pathways and the open space and the picnic areas. My concern today is where the funding will come from specifically and um, my hesitancy about approving $10 million a month before we go to um, what may be very tough budget discussions and frankly how our employees may view um, this allocation of, of $10 million in, in funds for additional playgrounds. So, and I do see um, very strong support by, by four of you. I certainly won't stand in the way. I would like to request that the report back include uh, funding alternatives and options. And, and I would say up front that I, I would have significant concerns if, um, if we're looking at a general fund allocation in this particular economy and and budget season um, around something as wonderful and exciting as inclusive playgrounds. Two. Supervisor Smidian, did you want to? Two quick, just two quick observations. One is the uh, recommended action specifically uh, uh, directs administration to report to the board with options. 
So that means that we're doing, I think, exactly what it is you just asked that Thank we would do. Thank you for clarifying. It's already been um, there, And the second uh, point I would make is, um, and I think this has been one of the <clears throat> both tangible and intangible, so I guess I th one of is probably the wrong way to say it. I think there have been both tangible and intangible benefits of doing this uh, program the way we have done it thus far in that um, we have leveraged dramatically more than the amount of money we have put on the table. Mm -hmm. um, and so with a one-time only grant, admittedly this would be the third one-time only grant, but with a one-time only grant, which doesn't have ongoing annual budget consequences, we then leverage dramatically more in the way of additional funding from school districts, from cities, from nonprofits, from philanthropy, and so whenever we can um, avoid an ongoing commitment and leverage literally tens of millions of dollars more. I think that's something that makes sense uh, financially. But again, I want to underscore for anyone who shared your concern, uh, Madam President, that the word there is uh, report to the board with options to allocate 10 million. And I look forward to hearing the um, best thinking of our county staff when the time comes. Thank you so much, and certainly uh, leverage is always music to my ears, but regardless of how brilliantly we leverage the dollars, it's still, uh, it's still $10 million, so I will be very interested in, in what, are, what the funding options are. Should we go to public comment, or did you have something else, Supervisor? Oh, Supervisor Arenas? Actually, I was just going to comment on what you were just saying now, and I, um, I appreciate your, your perspective. I know that it's really hard for us to um, look at our employees and say we don't have certain funding when we're negotiating or um, or our community, we don't have enough library hours, we don't have enough this and that, um, but yet we prioritize in, in this manner. And I know that I've committed to, to making sure that we're strategic in, in what we do and so, um, uh, because I'm so passionate about this, I love this idea, but I'm also going to um, stay open to um, the report that comes back. And based on, on what um, staff tells us, um, then we can make that decision because it doesn't sound like it's, um, uh, we're going to look at some options um, as it returns. So thank you for, for that reminder, I appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, public speakers, please. Yes, we currently have two requests in chambers and five requests on Zoom. Six. <laughs> for a total That's great. of this eight. This is the time for it to, to grow. A reminder, if you are in chambers and planning to speak, now's the time to have your yellow card in. The queue will close when the first person begins speaking. And for those of you who are on Zoom, the Zoom queue will close when the first Zoom speaker begins speaking. Let's begin with, uh, how many did you say total? Sorry. Total, total of eight. Total of eight, so that is two minutes, two minutes, please. Thank you, our speakers in chambers will be Michelle Mashburn, followed by Paul Soto. Michelle Mashburn, are you present? Paul Soto, are you present? And we will move to speakers on Zoom. Our first speaker will be Christine Fitzgerald. Uh, you. We're opening your microphone. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. So uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Sumidian and Chavez, for supporting this process. As a former kid with a disability, I can certainly appreciate the accessibility, uh, availability for kids and parents. Let's face it, there are parents with disabilities that should be able to access this too. Silicon Valley Independent Living Center has long supported the ability of everybody to be uh, fully included in all aspects of life, and certainly on playgrounds with other children, with other parents, really adds to the ability of everybody to be together and be involved in um, the same area and same action. I look forward to visiting. Um, the new uh, uh, playgrounds. As a uh, former um, member of the, the San Jose Human Services Commission, I did help um, support uh, the process of, of uh, 
the growth of, of uh, inclusive playground, playgrounds. So I really look forward to the county really uh, upping the ante. Again, it's a third time around. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Our next speaker is Beverly Wong. You'll have two minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you for uh, allowing me the chance to speak. My name is Beverly Wong and I'm speaking on behalf of Parents Helping Parents in San Jose. We serve 6,000 families of children with disabilities each year. And I'm speaking in support of this referral to allocate $10 million for the development of the all-inclusive playgrounds, tracks, arenas, and courts in the county. We have over 32,000 children with disabilities in our county. And just as any other child, they have a need and desire to play and participate in the social fabric of the community. All-inclusive playgrounds provide a safe and accessible space for children to play and they serve as a cornerstone for community building and inclusivity. So this all-inclusive playground grant program has already demonstrated significant success and the demand for such playgrounds continue, continues to exceed the supply and we need this additional funding to meet this need. So I strongly urge you to vote in favor of this referral, which will contribute to the county's ongoing efforts to expand access for people with disabilities and also align with the mission of the Office of Disability Affairs. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Sandra Asher. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, I'm Sandra Asher, District 5 resident, parent of a child with disabilities and a disability rights advocate. I'm here to uh, express my support for the referral put forward by Supervisors Chavez and Samidian, um, and also want to thank Supervisor Arenas for adding uh, a request for an equity analysis. There are approximately 32,000 children with disabilities in our county, as Beverly mentioned, and these kids deserve equal access to the recreation, development, and community connection that often takes place on our playgrounds. In addition, as Christine mentioned, parents, guardians, and the elderly also can benefit from these spaces. So therefore, it's essential that the equipment and facilities create an inclusive play space, addressing the needs of individuals with physical, cognitive, communicative, social, emotional, and sensory disabilities. These playgrounds can create wonderful opportunities to raise awareness and connection between people with disabilities and the communities where they reside. Furthermore, I challenge the county to continue to push for more innovative solutions that serve all community members and advance equity for those with disability and their families. Since cost-saving measures often conflict with accessibility elements and inclusivity, even when the overall structure is ADA compliant, it's imperative that these elements of accessible and inclusive design are upheld when granting uh, these funds. And then finally, this grant program needs to be overseen by a committee of people with disabilities and their families to ensure that the designs are truly inclusive and serve the demographics intended. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michelle M. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Michelle Mashburn. Um, I support this referral uh, with the caveats of having the determination of funds be approved by a committee of people with disabilities, as well as the equity screen that Supervisor Arenas actually pointed out being essential to ensure these services are meeting the needs of those most impacted and most at risk. I would ask also that the all-inclusive track arenas and courts is, is, is factored into this proposal and this referral so that we're looking not just for solutions for children or people with disabilities that are in their childhood stages, but also adults with disabilities that want to swing but need adaptive equipment to do so. Seniors with Alzheimer's and other issues, health issues that want to do these things also, that recreation is something that becomes more and more restricted as our bodies restrict us in different ways, especially when and if the services are not available to us and are cost prohibitive in the process of, do, of meeting those needs. Thank you for these referrals and also for the ongoing attention to the elements of disability. And um, again, I do support this and hopefully uh, we get more accessible play spaces available to everybody. Thank you. Our next speaker is Viviana Barnwell. You'll have two minutes, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Viviana Barnwell. 
I'm the parent of a 10-year-old boy with multiple developmental disabilities, and I am an advocate at the state level, being a governor appointee to the State Council on Developmental Disabilities. I support the referral put forward by Supervisor Cindy Chavez and Supervisor Smithian, and I want to thank them for thinking about children with disabilities. My son, a 10-year-old boy, doesn't have access to many of the playgrounds right now. I would say probably only to 5% of them. Three things happen because of that lack of access. First one, I as a parent don't get to see my son enjoying a playground. Instead, we usually leave them with him overwhelmed or having a meltdown. Second one, my child doesn't have access to something that is fundamental to any child, which is playing. And third and most important is children who are neurotypical and able-bodied don't get to see a child like mine. And we have to think about our future citizens and how that lack of access of children like mine affects the way they will be and perceived disabilities. I would uh, like to urge you to vote in favor of this referral, not only to give access to children like mine, to parks and recreation, but most importantly, to educate our future citizens so they are more inclusive and understand disability in a better way. Thank you. Our final speaker is Maria Dane. You'll have two minutes, please go ahead. Hello, I'm Maria Dane, Executive Director at Parents Hello, I'm Maria Dane, Executive Director at Parents Helping Parents. Nice to see you today. We support thousands of parents raising children with special needs in this county. I would like to echo Beverly Wong and the other speakers' comments that came before me and express PHP's support for the referral put forward by Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Simidian. The investments already made in two prior funding rounds in this community are being joy enjoyed by so many families, those with children with disabilities, those with parents and grandparents with disabilities, and those who simply have children who love to play. We strongly support exploring another round of funding from the county to provide leadership on inclusion for children in this region and appreciate Supervisor Areñas' suggestion regarding the equity screening of this proposal. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Seeing no uh, lights on, let's vote on the item. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that carries 5-0. If, if I very, can make a oh, comment. Yes, please. I'm so sorry you asked to do that before the vote. <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment regarding the, the options to come back. We will certainly look at options, but I don't want the board or the public to be surprised uh, if the options that come back are all general fund sources, because I believe that is the likely outcome. I just wanted to share that. We will, of course, return with the report, but I really don't want people to be caught off guard. My apologies for not remembering to ask you uh, to weigh in before the vote. Madam Chair. Uh, Yes, sir. In connection with that, one of the options that I think um, might be worth uh, pursuing is whether or not uh, whatever one time only funding was uh, available, uh, it doesn't all have to come in with the same fiscal year. And one way to mitigate the impact, I mean, uh, I wish these projects all went faster, uh, but regrettably they don't, things take time. Uh, and so one way to mitigate impact might be to take the dollar amount and um, split it up over a couple of years, and uh, that might be um, <clears throat> another path forward. So I'm not not predetermining that. I'm just uh, indicating I hope that that kind of a uh, creative approach will be considered as the staff goes forward. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, with that, uh, county executive's report is item 14. Good afternoon. I have a few items to share with the board and the public. Uh, first, to share some positive news from Sacramento. All seven of the bills that the county sponsored or co-sponsored this session have made it through the legislature. Three of those bills have already been signed into law by the governor, um, and four are now pending with the governor. We're certainly hopeful that he will sign those bills, but I just wanted to acknowledge our entire uh, IGR team that worked really diligently uh, 
on this set of legislation. It's a, a significant body uh, of work uh, compared to prior years and look forward to building on and expanding on those efforts. Uh, the County Center for Leadership and Transformation program is being held this week. It's our 13th year of training current and future county leaders in innovative leadership and change management through CLT. We're very excited to have 62 executives and managers participating this year. The learning organization uh, led, overseen by uh, Deputy County Executive um, Megan Doyle and Chief Operating Officer Greta Hansen are leading that effort, and that's why uh, Greta is not with us today at the board meeting. I want to acknowledge that we completed successful negotiations with the Correctional Peace Officers Association. The board approved that agreement as part of the consent calendar today. CPOA is our fourth largest union representing county employees, and I want to thank Labor Relations, County Council, the rest of the team, including Sheriff's Office, uh, as well as CPOA's leadership for those productive negotiations. We had another successful move to the Tasman campus that was completed yesterday. Several programs within the Public Health Department, including the Office of the Director, the Science Branch, Communicable Disease Investigation and Control Program, and several other programs moved from the Lenzen site to 150 West Tasman. And I understand that went well. Many public health services do remain at Lenzen, including the Crane Center and STI Clinic, the Travel Clinic, the Lenzen Pharmacy, vital records and registration and some other services. And finally, wanted to highlight that plans are underway to hold employee flu and COVID booster clinics for all county employees in October. These pop-up clinics are uh, held annually by Employee Wellness, Public Health, and our VMC Pharmacy team. They occur during regular business hours for one day at four different locations, in, starting on October 4th at the SSA Center Road facility, October 17th at 110 West Tasman, October 24th at the Silver Creek campus, and October 31st here at 70 West Heading Street. And that concludes my report. Supervisor Simidian. Forgive me, the light's on from the prior item, Madam Chair. All right. Um, seeing no questions then, we'll move to County Council's report at item 15. There were no reportable actions taken at the September 18th, 2023 closed session meeting, and that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Item 16 is the Valley Homeless Health Care Program uh, monthly report. Hi, Paul. Great. Good afternoon, President Ellenberg, members of the board. Paul Lorenz with Santa Clara Valley Health Care and the Valley Health Care Homeless Program. In your report, uh, we provide an update on our quality improvement efforts, as well as an update on our budget. This is our third year of our grant budget, and we have fully expended uh, our grant, um, our annual grant amount is around $2.65 million. And I just wanted to again remind the board that we did receive acknowledgement and notice that we will receive another three year grant contract with HRSA. So with that being said, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you very much, Paul. The uh, number that we saw from the colorectal cancer screening and both hemoglobin monitoring both went up. So that's very exciting. Uh, however, the depression screening rates uh, from 46% and now we're only showing 14.1% uh, for depression, uh, that, that's a depressing data, <laughs> pun intended. Um, what can we do to, to, to try to push this forward to see if there's any more? Because obviously this is so important to leading to folks understanding the issues and potentially obtaining help. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Uh, so a couple points. I think we all appreciate the fact that we have to work with these individuals, our patients, to encourage them to actually proceed and actually take the screening. Um, that's an area where we are further supporting our clinical staff in education and training of how to engage our patients more effectively. And of course, we are trying to do a better job in reinforcing with our patients the importance of the screening itself in terms of their overall well-being. Uh, so we will continue to, uh, to monitor our progress and reinforce those efforts. Yeah, thank you. I don't know if we need to do more um, public um, announcements or any type of uh, 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 encouragement for family members to encourage their relatives because they had one probably would know uh, so-and-so might need that help. So I'm just hoping to uh, just get a word out to let people know how we could make this more accessible to our community. Thank you. 
Thank you, Supervisor. We, we will look at efforts to further improve and educate the public in that regard. Thank you. Are there any uh, additional questions? So we have a, a new clerk, um, Ajani. Ajane. Ajane. Uh, doing some training for us. So Ajane, do we have any public speakers on this item? We do have one public speaker in Zoom. Mm -hmm. Sean. Right. Let's hear that uh, single public speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Sean, please unmute. You'll be given two minutes. Two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute. I just wanted to raise the issue. We still have... Um, we, I still run into an awful lot of folks who end up over at BMC and end up leaving um, uh, AMA. And I'm just really concerned. And uh, people are saying it was based on how they were treated. And I know a lot of times, you know, people are leaving, you know, because they want to get back to watch their stuff or their habit or whatever it is but it is still a lot of people who are saying that they were leaving because of how they were treated. Um, and so I just wanna raise that concern. Um, it's been an ongoing issue. Um, and I just feel like that's something important for us to watch. I do also wanna raise um, that I did get a call recently because somebody went there and the case manager called because she was so concerned um, about somebody. And so I also appreciate that. Um, I didn't even know I was on their, their call list. Um, <laughs> so I just want us to be more cognizant of that because uh, unhoused people are constantly saying that they are being treated differently. Um, and I think sometimes there is a lot of merit to that. And I think, you know, we pretend that there isn't. So if we could just uh, try and do better on that, I would really appreciate it because there's too many people who are just leaving, you know, AMA, thanks. Thank you. That was the only speaker. Thank you very much. I think we believe we need a motion to uh, ex receive the report. Yes, I'll go ahead and move the uh, approved recommendations and move forward to uh, approve the operational report and various quarterly updates. Second. Motion by Lee, second by uh, Chavez. Uh, Supervisor Rennes, is your light on for the vote or for comment? Vote. Vote, okay. Let's vote, please. Supervisor Rennes? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion passes with five. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much and well done. Item 17 is the Hamlin Court Temporary Shelter Report. And I see Consuelo, yes, coming down. And Catherine, welcome both of you. Good afternoon, Board President Ellenberg and members of the board, Consuelo Hernandez, Director with the Office of Supportive Housing. Apologies, we're multitasking today. Uh, Catherine Kaminsky, or KJ, uh, is joining me this afternoon. We have a very short oral presentation uh, or update to share with you, and then happy to take any questions. This specific response to the referral is um, kind of in two parts. The first was a request from uh, Vice President Lee to add uh, space for students to do their work. So we have identified a space that includes um, your traditional type of cubicles and two tables that um, some of the kids that will be staying at the shelter can share. Uh, we have asked for a little bit of time only because we wanna make sure that um, Home First has all of the equipment that they need. So for instance, there are no computers at the cubicle stations at this moment, uh, but if there is a need for computers, we wanna be able to provide that. Um, so that's kind of the first part of the response. The second was related to um, our thoughts and opinions about whether families should continue to be housed temporarily at the facility. Um, based on conversations we've had with community members, a North County stakeholder group that we um, manage out of our office, conversations with those with lived experience, um, housing advocates, uh, Supervisor Lee through your um, Sunnyvale session that you host, um, what we've heard and found is that yes, families um, are being served and should be served at Sunnyvale Shelter, but that there's an opportunity to make their experience there better. 
Um, so we've prepared a preliminary list of improvements. Uh, we are scheduling a walkthrough with um, Home First to make sure that we get those set of improvements um, correct. And some of the things just for awareness is currently the single adults, women, and families with children share one primary entrance into the building. And there's an opportunity to add a type of uh, wall um, that is non-bearing, that probably will have to be made out of fabric because it's a congregate setting and there's limitations in what type of structural changes we can make. But that that added barrier would provide some level of privacy that doesn't exist right now. Um, some other considerations are us looking into adding a second food distribution area um, and finding ways of, again, making the space feel more welcoming to families um, and to single women that share the space with families. Um, we hope to complete um, all of that work within 60 days um, and then can provide updates uh, through an off agenda or um, in other manners that the board uh, may wish to do. We are coming back later this year with an update of our progress for heading home and that might be an, a natural opportunity to provide an update uh, to the full board. Uh, with that, happy to take questions. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, a bunch of questions. First, maybe I could ask those before we open for public hearing. Um, currently, what do you plan this um, proposed learning space area? How many people do you think you will be able to accommodate? So the cubicles are six cubicles, mm -hmm. and then the tables, um, they could accommodate four students at each table. It really depends on who is there. Um, at one point, we had about 17 or 20 um, children staying at Hamlin Court, but the age range was different. Some of them were not in school yet. Um, so it really depends, Supervisor Lee, on uh, the families that are staying there. Right, but with the six, is it, are you saying six times four, 24, or am I miscalculating what you're talking about? Sorry. Because you say six cubicles, and each cubicle with table for four. So there's six, apologies, there's six cubicles. Mm -hmm. Each cubicle would be for one student. Oh, okay, six for one student. And then age. there are mm -hmm. two tables. Uh, the tables each have a capacity to host about four children. The tables are uh, leaned up against a wall. Right. Uh, we could pull the, the table out and provide more space, but it really will depend on who's there. And we want to give the operator the opportunity to use that space flexibly right. and to be responsive to those that are actually staying at the facility. Right, so based on these estimate, I would say the maximum number of kids we could serve on those space would be 14, approximately. Four plus four, right, for the two tables, and then six would be the individual cubicles. So if, if it's solely a function of desk space, there right. is sufficient space, for instance, if a child wanted to sit and read um, and doesn't require a sitting space, that, that the space could accommodate more. Okay. Um, what type of equipment do you think Home First would need to complete this learning space renovations? Or you talk about laptop, and what other things do you think would be needed? That is the purpose of our site walk, um, Supervisor okay. Lee, is we, you know, we have some of the list of items that we typically see in family programs. The other thing that I forgot to mention is we also are taking this as an opportunity to look at the staffing model mm -hmm. uh, because there isn't, for instance, any specific programming around families and we wanna make sure that that's provided and that may result in additional supplies. Right, um, On the in the uh, heading home report on the June 27th, uh, it talked about a formal re feasibility assessment uh, that wasn't pursued because it was suggested that shelter would not have been used for families. Um, now, how would that, uh, uh, what would that, that assess, uh, feasibility assessment be consist of how that would be done? Sure, and Supervisor, mm -hmm. the feasibility assessment was around looking at the, not inside the building, but looking at the parking lot area okay. um, and the length of time that that would take. You know, our recommendation to the board today is based on the fact that there are significant delays with other family shelters that are in the works. Mm -hmm. um, and the improvements that we're referring to now, they're not um, expensive. They are not, uh, there's no structural change to the building um, mm -hmm. that we would reassess once those uh, other two facilities are up and running to then determine is there still a need um, to add families and host families at Hamlin. Um, is the Palo Alto Home Key site sufficiently covering the needs of the North County families that we serve? Mm -hmm. um, and then if we were to make a recommendation that it's no longer needed because these things are happening, then we would go through the engagement process again and then come back to the board with a recommendation. 
Got it. Now, uh, at currently, do we have families with children and Hamlin site right now? We do not. We do not, right, because that was the recommendation or the suggestion we provided previously, try to get them, because at one point I think it was up to like 28 kids there, uh, which is, as I recall, back in the, it was think Easter Sunday when I was there back in April. And so uh, we've been able to, so, and, and they are currently staying where? They are in motels, is it? Or where are they, the families being housed at temporarily? Sure, and if I can provide a bit more detail, there was a request for us to consider providing the families. There were 11 families at one point staying at Hamlin Court to offer them an alternative location. Mm -hmm. um, it was not necessarily something that came from the Office of Supportive Housing as a recommendation or a suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, we understood that to be a direction, um, and we had those families moved to other capacity uh, in the system. So they were not all moved to hotels. They were mm -hmm. moved to other programs that had um, a vacancy in the program, and um, some of them may already actually be permanently housed. Great, that's that's going to be good news. So, first of all, I just want to say um, thank you so much. Well, actually, let's go and open the public hearing, then we can go make the motion. Thank you very much, Consuelo. Uh, By the way, just want to thank you, Consuelo, and also KJ and the Office of Supportive Housing for this hard work on this report. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have public speakers on this item? Yes, we currently have three. Oh. Just lost a hand. Two public speakers in Zoom. Two public speakers on Zoom. Let's uh, let's hear both speakers with two minutes each, please. Okay. Thank you. Our first speaker is Rose. Um, please un accept the unmute, and your your time will begin. Okay. Um, uh, my name is Rose Gregorio, and I have been a volunteer for about eighteen years. And to me, kids are not, if you move the kids again, they are not stable when they are, the kids are as stable where they are right now. And to have another change again, it will definitely affect them. Shelter is a very chaotic place to be for the kids. And I don't think they will be safe in open space. And like I said, I've been a volunteer for almost 18 years. The kids are greatly emotionally affected, especially the ones who are in school. Uh, I remember, and I'm, I'm not making the story up, I remember years ago, a single mom has to take her 14-year-old girl and a five-year-old boy to McDonald's overnight to sleep in a cold, tiny room near the kitchen because she works from 10 to 5 a.m. to clean the place. The shelter is not able to keep the kids while parent is not around. My own kids ask me if they can stay with us while the mom works because they knew what these kids are going through is inhumane. If you keep the kids where they are right now in the motel, this is not gonna happen. And another, I remember this, the young daughter was humiliated because she did not finish middle school. She did not pass her about test because of the shelter environment and due to lack of space to study. All her friends went to high school except her. They are in constant danger. And I really wish all of you will put yourself in their situation because this is what I do. I put myself in their situation. And, 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 and then because I've been doing this for a long time, I can feel what they feel. And I'm sure all the volunteers can do the same thing, the, the, the same feelings. That's why it, it, it affects me emotionally because I see the kids, the, the ones who are suffering. You know, emotionally. One, one kid came here and I played with my nephew before. He was, he was like about 14 years old. Thank you. The next speaker is Bridget Watson. You have two minutes to speak. Please unmute. You may begin. Thank you. Um, my name is Bridget Watson. I'm a school board trustee, uh, former second and third grade public school teacher, and now an ESL teacher. I'm speaking on my own behalf. I'm here today to request that children not be returned to the Hamlin Court Shelter. I ask that you support Supervisor Lee's initiative to create a new standard within the COC preferred practice of recommended standards, where it's considered best practice for families and children uh, and single adults not be in the same interim congregate shelter setting. According to Ed data, there are over 5,500 students in K through 12 in Santa Clara County. That number does not include babies and young children and it's likely underreported. Their experiences in the county provided emergency housing is unequal and unequitable. And the low barrier Hamlin Court shelter is a nightmare situation, both in terms of a dangerous setting and inadequate facilities, and also in terms of lack of services. Even though everyone experiencing homelessness is traumatized, 
Children are especially vulnerable. Frequent, chronic, and uncontrolled stress is toxic to children and can lead to lifelong changes in learning, behavior, and health. Additionally, adverse childhood experiences are associated with epigenetic changes with brain development, cognition, stress, and mental and physical health. And that means these early childhood traumas can have a lifelong impact on our community. The environment that we provide and you provide as their county supervisors is shaping children's brains and a few changes in a study area is not nearly enough. To repair the harm of the experience of being homeless, at a minimum, shelters should have all of the things that are provided in family services across the county and not at Hamlet Court, including case managers, counseling, parenting and life skills classes, childcare, a resource room, learning resources, homework helpers, and many others. Thank you, please don't put families back into Hamlin Court. Thank you, and our last speaker is Sylvia Leon. Please unmute, you'll be given two minutes to speak. Good afternoon, supervisors. I'm Sylvia Leong. I'm with uh, Cupertino Union School District. I'm on the board there. And in that school district, we uh, also serve students from Sunnyvale. Um, I've personally toured the Hamlin District. I'm really happy to hear about the improvements that are being made. And I'm asking that the supervisors consider implementing a standard of care for all the children in the county who are uh, unhoused. And until the renovations are complete, I really ask that you don't open the Hamlin Court shelter to families. Um, like the previous speaker, Bridget Watson, I also agree that please um, don't put families with uh, single adults at this time and make sure that there's some guardrails that are um, around these shelters, um, all these different shelters, so that everyone is getting a similar, um, really protected level of care. Thank you. Uh, back to Supervisor Lee. Great. Uh, thank you, President Allenberg. Um, I would like to go ahead and uh, move to receive the staff report and also at the same time requesting that the administration also uh, to come back uh, basically stating that we're not accepting families in Hamlin Court until the shelter has met the preferred practice recommended standards being discussed in the report around operating congregate shelters operating year round and be offered at this time these alternate accommodations, as we mentioned earlier, including motels or other non-congregate housing interim, in the interim for family for children. Second. Thank you. I think it would be unacceptable for families to return to shelter now until these guidelines of their own counties um, continuum of care has established can be complied with. Uh, separately, I certainly also want to mention that I've learned there were some significant staffing changes by Home First uh, at the Sunnyvale Shelter. Uh, and as we know, some of these workers have been there for a long time and built close relationship and trust with the community. I would like to ask the administration to look into these staffing adjustments so that the quality of services that our community is receiving is not being negatively impacted. Uh, lastly, I'm also asking the administration to work with the continuum of care to expand the standards so the families of children not be co-located with single adults in Congress shelter settings in the long term. Just to be very clear, uh, as a long-term solution, I certainly do not support families with children being housed with single adults uh, in the shelter setting because it's not really good for the kids and frankly, it's not good for the, the other individuals, the adults as well, uh, as we all have kids. Kids can be annoying and can cause issues. <laughs> and so I don't think those adults want to be bothered either. So for all those reasons, I think it's best that uh, they could be kept separate. I think it'd be good. In addition, I think it's important, as one of the speakers mentioned, you know, depending on the, the parent having to move in some odd hours and shelters don't accept kids without the parents, uh, these type of alternative solution, whether it's motel or whatnot, would be far more appropriate than putting them in shelters. And at the end of the day, I think we as a county really need to establish clear standards and capacity to ensure that these populations are provided in interim housing separately. Thank you very much. President Elmberg, if I can, can ask Consuelo, I just want to make, I just want to understand um, I just want to ensure that staff's had an opportunity to explain to the board any consequences associated with the motion that's been made and the administrability and feasibility of that implementation. Thank you, James. If I can um, 
summarize my understanding of the action supervisor is that families not be moved back into Hamlin Court until the improvements that we noted today take place. That's the first action. The second is for us to look at the best practices for congregate setting. Um, and I just want to make sure that I understand that in that requirement, there is nothing that says in our congregate setting requirements that you cannot co-locate families and single adults. So that was the second action. And then the third is for us to look at the staffing changes. Um, we are aware that there have been staffing changes. And our understanding is there is no impact of those staffing changes to the delivery of service at Hamlin Court. And the third is that we work with the COC to look at changing the standards. Um, there are currently only two uh, year-round shelters that have this congregate co-location setting. So we would be talking about the Gilroy Armory um, and Hamlin Court, that we work with the COC to consider whether uh, there should be a shift or a, a change uh, in that co-location of single adults and families. I just wanted to note the distinction between the second and the fourth item. Right. I think the I, I think you basically summarized very well, Consuelo. Thank you. I just want to mention that what I'm saying is it would be allowable only for short-term basis. In other words, I don't think people should be there for many, many weeks co-located. If obviously for emergency purposes, disaster relief, you know, those are the situations where there's urgency, they have to be there, otherwise they'll be in the cold, and I mean, that's one thing. But if, if uh, but the plan is not to leave uh, families with kids into these type of concrete shelter for three, four, five weeks or months, uh, that, that's not, that would not be something that I think is, is advisable if we could put them somewhere else. Thank you, Supervisor. Then that is very different than what we are proposing. We are not proposing to use Hamlin Court as uh, we, we call it overflow. We are not proposing to use it at overflow. We are proposing to use it as temporary housing for families that have a standard duration of stay. Um, that is based on their needs. There are one, you know, we do uh, provide extensions to that standard term limit. Uh, what you are referring to, uh, we do have one program that we operate like that uh, in partnership with Amigos. Mm -hmm. um, it is very difficult to manage that at a congregate setting, which is why we're not mm -hmm. recommending that. Um, and so I just want to clarify, are you asking that we modify our proposal? Uh, so that we are using it as overflow because that would change our recommendation. No, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that we should only, uh, the, the end result basically is I want to make sure that we do not have families there at any extended period of time. If they need a space to stay for a week for emergency or two at, at best, I think that should still be fine. What I do not want to see is to have these families being stuck in these, sh these shelter congregate environment for many months uh, that that uh, that would not serve the purpose of what I'm looking for, as we really are trying to get the families uh, into places without without these uh, single individuals. That was the, that was my point. Thank you, Supervisor. Then I I think I do need um, the assistance of the county executive in that our report did not make that recommendation, and I believe we would have to go back uh, to the drawing board and and return with the, a different recommendation. Madam Chair, I wonder if I might step in uh, on this item uh, even before we have comment from the county executive. I have some history on this site, as Ms. Hernandez knows, and um, <clears throat> I think the context may be a little helpful in bringing to a point the very laudable goal that Supervisor Lee is raising but that we seem to be struggling with. I came back on the board in January of 2013, so that's more than 10 years ago now. At the time, the board, the prior board, had made the decision to eliminate, to bulldoze, the winter shelter in Sunnyvale, which was a Quonset hut that had essentially 125 spaces on the floor for people who could roll out a mat and a sleeping bag. That to me, and, and you know, it's understandable they were gonna put an affordable housing project there and that was all to the good. That to me, however, raised an important question, which is where do those 125 people go once you bulldoze the Quonset hut? And when I asked that question, I got from a range of sources what I thought were not very good answers. 
the principle among them was, well, we're focusing on housing first now as our solution rather than shelters. And I said, well, I, I'm prepared to focus on housing first and you know, kudos to all who have made that happen. But in the meantime, we got 125 people who need a place to put their heads down. And when they bulldoze the Quonset hut, there's not gonna be any place to put them. So we had one more winter of the old Quonset hut in Sunnyvale, which was the, in then supervised Rick Daisy's district, but served the North County broadly defined absent other larger congregate facilities. And I finally, after a year of feeling like there wasn't a good answer forthcoming, uh, submitted a referral and said, could we please find a replacement? Uh, and board voted unanimously to do that in my recollection. And that was good because the next uh, census of unhoused folks, in fact, showed 125 people unsheltered uh, more than the prior census, which is what you would expect when you bulldoze a facility that has accommodated 125 people. Sure enough, the first year there was no place for them to go. To its credit, and I want to underscore that, county staff scrambled and cobbled together kind of a mix of solutions, did the best that they could absent a site. I thought that was helpful and important for two reasons. The first is it actually gave people a place to put their heads down. And the second is it highlighted the need for shelter. The year after that, county staff found a surplus piece of property in Sunnyvale and an oversized modular, purchased an oversized modular facility, put it on that site, and um, I think this was over by, is it Juniper, Jupiter, Juniper, uh, the uh, building. And we had a large scale number of folks who were there for the four months of the winter shelter season. The year after that, so four, four years later, Hamlin was identified and became the site. We quickly concluded a couple of things. The first is that giving people a place to throw themselves down is better than not, but that it would be better still if there were some services there. So I did a referral, asked for some services, again, to give staff its due, um, the services were provided, case management among them, and um, I think a better result um, and a better opportunity for people rather than simply having a Quonset hut roof over their head while they crashed on the floor. Um, ultimately, we did a couple more things. We went from four months to six months, again, based on a referral approved by this board, six months to a year, again, based on a referral approved by this board, and expanded into what was a previously unused but pretty large portion of the site. Um, now, I don't mean to in any way undercut the importance of Supervisor Lee's proposal, quite the opposite, I support it, but um, a little context is also important here. These are individuals, families, and children who otherwise had no place to go. And this is a facility which has made a continuous improvement over now a 10-year period or a six-year period um, because the county has learned as we've gone and committed to do an ever better job of serving these individuals and families and kids. So I think all of that is sort of context that's helpful and important. Now. The reason I didn't second the motion is because I had the same confusion that was going back and forth, which is it's a very different thing now as Supervisor Lee takes what I think, again, is a laudable next step in the evolution of this site to try and make sure we serve children and families better. It's one thing to say we're not going to take them going forward and we're going to do better by them. It's another thing to say we're not going to take them going forward and they won't have other options. And so that's the issue I think, Ms. Hernandez, that we're, we're struggling with. I'm particularly sensitive to this issue because um, a different variation on this uh, kind of concern, another group that has a particular set of needs is single women. 
many of whom are homeless because they've fled domestic violence. And so we've made them a priority in the shelter at the corner of Hope and Mercy in Mountain View, um, which um, I'm hoping we're gonna expand from a four month shelter to a six month shelter, at least as the next step. Um, but we knew that they had particular set of needs, to your point, Supervisor Lee, and so we tried to create a space there. Now, we've also tried to create a space there for children and families, and just, I think, come to the conclusion that it's not a very well-suited structure, just in terms of the kinds of things that you're talking about, Supervisor Lee. But before we leave this item, and before we vote on the motion, I am hoping that we will get clarity about what this next step looks like, because if there needs to be a delayed timeline while we put different solutions in place, that's one possibility I'd be interested in hearing about. If we are gonna find a way to more or less immediately, short order, say we're not gonna put children in that facility anymore because we have other options that we can make available quickly, that would be ideal. If the honest answer is no, if we shut it down uh, right now, there won't be any place for these kids and their families to go, then I wanna hear that answer even though it won't be a happy one so that I don't vote for something that uh, you know I, I can't support and I don't think is the intention of the maker and the seconder, if I may presume to say so. Thank you for that uh, opportunity, but I, I think even as we work to improve on what we currently have, there's some history there that's important and that I think demonstrates the willingness and ability of our county staff to get us to an ever better place if we can lay out a good path for them to do that. And they obviously need to be partners in identifying what that path looks like. James. Just to build on uh, the supervisor's comments, I think if you know the board is seeking this particular policy direction, staff should have the opportunity to come back with a plan to effectuate it. Um, and ensure that that plan is one that's funded and staffed appropriately. Um, and uh, what I'm hearing from Office of Supportive Housing is that that's not, that at least that element of it, other, other elements of the motion, certainly, but, but that that one element is an item that we need to come back to the board with that plan and timeline to address exactly those types of questions. Let me just try to clarify, maybe we could <clears throat> clarify what the motion is and what not my intention is and see if this actually makes sense. So first of all, I, I just want to make very clear, I'm not saying that there will be no family and children at Hemlin whatsoever. I don't. I think that part is clear. If, if that wasn't clear, I just make it very clear. Uh, it, that's not the preferred mode, and I certainly, uh, after talking to the uh, stakeholders and many uh, on house advocates and families as well, uh, something is better than nothing. Right, so because of that, that's why I, I was saying that that short-term stay by those families is something that should be made available. And during that short-term stay, these improvements that we're talking about is certainly something that would be very helpful for them because right now uh, we've seen is that there's really practically uh, minimal if in all any services uh, and segregation of the family and the children from the other individuals. So I think that's why those improvements are helpful. So, so I'll just make it very clear, we're not saying no families whatsoever. On the other hand, from the practice we have seen in the past few months, uh, and I, I want to just say thank you to Consuelo and your team, that you were able to move all those kids and families outside Hamlin from finding these other solutions that you have identified, whether they might be in some other non-congregate setting, some other um, uh, projects you mentioned in Palo Alto, the family housing, or maybe in motels, right? So I am just want to say that those are the preferred mode for the family, especially if you're going to stay there longer than a few weeks so that they actually can, can receive their, their, their uh, se separated uh, living arrangement, which we believe would be something that's workable. And that's what I'm saying is not really increasing what we're doing necessarily, but just doing what we are currently doing right now with how we're dealing with Hamlin and those families. So maybe, Consuelo, you can explain to me how those work and with the additional funding being made in order to accommodate those, uh, those changes recently. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. I just want to make sure that I'm I'm clear, and I will borrow from some of the phrasing from Supervisor Samidian, is that what we're proposing mm -hmm. is this kind of next phase of improvement 
knowing and recognizing that in a year or two, we will be revisiting this topic again. We don't have capacity in the system to serve all homeless families. So the beds that were taken up by the 11 families that were moved from Hamlin was not new capacity that we built. It was vacancies, so we took those 11 families. We did not take the 11 families that had been waiting on the wait list. We prioritized the Hamlin families and moved them out. What we're proposing to do is to make the case at Hamlin Court and the experience for families and, fem and women better than it exists today recognizing that we are adding system capacity mm -hmm. and that the changes don't require a significant amount of investment that would be lost in two years. Um, your recommendation is referring to the program and the duration and the length of stay that a family gets to stay at Hamlin Court. We have a particular issue with that because it's disruptive to families to constantly move them. And when we refer them into the program, they are acknowledging and selecting that they want to stay in North County. This is the North County option for families. And if we move them, so take scenario A, mm -hmm. family, uh, single mom, two children, they go and they stay at Hamlin Court, and three weeks later, something happens to open up in San Jose. They may not want to move there because they want to stay in North County, and now the children are affected because their school might change, and so it just becomes very disruptive, which is why we're not making that recommendation. Um, so that's really the difference here from our perspective. In the next two years, we will make some improvements look at the staffing patterns to ensure that, for instance, they don't have a dedicated um, case manager that specializes in families. The case management is general. So that would be tailored more to families, which we believe is needed. So that would improve the experience for the families that is there, that are there, and would not be disruptive by moving them from one place to the other every three weeks, which is my understanding, Supervisor, of what you're recommending. So if we think about this kind of short-term recommendation in the next two years while other things are opening and we're expanding capacity in other spaces, that we want to make the living experience, the temporary living experience for them now better. Supervisor Lee through the chair. Sure. Would it be helpful if there was direction to staff to have quarterly reports, meaning four times a year over the next two years to children and families on the progress in implementing this so that there was um, some accountability towards tangible solutions over the course of that time? And I'm, I'm tossing that out sort of regardless of what you land on in terms of a clear direction for next steps. If, if this is really going to be a two-year process to get to the, the ideal, the best we can do, the best practices, um, I just thought having some venue in which there was accountability with board members every few months uh, might be helpful. So I just toss that in the mix. Forgive the interruption. No, I think that that's certainly helpful, uh, Supervisor Smith, and I would take that uh, in. And, and the thing is, I certainly don't want you to necessarily quote going back to the drawing board. We have done a lot of hard work on this to get to where we are right now. I'm, I don't want to throw everything away now that we are moving forward because we rather move forward than moving back. Um, status quo is worse. Uh, we know that. So. Um, I would only want to establish this. Let's see if we come back, if you could do, like, say, three months and see what this uh, improvement is, and if you can get the, the, those, uh, uh, we call the um, preferred practice recommended standards uh, being implemented. Uh, let's take a look of how that works, and then if we have families going in there, I think at that point we'll have a better discussion uh, to see what is made available. And at the same time, I do want to, when we come back, uh, what the, uh, additional potential costs would be, let's say, we're going to use some other uh, uh, options, such a motel, right? Let's let's talk about that because I just want to mention the cost of motels in general was high when you talk to individuals. When you, we talk about family of children, uh, the cost of staying at the shelter itself, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Consuelo, it's about what, $55, $60 per person per night, somewhere around there? 
um, in a congregate setting, it's it yes. it yeah. less. Yeah, let's say sixty, let's say fifty-five a night or whatever, right? So when you have three individuals, when you add up together, that's really one sixty. And how much is the cost of a motel, for example? I think now we're getting to be pretty um, similar in terms of actual out-of-pocket costs for us. Um, and so I just want to mention that if, if we are able to get them into a separate housing, that they have that privacy, their own bathroom and all that, I think certainly something that most families would prefer than being in the congregate sheltering area, shelter area. So I just want to use that as a, uh, another reasoning why I think that's something we should not forego. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, thank you for the discussion. I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, Consuelo, could you talk just a little bit about the two-year um, timeline that you were talking about and just to help us understand what that means and the implications of it? Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. You know, we as a community um, have been trying to leverage every single dollar that we possibly can to expand shelter capacity, specifically for families since we launched Heading Home. Um, and through your support and funding um, from various sources, we've been able, I think, KJ to triple, maybe triple the number of beds um, that are available for temporary housing for families. Um, and that includes a, a project home key in the city of Palo Alto that will have roughly 46 um, rooms that are available for families. Um, unfortunately, that project has experienced a significant number of delays. We are on track. We are finally on track, um, and we anticipate that it will actually open in about a year and a half. And that would give us you know, six months to operate it, really look at the demand in North County, but then also to start to see where we are in the campaign for heading home. Um, I believe earlier, um, Board President Ellenberg read some of the statistics that were part of our other agenda item and progress in heading home, and we'll be actually back in November with an update that gives us an opportunity to look at where the resources are needed, uh, because what we're finding is actually uh, where we need more money is in the prevention side. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that helps under, um, explain a bit more, Supervisor Chavez, in terms of the timing. It's these um, actions that have been approved. That and are it takes, actually going to start coming online. Exactly, that are going to come online. And then that, you know, let's see how things shake out. Sorry for lack of a better term. Right. Um, to Su see where the need is. Super helpful, um, Consuelo and KJ. I, I think, you know, just to, to, so when we talk about this in November, I think here's what the, the um, I, there are many challenges, and I think Supervisor, um, Supervisor Simidina and Lee did a very good job of outlining what those are. And I really want to emphasize the point you raised about as quickly as possible us getting on the prevention end of this is, it's, you know, I, I think what we're understanding about the veterans program and, and heading home um, is that really our option is very limited. Like we need to get into the prevention business big and fast and frankly have the, um, the mechanisms to, to be preventative, to actually be able to flag a family before, before they get, uh, become homeless. The, the one thing that I really wanna better understand when you come back in November is I think it's critical to be um, as candid as we can be about the, the challenge and the costs and then what we're able to fund and what our partners are able to fund. I, I feel like I, we put you in a little bit of a bind when we say, um, you know, go make it happen and, and don't ask the question about finances. Um, and I think it's really critical because I think the board needs to decide um, whether or not we wanna do a regional measure, you know, participate in that regional measure whether or not we want to do something local, under what circumstances would we do that. All of that, um, in my mind, um, really rests on what we, what we can articulate the needs in these subpopulations are, and then, and then the broader need. And, you know, frankly, I, I just want to emphasize the point you're raising again about prevention. I, I think we know that that's really the most cost-effective way to, um, to, to really dramatically reduce homelessness in our community. And I think we recognize that even if we were doing, if we had our prevention structure really built out, 
that we would still have these this other um, component that you know of, of folks that would slip through those cracks and have different kinds of needs that we would need to address. So, I, I would just say as these come forward, to give us the the, the a, an analysis that says, here's what we anticipate the problem to, what we think it is today, what it's gonna look like in five years, what it's gonna look like in 10 years, here's what we think we can invest in each of these systems. And um, based on that, here's what the real numbers of, of homelessness um, will look like in, in this particular community. Um, and then colleagues, I, I just wanna shift over for one minute on, on this challenge that we're having with Hamlin. And I, I really just want to acknowledge, I, I remember that both Supervisors uh, Sabinian and Cortezi were really focused on, on Hamlin and making sure that we, we were not ignoring North County. And I, I, I just want to say I think it's North County, South County, like we, we know this problem belongs to the, the entire uh, county. Um, that said, I, I also, would be very interested in understanding what tools you see on the horizon that could allow us to address um, these problems more aggressively. And I just want to focus on Hamlin for a moment to make this point that, you know, one of the challenges we have all over the county, obviously, is we don't have enough shelter beds and we don't have enough permanent housing. And even with the best pipeline in the world, in, unless we get all that funded, at some point we're, we're, we're gonna be stopped in our tracks, right, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, that said, as you've been thinking about this problem, I'm, I'm incredibly interested in what you um, and your colleagues are thinking about in terms of the types of products that, that are coming online that we as a board should be considering. And I know that, for example, um, both Supervisor Lee and Supervisor Sumidian put forward a referral on um, container um, housing, that container interim housing. And I know there are some improvements being done on that right now. Like there's, there seems to be a lot happening in the industry that I just think we should sunshine for the board so that everybody can say, you know, if, we, if, we're, if we're resourced properly, here are some options that may make more sense as we proceed. I know you're thinking about a lot of those things, but just to highlight that for my colleagues. Thank you. Um, just a follow-up question with uh, Supervisor Travis. Are you seeing those modular or containerized housing as opposed to tiny homes, just to see different product coming on board, so you're seeing? Well, what, I, what I'm actually really interested in is that I, I, I went to, um, uh, speak to Consuelo and our staff about the container housing be or interim housing because when Salvation Army, thank you, <laughs> when Salvation Army, when we were talking to them and they were really interested in, in um, interim housing, I remembered that you had put forward that referral and I went to the staff and said, hey, could we do that container housing here because they only need it temporarily, allowing us to do what we would frankly intended to do, which was use land use the interim housing, and then be able to turn that land into permanent housing. So I was very interested in how that process could move forward. And one of the things that Consuelo reminded me is that while there was a, a significant investment, I think 30 or 40 million, that the staff was making it available over a multi-year period of time. So 10 million, 10 million, 10 million. Mm -hmm. So again, being able to understand what the staff has planned, I think would help us be able to make some choices about whether or not we want to reprioritize, even if we have somewhat less money for an, a short period of time, the, the approaches that, that the boards frankly already prioritized and may decide, yeah, in this instance, here's what makes more sense is we want to move forward with this different type of product. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Tony. Than James. Just noting that you'll need to get a, sec a, a separate seconder to the motion because the initial seconder has left the meeting. Oh, I need a seconder. Second. Thank you very much. James. Yeah, I, I, um, I guess just for cl clarity, it might be helpful to restate the motion because we've had a lot of conversations. So I just want to understand kind of where the conversations landed and make sure that we can come back with the appropriate uh, information and uh, make the appropriate changes uh, based on the board's direction informed right. by that conversation. So the uh, 
versus receiving staff report, and we talked about um, not to accept families in Hamlin Court until the meeting the standard of the preferred practice recommended standards that's being developed. Uh, and um, <clears throat> that second, um, we talked about checking in with the staffing change over at Hamlin Court. Uh, and and um, I think it was that item two that there was modification in the course of the conversation as I understood it. Because sure. as I understood, Supervisor Lee, you had said you had acknowledged that there would still be yes. circumstances there, there, where there'd be families there. Correct. So that's a slight slight slightly different than the original wording of that, that item two. Okay. Yeah, so so we will still be uh, having families with children at Hamlin Court uh, subject to a report coming back to us on a quarterly basis to coming back to us on the progress of lease development uh, after that was accommodations being made to check on the improvement that's being made. Yeah. Correct? Yes. And we'll come back to us quarterly and then we'll, we'll make further adjustment in the future if uh, yes. this works. Thank and, you. And also making a, a clear that we are going to still offer alternative accommodations um, if, a, if, if resources available, such as we talk about um, other non-congregate housing or motels, for example. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that yeah. clarification. All right. Thank <laughs> you said it. Uh, let's vote on this item, please. Thank you. Supervisor Arenas is absent. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. And President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion passes with four. Thank you. Items 18 and 19 uh, were held at the request of administration to October 3rd. Item 20 is to look at items removed from the consent calendar and um, check let me know if this is the same list that you have. I have 24, the Psychiatric Physician Services Agreement, which will require a Levine Act announcement. Uh, 49, the Emergency Management Performance Grant Funding. And 73, and I don't, I didn't write down what that was. That's, that's it. green waste. Recovery. Green waste. Yeah. That, that's what you have? Excellent. All right, so let's go to item 24, uh, pulled by Supervisor Chavez, and begin with the Levine Act announcement. Great. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll let staff do that. Thank you. Item number 24 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. Thank you. Um, since I pulled this, if I could, I, I just wanted, the reason I pulled this, um, this item is that in August, I had made a request that as part of our Public Safety and Justice Committee a meeting that we do uh, conduct an audit of the custody mental health professional contracts. And the reason I wanted to make that at the full board is um, I know, and I've had some confusion, frankly, when we make motions at committee meetings as to whether or not they have meaning at all in the board. And, you know, at some point we'll, we'll clear that up. Um, but what I wanted to do was to make sure that um, as part of this action that we do, in fact, um, get an audit of the... Um, the contractors, and I did read in the staff, well, let me, let me stop there and see if there's, I see James, you were reaching for your light. Uh, I just had a clarifying question. I, I just wanna understand the, the scope and precise questions that, that you're requesting be audited. I'm interested in determining whether or not we have um, psychiatrists and other staff through this contract that are coming to um, work at the agreed upon time, mm -hmm. seeing the agreed upon clients, seeing clients overall in a timely fashion, and making sure that the um, work is, is integrated into um, all of the services that are being provided. And the reason I'm making that request is that 
We've had feedback from both those in custody and who work in the facility raising concerns and complaints about the timeliness and the availability of this particular provider. Thank you. Or that type of, I shouldn't say this provider, it, this type of service, but it appears that they've um, identified this as an issue with the contractor, not our staff. Thank you, that, that's very helpful. And I, will, I would just add as kind of broader context that this along with the broader continuum of contracted services associated with custody health is very squarely a part of current examination of, the, of that operation. So there will be an audit that will come to the full board when it's completed? There will be, there's, there will be an assessment and it will come to the board. It may end up coming in closed session. Could you just define assessment versus audit from your perspective? Um, I think of audit, I mean, the, the time piece, for example, that you described, um, in my mind, fits the definition of an audit. Um, the integration question is what I would more describe as assessment. Uh, and the difference is, and as audit is more focused on looking at, um, you know, verification of, um, of of data, basically, uh, in terms of service delivered versus an assessment of, of quality or the manner in which it's done. Well, I'm a, I am actually interested in the audit component as well because it has implications for the operations in custody, and it was one of the reasons I was so concerned not to see our, you know, a, somebody from the medical side of the team here today because I, I think those are real issues. So. What I'm requesting as part of, and you know, and I, I, I feel like we don't have an option here, so I'm going to move approval of this um, contract with a request that we audit in addition to do an assessment and that that audit come back to the full board. I'll second. Thank you. Do we have public speakers on this item? We currently have one public speaker in Zoom. All right, let's hear that speaker. Two minutes, please. Okay, thank you. Sean is our only speaker with their hand raised. Please unmute and you'll be given two minutes. To be honest, I just wanted to raise an issue and the issue was uh, some of us have had our hands taken down. I don't know if it's a clerical error, but I wanted to speak on the Sunnyvale issue, which I'm sure all of you kind of expected and my hand was taken down. And I just wanted to voice frustration because I've been waiting since um, consent to speak on that. And I, you know, it's four o'clock and I waited all day and someone else, um, an elected official had their hand up to speak on another issue earlier in the day and had it happen to them as well. So I just need to raise that issue. Um, and then I just wanna say that when you consider the Sunnyvale issue, you consider that based on all the work that Kelsey had done at that shelter for two decades. And so I think you need to reconsider that if Kelsey is no longer at that shelter because now you're reconsidering it under a different management, and that is the management of robots. And so I just think you should reconsider that. Thank you very much. Um, well, just one other issue. Oh, did you have another speaker? No, th that was the only speaker. Apologize. Go ahead, Supervisor Chavez. Just one other issue I wanted to raise, and this has more to do with um, how we follow up on contracts. If you go to packet page 1074, what you'll see um, in the decision and required steps following a decision, there's a series of items that get attached, the service agreement, the, the PO, the delegation of authority, the legislative file. One thing that's not attached here is the actual motions that get made. And I, I do feel like there's a delta between the implementation of what happens here and when our staff get these. And I don't know how often you've met with staff where they're not at the meeting because they're not the primary person that's talking to us, but they're the implementer. And there's, there's a gap between direction from the board and our staff. So I share that, President and Vice uh, President, as you're thinking about the, uh, with our new leadership, some improvements that could be made. I, I actually think that's a pretty significant issue that we should address. It'll make it easier for everybody to understand what's happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's vote on this item, please. 
Supervisor Arenas is absent. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Samidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. And President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion passes with four. Thank you. Uh, item 49, Emergency Management Performance Grant Funding uh, remains, uh, rem uh, was taken off. Supervisor Lee, go ahead. Yes, th well, first, thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes. Um, Having sit on various uh, uh, boards and uh, committees relating to emergency uh, preparedness, I certainly am very uh, uh, excited about this uh, proposal to hire an additional individual to help out uh, on coordinating. Um, but at the same time, I do understand there's quite a few different organizations uh, that are doing various work that is somewhat similar overlap, but maybe by design should be overlapping because we're talking about this disaster preparedness. So I just want to make sure I understand what each roles are doing. So uh, if you could help me understand what are the key similarities and differences between the roles and responsibilities of uh, the OEM, and uh, I believe the group is called CADRE, which is the Collaborating Agencies Disaster Relief Effort, which is, I believe, is a nonprofit, right? Uh, and then this uh, VOAD, right, that we're talking about today, the Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster uh, for our County for Disaster Preparedness and Response. You need your mic. There we go. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. President Ellerberg and Vice President Lee, thanks for having us, members of the board as well. All right, so it's a good question. Uh, actually, I think the answer is fairly straightforward in that the similarities and differences kind of parallel. Uh, we've learned through most recent events that we've experienced in our county and other counties to, to really have a robust uh, recovery and resilience program for the community that we all serve. It takes multiple partnerships and multiple entities. Government can do its part and always has done its part, and I think a great example of that is the most, ser most recent series of storms uh, where we successfully appealed uh, Cal OES to provide individual household assistance to that community for that storm. And in partnership with CADRE, they provided services as well to f people that needed assistance and help that maybe government was not able to accomplish. So. It's really about creating a, a bridge for a potential gap. Government can do its part, but it cannot do its part without organizations uh, such as CADRE. Uh, some time ago, we recognized uh, that uh, CADRE was an important part of the community. That's why the Office of Emergency Management submitted, I believe back in 2019, a resolution for the board's uh, consideration, and ultimately they did approve it recognizing CADRE as the VOAD for the county. CADRE also, though, has a regional approach and also interacts with other counties uh, around us. So they have a regional aspect that they uh, play a role in. They obviously play a clear role in the local emergency planning and preparedness. And so the partnership really is about making sure that on blue sky days, that we continue to do our part to support them and to prepare for these emergencies. And when we do have a disaster and an emergency, CADRE can focus on what they need to do within the community and we can focus on what the expectations are of the county when the EOC is activated. And we receive direction from the EOC directors and they create the objectives uh, for the event each operational period. And then this liaison, this VOAD liaison position is the bridge to cadre and other organizations that may have interest or we may have a need to communicate with. But this will be a dedicated position that will be able to staff out the EOC, be available to answer questions to the EOC directors and then tie that back to cadre. Cadre is a volunteer organization for the most part. It's difficult for them to come and work 12 and 14 hour operational periods in the EOC. We're activated for 96 days, for example, for the storms. So that's a big ask uh, for Cadre to fill that role uh, repeatedly. So we saw this as an opportunity to help bridge that more effectively. 
and to provide some relief on staffing and yet still be able to communicate and collaborate uh, effectively. So each agency is doing very similar things to support the community. The, the, there's not really a huge difference in my mind other than that we are both, you know, they are focused on providing their day-to-day -day services uh, that they have available to them and we are focused on making sure that we provide what we can as government and then bridge that back to cadre and we've had some pretty good success with that the SCU fire the storms even during COVID so I, I hope that answers the question somewhat no I think this is very helpful and I think maybe I would like to ask is also a, a potentially off the agenda report uh, describing what OEM and cadre's roles and responsibility is. I, I like chart, if you could do a flow chart of some sort, I think that could be helpful to show who is doing what uh, regarding the disaster preparedness, planning uh, these responses and the communication on these different agencies, how they work together, I think would be helpful uh, for me, not just for me to understand, but I think it's good for everybody to understand how these different relationship works. And, and I certainly completely agree with you why this VOET coordinator is so important to to have in order to make sure that the government and the volunteer organizations have that uh, liaison connection, especially during time of emergency, and hopefully we could plan that out before the, 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 the time comes. Uh, so I think that's, that's exactly what, what we need. Uh, so I will go ahead and make that into a motion to uh, receive the, the recommendation to receive this report and also approve the funding recommendations for the EOAC and along with the comments I just made, I'd like to make that into a motion. And I'll second that. I have some comments also, but I want to see if there are any members of the public before I finish. Please. Do we have any public speakers on this item? We do have one public speaker card in Chambers. And at this time, no hands in Zoom. All right. Let's hear uh, from our speaker in Chambers first for two minutes, please. Marsha Hovey. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to address the inaccuracies of what was said there in order to get my comments out unless you give me more than two minutes. So I'm Marcia Hovey. I'm the executive director of CADRE, which is, and I've been an emergency manager in Santa Clara County for over 25 years. Uh, you did pass a resolution making CADRE the VOAD, and I'm the executive director of the VOAD, which would make me the VOAD coordinator, and there's only one. Now, I just heard uh, Director Reed call this a liaison, so now we have some more things to talk about because that's not what the EMPG says. Um, but if you look at the description of that VOAD coordinator and then look at the cadre mission statement, they're almost identical, which concerns me because I'm not sure where the division of responsibilities and roles is. Cadre has supported disasters since 1989 in Santa Clara County, and we have been a strong partner with all of the cities in the county. Sadly, looking at this EMPG, and I looked at it more closely today because I only knew about the VOAD coordinator position, um, it appears that there has been a breakdown in effective communication, collaboration, and coordination between county OEM and the VOAD. Um, we were, uh, this VOAD position was presented to us several months ago and asked for our blessing. I said no unless we have the responsibilities outlined. In addition to that, in this EMPG, there is an item that says that CADRE is receiving emergency funds. We never agreed, or emergency supplies, we never agreed to that. And we were also not advised that after 12 years, we're no longer receiving um, training funding to do emergency preparedness training for the nonprofits and the faith community. And so there's a, creating a parallel structure isn't going to help that, and I can explain to you later how this all works. Thank you. Do we have speakers on Zoom? Still no hands raised in Zoom. Thank you very much. I'll return to Supervisor Chavez then Lee. Actually, I was going to, Supervisor Lee put his Lee hand and up Chavez? and then I'll go. Yeah, I, mean, I, I just want to make sure we clarify, because clearly there is some misunderstanding between Cadre and, and right now with our county's perspective of what this position is. So on this off agenda report we talk about, I would ask that you coordinate with the cadre executive director and the leadership and before we come back to us and try to get that map out. And that's why I really would like to get those roles and responsibilities laid out, get the flow chart together so that everybody's on the same page of who's doing what. Does that make sense? 
Understood. Yeah, I think that's a good ask, and we certainly will be happy to meet with Cadre, and we can go through that in greater uh, detail, which is what we would do anyways. We have a proposed guidance document that we've been developing. The position's not even in effect yet. It's not even been uh, fully uh, funded or approved yet. So uh, we have every intention of getting with Cadre, and we will sit down and work through those details. I, I think it's all workable, and I have no doubt that we can uh, meet the board's direction. Do you have a timeline? How long do you think it would take to put that together? Probably some time. Let's see, it's already, September's almost gone, so I would, I would say we can probably do it late October, early November, if that's acceptable. Give us some Beautiful. time to really yeah. work it through and spend the time it deserves with Cadre. Come back, like say, our first November meeting. Is that okay? Correct. Yes, we can do that. Okay. Thank you. That's so great. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add um, two other um, issues. One is when this comes back um, to the board, could you talk or could you make sure in writing we understand the the financial investment that the county is currently making in cadre uh, to um, through the president and the chair. Absolutely. And then um, second. You know, I I know that we've had some um, activity as a uh, at, as a board of supervisors to look at our partnerships with volunteers and neighborhoods, and I know that's a big part of what um, you know what we rely on cadre to do. And so, what I'm really interested in is understanding who on our staff or cadre is tasked with building that volunteer base between activities um, and and how is that funded and then to what extent it's funded because what I'm what I'm fearful of is that as we grow the um, the department and I think we absolutely should I, I, I I'm so excited that we're doing that we have to grow the external partnerships as well otherwise we won't have access to the volunteers that we're going to need and frankly I don't know that we're we're doing quite as much to build the relationships with neighborhood associations. I understand the trick of that is really doing that in partnership with the cities. I understand their role um, as primary. I think the challenge, and I, and I certainly found it during COVID, is that uh, different cities had very, very different um, resources to engage their, um, their, their neighborhood associations and their nonprofits. And in many respects, we ended up going th through them and then and then even deeper uh, in some areas of the county. So I'm very interested in understanding how we're how the volunteer component of this is is funded and robust and healthy. Thank you. Something else? Go ahead. Yeah, and I just want, I just want to to say um, well, first of all, thanks, uh, uh, Dana, um, uh, Reed, Mr. Reed, for your report and your good work. But at the same time, I also want to thank uh, Marshall for your uh, volunteerism on this. Uh, we we don't pay you for this. You're doing this for right. You're paid, but I'm saying the, the the work that you do clearly is important in leading this volunteer type organization. Uh, because at the end of the day, between the nonprofits and between our county government. Uh, when the next disaster comes, it's not a matter of if, right? It's a matter of when. Uh, we could be talking about anywhere from wildfire or flooding or uh, the next earthquake, right? There's so many different things that happens. If you live in Sunnyvale, there's this thing called tornado that comes every 30 years. Most people don't even know that. Uh, these are the type of things that do happen. Uh, and, and I just want to make sure that our, our different entities truly are talking with each other, having the open communications, and if there's certainly funding needs, uh, please let us know. Uh, in the meantime, I just want to sunshine that I'm also working on a referral, potentially on, on let's for example, some type of early warning system for wildfire using these AI cameras or not. So this is some, these are the kind of things that we're trying to do to help anticipate, you know, to, to, to uh, for the for prepare for the worst, uh, as we all know. But if the next disaster comes, do not expect FEMA to be with us for at least forty eight hours, at least, right? So these are the type of preparation that we locally has to be ready to go when it happens. And the thing is so important that uh, we have a good connection and that we're talking to each other on this. So. Um, Again, I think hiring the, the, the individuals is important, but laying out the responsibilities clearly so that everybody knows who, who's supposed to do what uh, clearly is something that is not working right now, but let's, let's, make, that, let's make it work. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, let's, are we ready to vote on this item? Let's do that. Super Supervisor Arenas is absent. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. And President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion passes with a vote of four. Thank you very much. Our final item today is 73 on uh, Green Waste, and we'll begin with the Levine Act announcement. Item number 73 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest in their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. Uh, Supervisor Chavez, this is your item. Thank you so much. Um, so. Just a um, high level, this is an ex a $75 million contract over a 10-year period of time. And I want to make a request um, through the president that we ask um, staff when we're taking an action that's this significant that we just don't put it on consent. It'd be better if the board put it on consent, but a 10-year contract at $75 million is quite a lot. Um, I had really just two uh, questions, and one is... Um, do we have an incumbent workforce policy? And if we, if we do, is this contractor using it to make sure that folks who are currently providing these jobs have a right of first refusal with a new contractor? I think, and Jeff will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the current situation is that we use the municipal services. So this is actually a change in structure. So there wouldn't be and incumbent workforce, an incumbent Be workforce policy wouldn't be applicable. Because they, they don't have, the last contract didn't have drivers? We didn't, we, the county didn't have a prior contract. We've been using the municipal, um, we've been using the municipal garbage services of whatever municipality the facility is located in. So that would be governed by the franchise agreements with the respective cities. And we're now for, the, under this contract, um, actually contracting with somebody to provide those services holistically for county facilities. So if a worker in one of those jurisdictions would, would lose their job, we don't have a mechanism for bringing them, for them to apply for this new contract? Uh, I don't believe so, but it's not, it's uh, those, right, those franchise agreements are continuing. So I don't, I don't know what, um, I understand yeah. the, the point. Of, I understand what a franchise agreement is, and if you have 100 folks and, the, and they were picking something up on their route, I'm, what, I'm really, what I'm really wanting us to do across our contracts is make sure that we have mechanisms for incumbent workers to be able to apply for new contracts. And if we didn't do that in this instance, I understand that. But if we don't have an incumbent workforce policy, then... What I'd like to, I'll just sunshine that I'll be bringing a referral forward. So I just want to understand, do we not have one now? Or I'd, a practice, a policy or a practice? I'm not aware of a board policy regarding incumbent workforce. Um, we do have a practice in many circumstances of including such language. Uh, I guess what, I was say, um, what I'm saying is I don't, it's not clear to me how such a policy would be effectuated in the context of this particular contract because there isn't, an incumbent workforce. Well, there there is, even if there's a contract, even if the relationship is contractual, even if it's through a municipality, this is a, just a, simply a contract. And, and what I'm suggesting is that if, in fact, a contractor would have a smaller workforce because they won't any longer be doing this particular body of work, and that would include the drivers not, I don't know if that would impact the MRF workers, but what I'm really asking is, if we were bringing on a new contractor, are they reaching out to potentially impacted employees? I'm understanding that's not the case. And so what I think that means is that we need to, I need to bring back a referral for a policy, which I'm happy to do. Um, my second question is, um, I understand that part of the workforce is unionized and part of the workforce is not. And so the other question, and I, I just literally could not remember this, do we have a labor peace agreement? And the reason I, again, policy, because when I looked through the contract, I couldn't find that as a, now, and now I, we don't, I'm not sure I have the entire contract in our, in our packet, but I read through it and I didn't see 
labor peace as a as a standard for consideration. The board does not have a uniform labor peace policy. All right, my second referral that I will be bringing back. And then, um, and then lastly, um, I do think that, again, I would say this through the chair of the board as you're thinking about um, emerging um, approaches that you wanna take as it relates to keeping the meeting smooth and all that. I do think we should have a minimum standard of contracts or length, length of leases that should not be on consent. Um, with that, I'll move the staff's recommendation and we'll follow up with policy recommendations at a later point. Second. Do we have public speakers on this item? I am not seeing any public speakers in Zoom and there are none in the chambers. Thank you, let's vote on this item, please. Supervisor Arenas is absent. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Vice President Lee. Aye. And President Ellenberg. Yes. The motion passes with four ayes. All right, that was our final item. Uh, Anjane, congratulations on clerking your first part of your first meeting, and we are adjourned. Thank you.